All right. Now, hello to everybody out there in Radio Land. <laughs> That's something to this fella. Ah, uh, it doesn't matter. Matt is his name. Uh, says to everybody, hello there in Radio Land. Now, the date is Saturday, June the 10th, 2023. And what JC and I are going to talk about is mostly one subject there. As the thumbnail might indicate, It's uh, the subject matter is the serial killer from the i guess it's victorian but late late 1800s 1888 onwards or thereabouts called jack the ripper and uh what i put in the thumbnail there was an excerpt from one of his letters or maybe one of his letters basically taunting the cops i, I think you know one of the things i noticed just trying to refresh my memory on jack the ripper was that you know, he might have been, perhaps he's the most famous or infamous, rather, serial killer of all time. Maybe, certainly maybe in the Anglo world or the UK, British world. Uh, I think of him in the same breath as I might think of Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes mysteries. Um, mm -hmm. We tend to think that these days are the only days of mass media. But certainly there were uh, sort of celebrity authors, writers. George Bernard Shaw might be one of those people we might, I think JC is going to reference, uh, to make his case that this serial killer, I mean, I'll say this phrase, right? I can't remember the French fella, but I'll attempt it in French. Uh, plus ça change, plus ça reste le même chose. So it means the more things stay, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And so there's some links in the description there about more modern day serial killers, ones I had forgotten about as well, or maybe hadn't even heard of. Uh, Dave McGowan, the fellow who wrote um, Strange, oh, gee, you better help me out with the name of the book there, JC. Uh, You've read the book there that, that he wrote about the valley? Uh, he wrote uh, Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon, which is about Laurel Canyon out here in California in the 60s counterculture movement. And then he also wrote specifically about uh serial killers called program to kill and that and is there was the another fella important at the moment go ahead sorry yeah yeah well uh, i'll just say there was another fellow they always seemed like john wayne gacy and people like that lee harvey oswald i suppose it's because people always remark they have three uh names or or yeah well their names are sort of triple barreled but i suppose the reason for that is because we get to know them when they have their legal cases and in legal cases it's always the state or the Crown maybe versus, and then they might have, uh, you know, for the middle name in there, so people don't confuse it maybe, or the name with somebody else. But there was some fella, mm. something like Henry Lee, Hen Henry something Lucas, Henry Lee Lucas, was that his I'm name? Like, uh, is, that, is that the guy's when he name? Went to, uh, uh, Bush and his governorship of uh, Texas. I was just going to touch on that for a second. You know, Good man. Well, like, you pretty much said it there. Yeah. So he was a serial killer. Uh, but yeah. I think you're going to make the case that a lot of these serial killers are useful to the establishment because uh, George W. Bush there, when he was, might as well said now, mightn't get a chance to come back to it, but we'll reiterate it if you want, that uh, I just read there in the Wikipedia about him that uh, George W. Bush at the time bizarrely commuted uh, his uh, sentence when he was governor uh, of Texas, wasn't it? Yes, and uh, just to remind everyone Bush, as a governor of Texas, executed more people than any other governor in Texas history. This is the only person ever that he pardoned, ever. Right. One we better not say pardoned. Pardoned from like the death row, but still uh, he yeah. commuted his sentence to life imprisonment. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. He, he let him loose off the off death row anyway. Yeah, he's yeah. the only person he didn't kill. Now, the thing is, right, maybe it's a worse fate. Maybe it's sort of say, oh, I thought I was going to have an end to my misery here. But you end up having to spend the rest of your, your days in prison. I don't know. Well, <laughs> there's another problem with Bush there, too, though. Uh, there's a particular uh, serial killer down in Mexico, um, the Matamoros cult, which uh, chopped people up, ate them, used their body parts in a cauldron to do spells and stuff. Well, Bush Jr. hung out with those folks for some time, and so did a lot of other famous people. They were actually like the head of the Matamoros cult was actually the palm reader to and, you know, just general witch and warlock to famous people and politicians all over the place, all over Mexico, North America, Canada, 
you know, the whole, the whole nine. So like, you know, that's yet another connection with the, the political elite and these kinds of people, right? You have Gacy and the candy man out there on the Island, uh, you know, and talking about bringing kids out there to that Island or whatnot and them working together. And then the fact that Gacy and uh, you know, you have Gacy and uh, Dahmer have letters to one another. All of them have, uh, you know, satanic stuff in their, in their repertoire. Oh, and there's a channel. It's going to be all caps now, all cap letters. People might want to write this down. It's called, uh, it's spelled L O L love and or field and love L O L field and love all caps. That channel has a lot of the old news clips and stuff from uh, these cases where it talks about the, the ritually sacrificed animals in Dahmer's yard and, you know, the altars in his house and or apartment or whatever. And, uh, you know, how his mom was crazy and how his whole family, when they, when his parents divorced, the whole family had to undergo psychiatric evalu evaluation. And that's where he got introduced to the state and these MK ultra doctors. Right. And you had the same thing with son of Sam in New York. Like he's talking about, he belonged to a son of Sam cult and he was just one of many. And if you remember the case from back in the day, the fact of the matter is that the witnesses all gave different descriptions of the killer, which would indicate that there was more than one person involved. Right. So it always yeah, comes back okay. around to this stuff. Well, you've thrown a lot of names there on the table there now. And uh, I'll just uh, revisit there a couple of things that you said there and just put a couple more names while you were mentioning there this uh, Matamoros cult. I'm guessing maybe like Moros might mean death. Um, what does Mata mean? Do you know? Does that translate to something there? Um, um, uh, I can't remember. In Spanish, right. I don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we'll see if we find out later. It sounds like it probably translated to, to something like the, the the death of something in Spanish. And I see that it actually, rather than when I when I searched for that, rather than bring up a Wikipedia page about Mata Moros, it brought up a page uh, for a fellow named Adolfo Constanzo. Uh, and he is uh, described as being an American serial killer who lived between 1962 and 19... 19... Oh, oh, I'm still okay. here. I'm st okay. yeah. so we, we may be having communication issues, uh, but we'll, we'll try. I'll just repeat what I said there. Adolfo Constanzo uh, is described as an American serial killer, and he's who is returned in a search when I search for the Matamoros cult. So perhaps uh, you're saying that uh, George W. Bush might have crossed paths, but the like of him, he is described as a Cuban-American serial killer, drug dealer, and cult leader who led an infamous drug trafficking and occult gang in Matamoros. Also, maybe Matamoros is the name of a town, but it might be aptly named for the kind of activities that they were engaging in. Yeah. It, uh, it also mentions the town. Uh, say um, that again. It specifically means killer of Moors, a uh, title given to Spain's patron St. Uh, James in the Middle Ages from martyr to kill um, plus Moros Moors. You know, according to the legend, Saint appeared to the ninth century Spanish king during a battle that enabled him to massacre 60,000 Saracens. Why they chose that, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'm assuming probably because the dude grew up Catholic, I, you know. And we all know what Rome's connection to all this kind of stuff is with the Templars and the helping Nazis and all that other kind of stuff, right? But interesting. You know, why well, that one specifically, who knows? I'd have to look into that a little bit more, but that's what I mean. Right. Well, I'd say I'll have to hold my hand up and say I was right, but for the wrong reasons, so I get null point. Um, <laughs> so it's the matter that means death and the moros that means the moors, as in the Muslims. Uh, so... That gives me a lot to scratch my head about there. Um, so also just to say then as well that his group uh, was also dubbed the Narco San uh, Narco Satanicos Narcos Satanicos. Um, so maybe that means the sort of the devil's narcos, like, as in the devil's drug dealers or something like that. Yeah, basically something like that. And they they were all tied up with this whole uh, the you know, the Iran-Contra scandal, you know, how they get pulled opium in uh, the Middle East as well as cocaine in South America and everywhere else, you know, down uh, below the border there. 
you know, they would sell like basically weapons to these folks, like tra trade it for drugs and then black budget money, whatever, Ollie North and that whole mess, right? Like the amount of tied up in that. It's a funny thing. Yeah. I mean, looking at him, I mean, I'm sorry that I don't have a picture up on screen of Adolfo Constanzo. I don't know why I'm not thinking, of course, of George Costanza, but anyway. Uh, anyway, he doesn't look like George Costanza at all. He actually looks like somebody, the picture of him in Wikipedia. Uh, he has a very, almost, his longer hair now is a mullet, but it's like an Oliver North haircut, but with a mullet. He actually doesn't look too dissimilar to Oliver North, and he looks like he's wearing sort of green army fati fatigues, the kind that you just might wear <laughs> um, down in... Uh, columbia way or, or wherever you're going in middle and south america um mm. i also want to say that uh, you mentioned this uh, other uh, youtube channel although maybe it's uh, more accessible on bit now i don't know but uh, well he advertised that he's uh, sorry he advertises in i'm looking at his youtube channel he advertises that he's available on library and bit and whatever else mm. but as soon his banner has uh, the website programmed to kill which is the book that you already referenced by uh, dave uh, oh remind me of his name again dave mcgowan, McGowan. Uh, so, and he, I listened to a little bit of the interview that's linked, uh, I didn't have time to listen to it all, unfortunately, in the description there, uh, where Dave McGowan, uh, he himself describes this book, Programmed to Kill, um, about serial killers, which I suppose you're going to get onto, but we better just say, I suppose, that uh, serial killers are mighty convenient. If they're not created, they're maybe allowed to fester and then redirected for purposes of well, mm -hmm. shady underworld collusion between, uh, you know, government agencies or rogue government agencies, if the government might want to sort of spare its blushes or whatnot at some point or dive in, or sort of attempt to create a firewall and, um, you know, sort of wash its hands of mm. yes. itself, admitted that this book uh, program to kill was a lot more out there than strange scenes in the canyon. And I know I keep confusing Laurel Canyon with uh, the San Fernando Valley, but look, maybe one is video, the other is audio, you know what I mean? Uh, but anyhow, uh, the YouTube video, YouTube uh, channel rather that you mentioned called LOL Field and Love uh, references immediately programmed to kill.net. And so that mm. looks like that's going to be a resource, a channel resource full of all this kind of stuff about people who are programmed by i suppose let's say it early as well the uh sort of ci type mk ultra programs um i notice like one of the things you'll notice as well they might sort of create con the conditions where they might even allow people to meet where or they'd keep an eye on somebody where they know ah this fellow's mother's a prostitute great he's likely to go off the rails early and we can redirect mm -hmm. his anger somewhere that kind of thing i better give you a chance now to pick up on some of that well, I mean, that's exactly uh, what I would be insinuating with all this is that, okay, we have programs here, which I'll get into with Jack the Ripper and how all this kind of stuff gets started and how he plays a part in that, right? Whoever the Ripper may be, whoever set him up, like, and I'm going to make a case for who did, um, like, and how the papers worked with them and everything else. But either way, like now in the modern era, there are programs in place so that basically if you're a troubled kid, you're going to get noticed by the system, by your you know school, all these different uh, places that you interact with that have programs that will drag you into the system and get you in contact with these. You know, now that we know from the Tavistock stuff and all these other things, MK Ultra, that these psychiatrists are trying to get in their, our kids heads and make them crazy. Right, like they're putting them on weird drugs. They're doing all kinds of stuff, telling them to cut parts off, all this kind of stuff. Right. So, you know, when you really start looking into it, you start seeing a very, a very interconnected web of players in all these different places. And it's clear going all the way back to the Jack the Ripper days. Yeah. Yes. Well, it reminds me, uh, like, and again, that's why I sort of said, like, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same, because we can apply, we think, the, we tend to think, I'll speak for myself, I suppose, that people in the past were primitive, unsophisticated, uh, didn't really have uh, very high technology, so therefore, you know, people were quite stupid, that we kind of equate stupidity with um, lack of technology, but of course, people had to think more on their feet, uh, and were more, perhaps, personally resourceful. 
than they are now because these days it's just oh google that or you know uh, people have their uh, faces buried in their phone and think they're clever but it's really the phone uh, might be able to tell them information but they have no way of discerning you know what would be the truth or, or fiction of the matter and then what would be the right course of action to take based on any information they might be able to glean so people in the past um you know their minds were the same human nature doesn't change there were in, there was indeed mass media and people were able to be whipped up into frenzies um, of excitement uh, or terror uh, it was useful to the establishment to keep people uh, in states of fear that kind of thing and uh, like you said there as well of course uh, you know that um, well i've said it before and you you're kind of saying the same thing or getting getting to this aspect whereby if you have a large enough population it doesn't necessarily mean although you sort of i agree with you that you know people can be you know got it, their heads can be got into and they can be made uh, think things and then act on those thoughts but um people can be uh, manipulated or looked they can look for people amongst a large population because basically statistics says as the book that was on bill gates table that he showed us you know, you can lie with statistics and then you can sort of backwards derive statistics. You can say, well, look, we can pretty much say for sure that one in a thousand or one in 10,000 10, people are going to be born to, let's say, a prostitute. And, you know, those people might be more predisposed to be uh, given a, a very uh, unhealthy view of society then. And, you know, they were mistreated by their mother or they might have seen so many men that were mistreating their mother and then maybe their mother mistreated them and they might have hated women and men and everything like this, you know. So they could be very easily persuaded then um, to perform uh, gruesome uh, acts or grievous bodily harm to people. And um, they might sort of feel like that it wouldn't take much to convince them to do that anyway if they were given any kind of a reason as to why a particular individual should be the focus of their ire i'll just make this quick analogy and hand it back to you you know i remember a long time ago sort of saying oh can we make this particular car that i have here faster and a mechanic said to me look i wouldn't even start with that car i wouldn't even start with that engine first of all what you want to do is start with a pretty fast car and then modify it so it's the same kind of thing maybe look for somebody who might be kind of on the verge of being disturbed and of course these days with designer drugs and everything uh you know and all the years they have of, of psychological experimentation uh they pretty much know who to look for and um they know what kind of person what kind of area they'll find a person in and then they can i suppose uh encourage those latent or maybe brimming to the surface uh propensities that they can expect to find yes and i mean we've talked about it before <clears throat> we had like um you know, video games in the modern era and all of our mass pew pew things that we got going on and everything. You know, we talked about how, like, if you go back just to the 1950s, a movie like Psycho from Alfred Hitchcock or The Birds caused people, or House on Haunted Hill, even all of those, all three of those movies caused people to get sick, walk out of the theater, demand their money back. And all these different kind of things. But now think about the kind of stuff that even a five-year-old can handle. They can watch somebody be like decapitated right in front of them and like be like, oh, I saw that in a video game. Right? Like it, yeah. doesn't, even, it doesn't necessarily, everyone wants to go on to the, it makes people violent thing. No, it doesn't necessarily make people violent. It makes people le care less about violence. Right. Like yeah. which will then pre-program someone who's already a little disturbed. Like if they get a hold of something like that, yes, it can make them violent. too. it doesn't do the, that to the mass of society, but it will do traumatize them. Right. However, someone who's already traumatized, it might could push them further. Right. Right. And it's kind of like the not all, not all argument. People might say, oh, how dare you? It doesn't turn people into, you know, psychopaths. Well, not all. I mean, imagine if maybe there are some people born with a 99% percentage points of empathy and there's some people born with only nine. So then all you have to do is subtract, you know, maybe nine from the general population and somebody who was born with 99 sort of says, look, I mean, it's affected me slightly maybe, but I still have 90, what's the math here? 1% empathy for everybody. Uh, whereas the other guy then is a flat out stone cold serial killer so it's a bit like the other phrase where somebody might say if they want to break somebody's encryption um you know i only have to be like to break to break encryption you only have to be lucky once kind of thing uh whereas the people who want to stop people uh breaking into secure systems they have to be lucky all the time that kind of thing yes 
you know, and it works in reverse for criminals and police. Police need to be lucky once. The criminals got to be lucky every day, right? Like mm. same thing. But all of this leads me into, uh, you know, wanting to set the scene for like what go was going on in London at this time. And this is something most people don't focus on when they talk about uh, the Ripper. But it's super important, as I will illustrate here very soon. Hopefully. As I was illustrating. Well, do you want to uh, launch right into then you're setting the scene for, is it Victorian uh, London in 1888? Yeah. Or, um, yeah. Okay. Yes. Late 19th century. Uh, London is the, okay. Remember uh, the U S the world wars have not happened yet. So the U S is not the super powerhouse. It would then become later on right now. Britain is hands down the most powerful empire in the entire world, right? They own the oceans, basically. They, they, you know, they have India, they have all the best stuff, right? But despite that, you have immigrants coming in from all over. Poverty is running rampant, rampant, like, you know, disproportionate wealth. You have, you know, things are just nuts. And because you have so many of these nobles and different uh, industrialists and shit owning uh, all this property with all these poor tenants on it. They're not taking care of it. The, you know, their, oh, the, the, uh, like police structure is rather recent. I mean, we're talking a couple of decades old at this point. People are just now getting used to the fact that police are walking around the streets with their heavy shoes. Right. And they did that on purpose, by the way. They wore heavy wooden shoes so that, that you would hear the police's footsteps. And they thought that maybe this would act as a deterrent, which, fun, uh, funny side note, that's why your sneakers are called sneakers, by the way, is because like, around this time, uh, you know, they figure like, pe like people started putting rubber on the bottoms of their shoes so that they could sneak up on people on those cobblestone streets. And that's where the uh, shoes covered uh, with the bottom covered in rubber got the name sneakers in the first place. It's so that you could sneak up on people. And they they suspect that Rip, the Ripper used those in order to sneak up on his victims because like he had learned from the police ahead of time that those heavy shoes will let you know someone's coming. But either way, all of this stuff was new at the time. Nobody was used to it. And you have overlapping jurisdictions, which makes things all kind of complicated. You know, crime was rampant, murder going unsolved, people starving to death, freezing to death, all these kind of things because they can't come up with their uh, their DOS money to like, you know, to buy the room for the night or whatever, which is something you hear with a lot of the girls murdered by the Ripper. Like this is what they were out doing that late at night was trying to come up with the money to buy a bed for the night. Right. And underneath all of this like just a couple years before you know you have the ripper uh coming in onto the scene you know you have Karl marx drumming up things in the 1870s and all this other kind of stuff and socialism was becoming quite popular in london at the time right and then in 1886 it was one of the coldest winters they had ever had and, you know, people, it caused such hardship on people that there was an uprising, right? And uh, from, the, like, there were thousands of out-of-work men and women from the East Ends. They, the docks down there on the East End, they all gathered in Trafalgar Square. And there were violent speeches uh, from eminent socialists like uh, George Bernard Shaw and his friends. They were all there. And there was rampant looting and rioting. All this stuff is familiar to people today, right? And, well, you know, just, they... Yeah, go yeah, ahead. While you say it there, I mean, one of the things that I noticed in context was that, uh, so the Irish famine was from around, they say, 1945 and maybe lasted for seven years into the 1950s. So, or 1850s, beg your pardon. So uh, that would have caused a lot of people, they didn't, Irish people didn't just all emigrate to America. A lot of them would have emigrated to London quicker to get to, and maybe they felt, look, we'll get a job quicker there. So uh, in this area, or in London, but particularly in Whitehall, according to Wikipedia anyway, there would have been a lot of Irish living there from the uh, mid-1840s onwards. And then, and I'll just say this uh, without naming the, the sort of other group, there was a group from Russia who apparently then in the 1880s, 
were escaping or said that they were escaping uh, what they called a pogrom from Russia. So they would have been newer Im immigrants into the area living amongst the same people, as you say, then in, in these DOS houses or... Uh, I mean, the way they describe it, it was one of one of the descriptions I read was that uh, it was a sort of a community type house where like 50 or 100 people could be living in, in this same house and that uh, it, it cost a penny or two pennies to sleep in one of these beds. And it was just uh, basically anybody could, could be there, men, women and children. And that there was a sort of maybe a cheaper option of not having a bed, but sleeping in a, in a canopy that was strung across the same room, so basically dividing these already crowded rooms uh, in half, uh, sort of horizontally. Yes, like all this is true. This is all these are all things that were going on, you know, in the, the greater part of, you know, the old part of the city, greater London or whatever. Obviously, none of this uh, stuff like encompass the financial district the part that they call the city right like none of it reached there but either way like all of this stuff went down and as you can guess the crown was not pleased and you know by 1887 you know this was queen victoria's jubilee year right this is a big year but then it became uh, like you know during that year like on november 13th 80, 1887 a battle uh, erupted in Trafalgar Square that's called Bloody Sunday, right? Uh, that 100,000 demonstrators, including George Bernard Shaw, William Morris, and all their friends, quite literally got into a bloody battle with 4,000 police constables right there in uh, Trafalgar Square, right? You know, and then three months later, another riot <laughs> erupted in Trafalgar Square. So, Things were really, really tense in London right there. And people like Shaw and his uh, friends were really agitating for these socialist programs. It's something I can't stress enough is that there was all kinds of you know, people you know, agitating for this. And then you have the newspapers come in and George Bernard Shaw's friends there at the Star newspaper, which if you know the Ripper case, then you'll know the name the star because it's the one that like was uh really hot on the ripper stuff first right it was now, one of the very first just, newspapers to get on it can i just check with that are you saying that uh, george bernard shaw uh, participated in uh, the physical riot against the police yes yes like uh, you know fighting police like you know with weapons yeah bare fist okay, um, uh, uh, think of a uh, uh, gangs of New York type situation, but in London. Right. Well, look, I mean, the thing is, I, um, I, I didn't know it, that. And I'd better just say this then that from what I know of having uh, in the last few weeks read his Wikipedia page, uh, it says that he emigrated from Dublin. He was, I better not go into his bio too much. Apparently his father was a bit of a drunk. Uh, his mother maybe married his father out of nobody better to marry at the particular time. Uh, he suspected that maybe his father wasn't even his real father and was a sort of a friend of the family. That friend of the family, I think, then emigrated at some point to London. And then within either a year of or a year or two, George Bernard Shaw, or his mother then went over, I think, then as well. And then within, within a year or two, uh, he went over to join them. Uh, so he emigrated from Ireland to London. He himself, by the way, was, uh, I think, you know, more or less what might have been referred to as, as another Anglo-Irish poet or playwright, uh, because he may not have been born in England. I can't remember. I don't think so, actually. But just the fact that he was a Protestant, so that he was considered more English, uh, but living in Ireland. Yes. And so it just yeah. seems curious then that he, he I, I'm not 100% sure on his politics. I mean, I know that we can say that he was a communist or a socialist, but that might mean a slightly different thing or a social justice warrior for whatever exactly that might have meant there as well, you know, and we'll, we'll read one, at least one of his letters later. So I suppose I just don't want to say, decide in my mind exactly what I think he was, although it, it, it seems to me that his political views were fluid, changeable, perhaps hypocritical, inconsistent, I'll say at least. What, what do you think on that? Yes, well, I mean, he was definitely someone who subscribed to the, the very same philosophy that is the foundation of the left's philosophy today. Um, 
he uh, like he's right there with Marx in that in the founding fathers of what is modern uh, leftist politics, right? Um, he um, he was someone who like as I you know I sent you a clip there. He was somebody who praised a uh, funny little mustache man. Um, yes, and well, there, we can't we can't play it then. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's in the description. Yes. Well, you know, there's a reason for that. And a lot of that comes down to, you know, what we've talked about, about the British Israelism and, you know, the king's, uh, you know, bloodline and all that other kind of stuff. We'll see uh, the the those people, those particular people that don't believe in a modern state of Israel and don't believe in a third temple and all that. See, those are the ones just like in World War Two that they wanted to get rid of while there's a specific group that do support that as long as they get their third temple and everything, that would be those, uh, Zionists there. Um, those people like, uh, you know, it's a, it's a divided group. They want rid of some of them and they want to keep the others to use them and get where they're trying to get just like today. Um, which is where they come in, in the Ripper case, by the way. Um, those that you talked about immigrated there, they, they are kind of some that, uh, you know, would be like to get rid of. Right. They're not the good kind that they like. Um, you know, and I mean, he is a complicated person. I will give you that. Like, uh, you know, George Bernard Shaw is definitely a complicated fellow. But at the same time, like he most certainly does subscribe to or did subscribe to a more semantic philosophy, which did cause him to contradict himself a lot, which, you know, just like the left today, you, you see it in their in the way they perform today. It, you know. It's echoed. Well, yeah, JC, that's kind of what I was thinking as well. You know, I was about to reach that or not reach that conclusion, but I was certainly saying, well, again, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, it seems to me that, you see, the reason why I mentioned just that part of his bio in that his father was a bit of a drunk, never like w was was given a good civil service job, but didn't apply himself to it. Uh, the mother, I think, got fed up with him that, you know, she felt she was marrying into somebody who was probably from, if, if not high society, certainly on the periphery of that kind of network where if he wasn't a member specifically of, um, you know, a brotherhood club that, you know, he would have been looked after because he was at least a cousin of somebody or that kind of thing. Uh, so yeah. I think his mother then felt hard done by, I think, uh, that uh george bernard show himself there was a phrase that they used and it was it was something along the lines of that they were shabby upper class or shabby upper middle class something that's where they felt that they deserved uh a, an opulent lifestyle but just currently didn't have the funds sort of thing and so i think that on the one hand he might have felt like that he had an affinity with the working class or wanted to help them but on the other hand maybe wanted to be part of i mean and then becoming a playwright and all this kind of thing uh, wanted to be part of some kind of um you know hoity-toity class maybe as well maybe he didn't really know what he wanted like a lot of people i suppose yes well i mean you find this with the left today you know they'll feign this this care for the lower classes and in these letters that we like will read of his later you'll see that his view of how to deal with the poor is basically get rid of them right like he like it's not you know, it's not as altruistic, you find, as like what it would seem on its surface, very much like the left today, you know, like their idea of, you know, mercy is like, OK, put them in these little cracker boxes and then convince them to get in one of these uh, self deletion pods or whatever. And that's mercy. <laughs> right. Um, you know, you'll find uh, uh, Shaw praising things like, you know, uh, out and out genocide. Actually, you know, he and you know, eugenics as well. Um, you know, he'll say that, like, you know, his funny mustache man was forced to, you know, to do all that stuff because of bad social policies, <laughs> you know, and all these other yeah. kind of things. So uh, he's, yeah, like you see, a, you will see a lot of parallels between his philosophy and the philosophy of the left today. I mean, it's all yeah, right. Yeah, I'll take uh, what you say there as, uh, if not almost certainly correct. Just having re recently just, uh, you know, because I was putting it into the description there that you gave me to uh, put it in there. Having watched it again, I mean, I have to sort of say, look, I'm going to reserve complete judgment because 
I don't know if you want to do this because we are jumping around or jumping straight ahead. I, I, there might be more context to the thing that he's talking about. I suspect, and, and suspect more from having read one of his letters there to the Star newspapers. Again, I mean, the, whether it's exactly the same newspaper or the same name, there's still the British tabloid, the Star there, you know, mm-hmm. and sensationalizing things. And I know that people like to write in whether, I don't know if tabloids were invented then. In fact, I doubt it. But there would have been, you know, a hierarchy of more classy and less classy newspapers. These days, it's not classy. But then, who knows? Maybe, mm-hmm. it, maybe it was felt that it was less classy because it was delving into a sort of a more salacious type of, uh, well, unhealthy interest in the murder of, you know, young ladies or maybe not so young, but ladies of the evening of the streets. You know, um, that people kind of felt like, well, we shouldn't be. Uh, interested in this from any other point of view other than oh this is terrible this must be stopped but people felt that there was a frisson of you know this perennial thing of mixing death and sex and violence and um uh you know other well you know that there's this danger then that if you mix murder and sex that people might sort of say well i don't know what i'm getting excited about now anymore but it's maybe a mix of all this you know a heady mix of all this so that maybe uh, the the star newspaper if it had a good reputation it, it, then before that it might have sullied its own reputation and got a reputation for these kind of things but looking at the letter anyway that he wrote it seems to me that what he's doing is like what a lot of people do and you see this with the more well newspapers at least that think they're upper class in uh, britain and ireland is that people write in and there's a formula there's a template where they kind of go a dear sir or dear madam um you know and it's it's like what you hear in the parliament even in canada and this kind of thing uh australia and well they don't do it so much in south africa but certainly in england you hear this where they kind of go oh my right honorable member might be surprised to know that i sometimes joined uh, or sometimes attended the same rugby club as he did ha ha or this kind of stuff you know what i mean and so they write in in this sort of tone of voice and they think they're making some kind of erudite uh little whimsical joke they think they're it's basically the equivalent of a hot take right so they just they want to say something that's controversial they want to say it in a sort of oblique way and then they sign off yours sincerely uh, or yours uh, yours etc this kind of thing so i am looking at that now and saying i don't think we can truly take what he wrote there as his full and honest opinion because i I think he knows he's playing to the gallery sort of thing would you give him uh, would you allow him to admit or would you say that we 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 need to take into yeah go ahead there into reading his letter well uh the thing is like is (laughs) Once you get the full picture on Shaw, like you definitely don't like. I don't come away with that take at all. Like it, it fully does seem to be his belief. And like when you look into the riots he inspired, the fighting the police actually like trying to kill folks, uh, you know, and all the other things he did, like that is not absolutely not the take I come away with. Um, he is a, a revolutionary to no end. And as far as the Star newspaper goes. Uh, remember, as I said, like the editor of that newspaper, as well as the reporters there were all his friends. Uh, so, you know, and were all socialists as well. So, and many of the other newspapers that reported the Ripper also were, there were some conservative ones, but you know, after that, uh, last riot or whatever, you even have the, the queen getting, uh, riled up and riding, uh, you know, William Gladstone, uh, the prime minister, uh, she wrote, wrote, the queen cannot sufficiently express her indignation at the monstrous riot, which took place the other day in London and which risks people's lives and was a momentary triumph of socialism, but a disgrace to the capital overall. So this is even showing that the queen has slight, uh, socialist leanings herself. But even then, like you look at like, what uh like would go on after that uh you know you have london's east end being basically vilified and ignored at the time and they're trying to figure out how to you know how to get average britons over to their side on this revolutionary socialist side right and the british people working men and women at like they were very conservative they liked their freedom uh, and, you know, the right of assembly and the freedom of speech, all these different things. And we're not really into the continental style governmental regiment, you know, uh, like they just they just didn't didn't like it. And when violence did take place, it was like 
it wasn't seen by the left as enhancing the road to reform in any way or anything like that. They realized that people's fear of that, of that violent mob in Britain at the time would actually repel them from it. Right. So they had to figure out some way to get into them. And I think that that's where the Ripper case comes in, you know, okay. By, and, um, yeah, but you know, radical. there is, what's that? Say that last thing, the rad the radical, Oh, I was going to say by 1888, London's radical press like the Star and the other papers like it, like were gaining power, actually. Like people weren't turned off to this stuff. They were actually turned on to this stuff. They wanted to read the salaciousness and all these kind of things. And I think this is where, you know, modern uh, these modern, um, you know, architects of this evil dastardly plan started to realize that people do have a taste for these kind of things. And if you eke it out in just the right way, you can maybe get them riled up. Right. Mm, really. I mean, I'm not saying that they didn't like it. Uh, I, I'm saying that, yeah, definitely they, d people d did have a taste for it, but each one, each person who read it kind of pretended maybe in public, Oh, this is shocking. It's terrible. But they had, uh, they, they were entertained by it at the very least, uh, or you know, in the same way people go to see a horror movie because they are frightened, but they're entertained at the same time. But I just wanted to say to you there, uh, as far as George Bernard, Shaw, Ber George Bernard Shaw goes, I mean, whether he realized or not, or to what extent he did, there is a contradiction between taking up the fight of the underclass or fighting for their rights or you know sort of saying it's terrible they live in such squalor or they and there was a movement at the time whether whether it was intentional to to you know subvert the family or take the children or whatever or whether there was a genuine concern that you know this isn't good that children are sleeping in these dos houses with strange men strange women all together we must at least have some place for a home where where unmarried mothers can go with their children to be safer well, but um, as far as, you know, what are the, the, the sort of political social causes were at the time and whatever he believed himself, like there is a contradiction between him, at least ostensibly, you know, taking up the side of the underclass and yet at the same time, uh, perhaps having a foot in the secret societies, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think you know we could say that he, he was a founder member of the the Fabian Society and things like that. Who, as you're sort of saying there, might have been behind a plan to create uh, these type of modern distractions that live to this day, where there's always something in the current news cycle to be either frightened or titillated by, or a bit of both. Yes, I mean always, and I think this is where, like back then, is where the roots of all this. Uh, the way the press functions today, I think is where that comes in. And I, you know, I believe I can illustrate uh, that the press are the ones who wrote at least like the, like the first two or three Ripper letters anyway. Right. Because they were using uh, what's called an Americanism. You know what an Americanism is, right? And see at the time you didn't have, regular people the poorer classes would not have known americanisms americanisms at the time in the 1880s were used exclusively uh, most exclusively by the elites that traveled between new york and london right the newspaper elites like that you know here in new york and in boston and other uh, big cities here on the east coast of america were the ones that used these terms, uh, like, for instance, in the first letter, it was addressed to the boss, Central News Office, London City, and opened with, Dear boss, I, kept, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. You know, and it, it continues to boast, and, uh, boast about, keep this letter back till I do a bit more work, then give it out straight. My knife is nice and sharp. I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Well, part of the, that postscript read, don't mind me giving the trade name. The letter is, you know, it's it's pretty well written, right? And it uses, uh, it, you know, uses carefully, uh, like, you know, studied words like won't, right? And, you know, shows a proficiency for punctuation and stuff, which shows that he's smart, whoever wrote it. But they use the phrase like give it out straight. Give it out straight is one of those Americanisms that I talked about. Like, it's a, you know, and there's other ones too, like uh, using the word boss, 
right for somebody of uh, you know of high sta status and things these are these are things that were said here in america and used by the press specifically in new york and places like that right uh, New York, San Francisco, places that were, you know, homes for the liberal cause uh, and still are today, by the way. Um, you know, but the, yeah. the London press basically would have been very familiar with these these t this terminology, but regular people wouldn't have been right. They, they just wouldn't have been familiar with that. They would have had their own colloquial uh, colloquial terms uh, for things, you know. You have a mix well, of Irish and Scottish and, you know, Welsh and, you know, Anglo-Saxon uh, descent people there native to London all mixing together. Like they're not they're not all going to be aware of these Americanisms. Well, these are exactly the kind of things which uh, forgers then, you know, come a cropper with where they use some kind of terminology um, that is not in, in uh, accordance with the 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 locale as you say or maybe the 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 um the type of english spoken in london at the time so it's both uh, th there's a time element involved like would people have spoken in that way at the time and also in that region so yeah uh, no doubt uh, people would be you know at the time and later when they're trying to do their sort of uh, investigations uh, many years later uh, deciding mm -hmm. what would have been uh, what's the word for it? maybe extemporaneous or um incongruous with the the um well as you say the sort of vernacular at the time and yeah I, on wikipedia i think i did put a link in the description there to the dear boss letter and uh, in my head when i was reading it earlier i was reading it out in a sort of um dick van dyke like a mockney accent you know <laughs> but uh yeah i mean i shouldn't be laughing i was thinking to myself at it but at the same time with time and distance they think there can be a comedic aspect especially when the accent i was trying to put on was varying between Cockney Australian, some kind of Northern English. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, there might be. So it's difficult to know. But I, I can take your point there that even saying "dear boss," it's certainly unusual. Mm. Um, you know, maybe if if I was thinking of Dick Van Dyke, maybe I, I would think he'd be saying like sort of "dear governor" instead of "dear boss" or something like that. You know. And I mean, on top of that, you have the fact that, you know, if he was a, you know, if the Ripper was just a commoner, a common man, then why is his, are his letters coming to, uh, like all these different press people, which serial killers don't typically do, by the way, they typically send their letters to one reporter at one paper and taunt the police that way. This one sent it to all these liberal leftist papers, which is weird. Okay. I see. Well, and then on top of that, you have him writing in a, a style that is press like, like he, he writes, he uses correct punctuation. He, you know, and all these different kind of things, stuff that like common people who knew how to write would have, you know, they would have barely known how to write. Right. It wouldn't well, have been a common thing. Yeah, well, just like AP News and Reuters, uh, he apparently sent it to the Central News Agency, and uh, Wikipedia says it was a news distribution service founded as a central press in 1863 by William Saunders and his brother-in-law, Edward Spender. Those might yeah. be people at some point we could look into, but yeah, uh, very similar to a new, like, so he knew to, to send it to the news dis distribution service rather than the police or a single newspaper, and therefore he was looking to get maximum coverage and he was media savvy. Um, look, I'm, yeah. I'm, I want to do this. Can I, seeing as we mentioned it, and then the, there's the other letter there uh, that you mentioned about George Bernard Shaw, uh, so that we don't forget to come back to it. Let's do those letters. Can I give a quick uh, Dick Van Dyke type of thing? We'll see where my accent drifts off into, and just read this. It's fairly quick, this, this letter, the Dear Boss letter, the first one at least anyway. Absolutely, go ahead. All right. So, Dear Boss, oh, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. Okay. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. That joke about that leather apron gave me real fits. I am down on oars and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand work the last job was. Or I gave the lady no time to... Now we're into Australian. No time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and want to start again. You will soon hear of me with my funny little games. 
I saved some of the proper red stuff in a ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with, but it went thick like glue, and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope. Ah, ha, ha. The next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to, to the police officers just for jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work, then give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp. I want, I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. I'm getting all northerner now. Good luck. Mm. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Don't mind me giving the trade name. P.S. Wasn't good enough to post this before. I got all the red ink off me hands. Curse it. No look yet. They say I'm a doctor now. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes. Yes. Well, like, that's a, that was, like actually not that bad, <laughs> honestly. Like it got a little off there at the end, but you were doing really good there. Like with the Cockney accent, I think I'm not English, but like you I know, think I drifted into English. Lancashire. I think I drifted into Lancashire, but, but anyway, <laughs> a little bit. But it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad considering, like yeah. You know, and I, but you can't like miss that trade name thing either. The trade name is super important because you know that helps brand it in the public's mind. You know how much the public likes those one-liners, man. And a catchy name, a catchy name will get them every time. Zodiac Killer, Jack the River. You know, they almost called him the, like, uh, they called him Leather Apron or the Apron Man or something like that. It was like one of some early names until they, uh, you know, he gave the name of the Ripper, which is another funny thing. Like, it, you know, it shows at the very least if he wasn't the paper guy, which I think he was somebody at the papers, but whatever. Like, it showed him going to the central news agency and mailing it early in the morning and all these other kind of things shows he knows exactly how the news service works on the inside. And then on top of that, like I said, you have all these other things pointing to it. And then they give him the trade name right after, like, you have all the other papers. Like, you know, he gives the letter giving himself a trade name right after the papers are sitting here trying to give him one. Right. So at the very least would show he's reading the papers and he's like, OK, well, I'll give my own self a trade name. Right. Yeah. That no. if you're saying he's an independent character and not affiliated with them in any way. But right. I think that the Fabians and the Papers and the Ripper were all working together. I think there's some kind of I think we're missing a middleman somewhere who's basically like, OK, well, you figure if these liberal these liberals, these uh, Fabian socialists are uh, able to start riots and fight 4000 police officers. Right. They're able to gather up 100000 people strong behind them and fight 4000. police. That's that's a big deal. They're pretty powerful. And that's a lot of people that like out of the you mean to tell me out of those hundred thousand people, those Fabian socialists couldn't pick one that they knew is particularly good with a knife, pay him to go do whatever. Or maybe he's ideologically charged enough to go and do it on his own without even being paid. And then you have their friends within the news agency or who are aware of it and all of them working together to make this happen. You see, like because they all know each other. Like, you know, that's that's what all the evidence would point to the fact that all of these people are, you know, they either know each other or they're taking advantage of the world's first serial killer, which is another whole thing anyway. Like, why is he the world's first? I'm sure there had to be one before him, but this one is the one you point the finger at and like everybody, and you know, put the spotlight on like it just doesn't. Something is like that's why the Ripper case has always intrigued me, and I think that's why it intrigues other people too. Something about it just ain't right. You know what I mean? Sure. Something sure, sure. About it right. Well, look, when you uh, last week sort of mentioned that there was an apron, there's two apron things, and so we'll mention the aprons now because I guess, well, look, he mentions that the joke about that leather apron gave me real fits. Now, look, if somebody's wearing a leather apron, that's a butcher, right? So, it, or a mason. Stone masons, butchers, uh, stone masons, butchers. Well, this is what I was going to say. So, like, I mean, work, when I, well, that's work. what I was going to say. When I think of, of a, a mason, I think of a lamb's wool apron. But when I saw a leather apron, I thought of a butcher. But uh, mm. so, but you're, you're going to say, no, no, like the apron does mean mason. And now the other apron involved was with the murder of one of the ladies. She was wearing an apron. Maybe it was a scullery maid's uh, 
or, or bartender's apron and uh, he apparently ripped off half of that to clean his blade with or, or to clean his hands maybe uh, mm. but so but you're you're saying even if it was a leather apron that still connotes uh, the freemasons it could be um as I had uh, alluded to before, like I'm not even a hundred percent that there was even an apron there, but if there was, it would, it very well could allude to the Freemasons. I'm not a hundred percent sure on the apron yet, because the more I look into it, the more it looks like the apron might not even have existed. And then you have this other shawl that popped up. Okay. There's another one that that's been going, making the rounds lately on social media where it's talking about, Oh, we have the DNA of Jack the Ripper, right? Well, there's mm -hmm. a big problem with that. That shawl that they're DNA testing is from the Edwardian era, you know, quite a while after the, you know, the, all of that. So, you know, you're talking 1900, so it couldn't be that shawl. You're not going to get his DNA off of something that was knitted by upper class people because it's a high class piece, right? It's a high class shawl. And yeah, I mean, you're not, um, not going to get his DNA off a high class shawl that was made after Jack the Ripper would have been dead. Well, let me just <laughs> read out anyway what it says is the bloodied apron. So it says mm -hmm. a section of and one of the victims anyway, uh, her name was uh, her surname was Eddowes. Um, let's see, Catherine Eddowes, E-D-D-O-W-E-S. So a section of her bloodied apron was found at the entrance to a tenement in Goulston Street. That's G-O-U-L-S-T-O-N or Goulston Street, Whitechapel, at 2.55 a.m. A chalk inscription upon the wall directly above this piece of apron read, the people we can't mention are the men that will be blamed for nothing. And this piece of graffiti became known as the Goulston Street Graffiti or Graffito. Uh, the message appeared to imply that a somebody or a somebody's in general, merely uh, incidental and nothing to do with the case. So uh, the reason why I'm mentioning these people who can't be mentioned is that the apron was found underneath this. I mean, so they said at the time. And uh, there was a bit of a hubbub about that. One of the policemen uh, before it could be photographed insisted that it be uh wiped off the wall and by the way they did have photography then although it was and, and it was it seems to have been ubiquitous although a new technology because they believed that if they took a photograph of the victim's eyes that their retinas might contain uh, the an image of the last thing they saw i.e the killer uh, so there there was you know the technology may not have been understood by the general public um anyhow uh, it is said that this uh, piece of apron uh, was what he wiped his hands and and his uh, knife with. So obviously it would have contained yeah. both uh, the victim uh, Catherine Edo's blood and uh, and his own in this doorway where they say as well that he must have known the area because it was one of the only places that was in darkness where he could have run to after committing the murder. Mm -hmm. Why do you? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I take it you don't believe that scenario that he ripped off part of her apron and well, then wiped his hands or his sword with it later. That's not the one they're uh, claiming to have his DNA off of. Like, it's not the ripped piece off of her blouse or whatever she was wearing that they're trying to DNA test. No, it's a it's a shawl that uh, they say that they found at a crime at one of the crime scenes, but it wasn't right. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a fake. Like so, like I don't know. Like it, you know that one, I'm sure. Like is fine. I don't know if his blood would be on it. Or if they could DNA test it, but that's not the one that they're trying to DNA test, as far as I know. Okay. Um, well, look, I mean, again, maybe there's a bit of confusion going on, but they claim that that what he did was is that he murdered Catherine Eddowes, and I don't to hand have the the place where he murdered her, but I think that's significant as well. And then the name of where he ran to is is significant because the funny thing is that it, the, the names of the places. Uh, actually, well, Twenty Nine Hanbury Street is the door through which. Uh, Annie Chapman I think maybe she might be connected the, the Chapman name might be connected to a street name but in any case um, at the time and in Wikipedia anyway, it says that they say that uh, he took this part of the apron from the murder scene to this dark alleyway so that he could clean his hands and from there then walk out into the street and kind of carry on maybe like at a, at a slower pace or whatever you know Yes. And I mean, that very well could be the case. Uh, you know, 
the the apron thing is you know that's one of the reasons i wanted to talk about it in that last stream is because it's one of the more enigmatic parts of it you know it and that uh graffito as they call it like is are the only clues other than the letters that there are right like that's all that they say that they have and, you know, the apron and these shawls and things like pieces of clothing and whatnot, they they keep coming up as, you know, something that might not even have been there. And that's it. You can understand why that would be interesting to me. Right. Because if they weren't there, then that shows somebody making them up for purpose, which brings a new dimension to the thing. Right. Oh, for sure. I mean, it definitely seems as if there's so much scope for the not just the uh, the media to be sort of polluting the the the, the evidence of the story and the public, or, or or you know putting ideas into the public, but the the crime scenes. Uh, I think even at the time, like, well, I don't just think I know from having read it that people were saying that the police were not just corrupt but incompetent, like we say now about our politicians. They're a heady mix of incompetence and corruption. And that uh, they were bungling the case and uh, contaminating crime scenes, just like uh, Sherlock Holmes would uh, berate. Um, I forget the name of the the police officer. He's always sort of you know running rings around, uh, yeah. and you know maybe that was the idea at the time. And maybe again, you might say this. Well, it was useful for the people to believe that the that the police were bungling. I mean, there's a, I suppose just when I think of it, I'll mention that in one of the things that they were doing to try and capture this guy right by the way there was like probably more than five victims but they they, they said that there's only five victims they're sure of that it was the same guy let's say jack the ripper who killed and because he was targeting women and because he was targeting perhaps uh you know ladies of uh ladies who had turned to prostitution i was gonna use the euphemism but why bother um and so what what the police would do, although they claim that it was never confirmed, but from reading a few things, it was uh, that uh, the police would dress up in women's clothes and a wig and walk around Whitechapel uh, or Mitre Square, where one of the or at least one of the murders took place, uh, hoping, I suppose, that they would bump into the guy or, or that he'd try and attack them. And then he'd turn around and go, you know, I'm a copper. Um, and yeah. You know, one of the things they sort of said was that you know it was them because they always wore their police boots. And then one on one instance, one of the policemen dressed as a woman thought he had uh, sort of clocked sight of a suspicious character was tailing him. And then he got accosted by a member of the public who went, "Hoy, you are a man dressed as a woman." And then he had to sort of go, "Shh, I'm a I'm a policeman undercover, right?" And then another right. time, there was a, a somebody dressed as a woman. I think it was a newspaper reporter who thought he'd get a scoop. Right. He had the same idea and a policeman accosted him and he said, yeah, you yeah, know, I know. And uh, the policeman went, oh, are you one of us? Right? <laughs> Meaning, are you one of the police dressed as a woman? And he went, no. And then they said, well, we're going to have to arrest you then. And spent uh, the whole day then carting him down to the cell and uh, debriefing him. So the whole thing was it, it was like a comedy, but not funny as well because of what was happening. Yes. And I mean, the you know, and at, like as we were talking about the star earlier, the Star and the Pall Mall Gazette, the two premier papers reporting on this, they were the the two biggest and most popular papers in London at the time. Right? They were the top selling newspapers. So that shows just how much people, uh, you know, were in this stuff, right? But you know, more than any you know previous endeavor before uh, before it, like. This one really shined a spotlight on like the situation in Whitechapel with like the destitute, the poor, you know, the the 304s as we call them today and all these other kind of things going on, right? The the squalor of outcast London as they put it, right? Well, um I'll say this that the Reading, uh, I don't know which Wikipedia page, but anyway, it said that uh, because of the amount of immigration, because of the poverty, because of uh, the deterioration or degeneration of the society there, because of the influx of at least two different groups or wave, I think they did say waves of immigration, both from Ireland and Russia and maybe elsewhere, of course, why not elsewhere? They, they, they unlikely to be the only ones. And the overcrowding that it said that within this general Whitehall area that there were, I think it said 60 something, um, what do they call them? 
I can't remember the term, but anyway, uh, houses of iniquity, let's say, right? I don't know why I'm using these silly uh, uh, euphemisms. Houses of ill uh, repute. Houses of ill repute. And I think they might have said that there was, oh, I can't remember the number now, but I'm going to say was they mentioned thousands. So it could have been 2,000 mm -hmm. uh, women working as prostitutes in this area. So uh, I suppose what you could sort of say is it was unlikely to be their only job. They might have been barmaids, you know, you know this, this, we, it's, it's no wonder we have these sort of cliches of, you know, wenches in, 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 um, in bars, you know, when, when maybe pirates or sailors rock up, like at one minute, like they're, they're serving you grog and next minute, you know, like in the wild west, we see all those kind of things as well, you know, uh, how it's portrayed about like you know the, the, there's serving girls downstairs or dancing girls or singing by the piano and you know this kind of way and then there's an upstairs area as well so it's not necessarily that it was their only job so that they might have been maids by the day or bar maids or whatever um yes uh washer yeah. women was very common especially for the older ones right so I think it said as well, like it was a way to maybe earn extra money. And, um, you know, so like, I mean, the thing is about prostitution is it's easy to do. Um, and uh, you, if you want more money, you can always do that sort of thing. So uh, and then, of course, there's peer pressure, I suppose, well, or normalization of it. If other people are doing it, you might sort of say, well, if you can't beat them, join them sort of thing. Maybe. Okay. I mean, look, people think they wouldn't do anything. But if, if they're cold, hungry, tired, don't have a place to stay, need to supplement their income. It's what happens. We know what happened in Weimar, Germany as well. Well, I mean, it's a good thing that men can't, like, do that shit as easy because if there was, like, you'd have, like, male prostitutes, like, absolutely everywhere <laughs> because I know all kinds of dudes that have been broke and been like, dude, if I could if I could just bang somebody for some cash, like, I'd definitely do it right now. So if I know dudes that would do it, then you know, like, females, like, who don't have any skills back in that time it would have been something like they would have known like that they didn't want to do because of what it would have done to the reputation. But especially if you didn't have a rep much of a reputation to begin with and you're poor and hungry, I mean, that's quick cash. Like you there said, you it's, easy. you don't have to know, you don't have to know anything. You don't have to even, you just got to lay there. there right? you are. It's, uh, if you, as you say, if you don't have much of a reputation to lose, and the other thing people will say, oh, there's such a thing as male prostitutes. Yeah, but it, it's, uh, again, with so many things, uh, it's not comparing, you know, the same thing with women and men. Uh, with, yeah. with women, they, unless you're, you know, extremely unpleasant to look at, you have some commodity that you can always sell. Um, whereas with men, yeah. like, you you know, to be a jiggler or whatever, you have to be exceptionally good looking or charming or whatever, you know. Yeah, so, you need to be uh, driving and it's like douche bigelow male gigolo everybody saw that movie with anton or whatever his name was dude had all the weapons on his wall was like i got weapons on my wall and everything but the, the, that's not here there the the the, well, the, the the weird proclivities for like the big houses the fancy cars and all the the other stuff the the weapons on the wall is a bad example um the you know, like to drive ferraris and you know have like fabio like hair and stuff exactly like it, yes you have to be like that, Fabio. Um, and look, that's no point in, in delving into it too much. But like, of course, there's such a thing as sort of gay male prostitutes and like men might be less fussy in that case. But look, it's all by the by, right? Uh, people, I think people are adult enough to figure out, you know, the, the, the economics of the whole thing. And I suppose I'm just mentioning that about the women because people might sort of categorize people as one thing or another. Um, and just to sort of say like that might humanize them a bit more uh, because, of course, the... Uh, common another common thread with serial killers is is that uh, oh they only murdered prostitutes or vagrants or down and out people but these were all people maybe of, of a similar class and i don't just mean like low class or proletariat or whatever they might have said in london at the time working class uh, these were all people of a community so they weren't any lower or higher than each other in that community and uh you know maybe across london as well so i suppose i'm sort of saying like well it's not a great phrase to say blurred lines, but there was gray areas or rounded edges on things, blurred edges on things. Uh, so, yeah, so it, 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 we might tend to sort of say, ah, he just murdered prostitutes, as they might have done then. But it's it definitely isn't as simple as that. Uh, and people, I think, did miss them, although there might have been so many people coming and going because of immigration that there, there, there definitely seems to at least have been the distinct possibility that some of the victims themselves might have been confused for other people. Yeah. Well, um, by the time all this had happened, 
people definitely cared like the papers made them care well you know there was the first two mur murders and then they got to the one where he was interrupting he killed two ladies right well after that event like the 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 story focus kind of shifted away from the murder and it became more about the people uh, of the area and how destitute they were and all that kind of shit so much so that 5,000 people including uh members of the upper classes and stuff wrote uh you know gave their signature to a petition to the queen to do something about it so and it had no intention to apprehend the killer. They didn't say anything about we need you to apprehend this killer. No, what they asked the queen to do was do something about the social issues because that's mm -hmm. what the paper had been shining a spotlight on. Like by the by the fourth murder, like they were the the papers had fully shifted uh, the story to a vehicle for socialist propaganda. Well, look, like things were yeah. Well, seeing as we're circling back around with then anyway, um, that, that again leads you to your sort of overall uh, idea. And it's not just, I suppose, your idea. I mean, it seems to be uh, something that uh, I'm not taking away from you, but but it's it's not uh, out yeah. of that field too much. It's very reasonable then to sort of say, ah, well, look, an average person might say, look, let's fix these social issues rather than just go after one killer. Maybe it's a good time to sort of say, well, let's let's examine the squalor that's in London and the, and the condition, set of conditions that might have flowed together to create uh, the situation where somebody like this in our society can run through uh, people like this. And uh, because there's commons and goings, immigration and people who are too poor to have their own homes and uh, people who fall through the cracks, these kind of phrases, let's fix social issues. And maybe the queen might have felt embarrassed as well. Is if that the news, this kind of thing was actually making her look bad that, that within her own city, uh, that um, the public w was not just growing restless, but, uh, you know, that, that, that there was somebody disturbing the citizens and, and that it might have, well, made it look like that she was less powerful even. if they, I mean, I'm sure she might have had some empathy, but let's just say that she did but that it would have just made her look bad the longer this went on. But because of the mm. social issues thing then, and, and you know, that then, as you say, the sort of maybe predictable claims that, you know, somebody do something about something, uh, and then somebody else comes along and sort of says, well, this has galvanized the public uh, sentiment to do something about it. Will you let me read out at least part of this letter anyway? I don't think it's too long from uh, the first one, I think, as, as you sent me the link, it's in the description there to the star, to the editor of the Star newspaper on September the 24th, 1888. By all means, okay. go for it. Well, this is from uh, George Bernard Shaw to the editor of the Star. Sir, will you allow me to make a comment on the success of the Whitechapel murderer? In other words, that's what they call Jack the Ripper at the time. In calling attention for a moment to the social question. Less than a year ago, the West End Press, headed by the St. James Gazette, the Times, and the Saturday Review, were literally clamoring for the blood of the people, hounding on Sir Charles Warren to thrash and muzzle the scum who dared to complain that they were starving, heaping insult and reckless calumny, I think that's uh, slander, basically, on those who interceded for the victims, applauding to the skies the open class bias of those magistrates and judges who zealously did their very worst in the criminal proceedings which followed behaving, in short, as the propri proprietary class always does behave when the workers throw it into a frenzy of terror by venturing to show their teeth. Quite lost on these journals and their patrons were indignant remonstrates, remonstrances, messed that up there, remonstrances, argument, speeches, and sacrifices, appeals to history, philosophy, biology, economics, and st statistics, house investigations into the condition of the unemployed, all unanswered and unanswerable, and all pointing the same way. The Saturday Review was still frankly for hanging the appellants and the Times, in other words, the people who called for it, and the Times denounced them as pests of society. This was still the tone of the class press, as lately as the strike of the Bryant and May girls. Now all is changed. Private enterprise has succeeded where socialism failed. 
whilst we conventional social democrats, in other words, he and his sort of Fabian group, were wasting our time on education, agitation and organization, some independent genius has taken the matter in hand and by simply murdering and disemboweling four women, converted the proprietary press to an inept sort of communism. The moral is a pretty one, and the insurrectionists, the dynamitards, <laughs> what's that, like leftards, the invincibles, and the extreme left of the anarchist party will not be slow to draw it. Humanity, political science, economics, and religion, they will say, are all rot. The one argument that touches your lady and gentlemen is the knife. That is so pleasant for the party of hope and perseverance in their toughening struggle with the party of desperation and death. Well, there's only two more shorter paragraphs than that, but I better let you comment on any of that there. JC. Yeah, I'm here. Um, but yeah, I, like that, uh, you know, obviously I think that he was being a little sensationalist there and, but, at the same time, it's clear that he's aiming for something very particular. And uh, by the way, just in case anybody's missed our previous streams or anything else, they might be wondering, like, where the Freemasons fall into this. It's like, well, you know, the Templars are the Freemasons' ancestors, and Templars were socialists. Okay, like, that's why you get two knights on one horse, right? Freemasons themselves are a type of socialist because like they all pay dues into the a pot and then that pot is you know shared out for a joint work right so they they maintain a like a kind of this one foot in one foot out kind of thing and that's where they fall in on this they you know as i've explained before they they run both sides both the capitalist and the socialist side so all right yeah yeah, They're I mean, again, like, as we know, like, control the left and the right hands were both pillars of the argument. Yes, like, they're bankers who share assets and mm. and, uh, and an agenda, right? So, bankers is their cap, banking is their capitalist, like, ideology, and then on that same token, they want to make everyone else socialist. <laughs> right? So, oh, yeah. Well, as we know, it's, uh, what is it, cap uh, what is it? Cap capitalism uh, for me, but communism for thee. Something along those lines, isn't it? Yeah, so like something very much along those lines. Yeah, they'll still pitch their money into a pot like they always have for joint ventures and stuff, but think not that they don't have their own wealth that they that they hold on to, because they most certainly do. <laughs> right? Uh, they just don't want you to have any. They're, yes. you know, well, I tell you what, there's only a couple more shorter paragraphs. Let me finish the letter, and uh, then after that, maybe we can pause and uh, go back and uh, say hello to a few people in the comments. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Well, uh, George Bernard Shaw, in his letter to the editor of The Star, continues, uh, However, these things have to be faced. If the line to be taken is that suggested by the converted West End papers... If the people are still to yield up their wealth to the, and uh, I don't know these people, but he calls them the Clan Ricard class, and get what they can back as charity through Lady Bountiful, then the policy for the people is plainly a policy of terror. Every jail blown up, every window broken, every shop looted, every corpse found disemboweled means another £10 note for ransom. The riots of 1886 brought in 78,000 pounds. I bet you that's probably seven point or 6.2 trillion dollars now. And a people's palace, it remains to be seen how much these murders may prove worth to the East End in Panem et Serenses. Well, that's the old bread and circuses. So again, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Indeed. Mm -hmm. If the habits of duchesses only admitted of their being decoyed into Whitechapel backyards, a single experiment in slaughterhouse anatomy on, a, on an aristocratic victim might fetch in a round half million and save the necessity of sacrificing four women of the people. Women of mm. the people, very socialist language there, eh? 
eat the rich. Like yeah. he wants to like slaughter one rich person and you wouldn't have to kill five, four poor ones. But since we're not going to do that to the rich, we're just going to get rid of all the poor. But, you know, that's what he's saying. He seems to be anyway. Yeah, he seems to be saying, oh, you uh, hypocritical middle or upper class, uh, you don't care about these poor uh, women of the lower class getting murdered. You would only care if if one of your kind got murdered. Yes, which is true. And that's like always been the weapon of socialists, which is, you know, it's the same for the capitalists. Right. Uh, Like it's right. Just like right and left today. The left have some valid arguments. The right have a lot of valid arguments, but both sides also have a lot of stupid ass arguments that will lead us to the same place. Right. So it's the same thing going on then. And that's kind of the case I'm trying to make is the foundations for what we are seeing today were founded by Milner, Rhodes, uh, you know, the Fabian society at large, right? Like, and you know, Shaw fits into that. He's one of the club and they're all playing this game. The members of the, you know, the people at the top of the star and you know, all the, the Paul mall were, you know, members of the Fabian society and like a lot of these little secret circles as well. And then you have like all these penny illustrated things that they're also coming out, which aren't like, they're more like the tabloids we have today where they're actually showing, uh, you know, lurid and gruesome illustrations and stuff, right? So you have all these people working together like to get something done. Right. And well, let me just yeah. say this then, right? While I think of it, uh, now I have to admit that I don't think I've ever read it or seen the play, but uh, George Bernard Shaw maybe is best known for his uh, play Pygmalion. And it's about, and I think it's pertinent here. It's about a scullery maid, maybe she wasn't a prostitute exactly, but a lower class woman who two people had a bet on and they sort of said, I bet I can pass her off as a lady uh, of of high stature. And all I have to do is send her to elocution lessons and get her to speak all proper like. And uh, then we can bring her to, you know, some kind of debutante ball and uh, people will think she's the belle of the ball. And of course, there's been a lot of variations on that. the I think it was 1989 or 1990 the movie came out Pretty Woman, uh, which is basically the same thing. You know, Richard Gere picks up this prostitute, but she's so good looking he could send her to, um, you know, Rodeo Drive and the the, the nice uh, shops there in Los Angeles and uh, dress her up all nice, and she can pass as a lady then at the the uh, the country garden club. This kind of thing. It's the same thing. And by the way, uh, trading places. Same thing. I bet this. Uh, drug dealer uh, eddie murphy from the the streets can turn into a stockbroker so what he's doing there is appealing on the behalf of the downtrodden class but maybe pretending that he's separate from them but he's just so good natured like a lot of the leftists sort of say oh won't you think of the the poor eddie murphy's out here you know in, in the ghetto all i care about is them you know that sort of way and uh, I think you're very strongly suggesting their own secret agenda. Yes. Well, I mean, that is exactly the thing. And, you know, they have, they had this agenda under the surface that if you already like, you know, in hindsight today, knowing what the left's agenda is and that like what the overall arching agenda is that we, you know, we've talked about so much here in hindsight, like you can look at this stuff and start putting it together. It's very much like you said, this whole stream, more things change, the more things stay the same. It's, it's more of the same, right? It, all of this stuff got its foundation then, and all they've done is build on it since. Yeah. 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 There's been more organizations, more, uh, more quote unquote philanthropy and all these other kind of things, because that is what eventually would happen. You know, after the fifth murder and Mary Kelly, like they sens- sensationalized it more than any other. And after that, you have even the aristocracy um, starting. Like that's when philanthropy, quote unquote, really begins. But it's after the 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 last Ripper murder, like it was sensationalized so much that the 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 actual elite of the time started uh, donating huge amounts of money to socialist causes. And it, I think that that's where this stuff gets its foundation. 
Well, listen, I'm so glad there that you said philanthropy, because let me just finish the letter and we'll read on. You'll see that that word crop up. And if only I'd known when I was a kid. Look, parents, if you've got young children now, as soon as you think they're able to tolerate it or, or ready for it, let them know that a philanthropist is basically their word for somebody who is basically like a wolf in sheep's clothing you know always be wary of the of the some person who proclaims to be a philanthropist that they only care about other people it's uh, almost nothing, certainly a lie nothing's free so anyone who's trying to give you something for free is about to try to take something from you yeah well said well let me read the rest of the letter i'd nearly finished now and you'll see the word pop up almost immediately so mm. uh Continuing with the letter, he says, uh, you know, with regard to the, uh, you know, aristocrat, if the aristocrat might have been murdered, they wouldn't have been needed for, for four women of the people, you know, of the proletariat to be murdered or sacrificed. So he says, such is the stark naked reality. And by the way, I'm, I'm just quick aside now, no doubt, right, because these women were, were found grotesquely caught up and uh, naked. I think he knows when he says the stark naked reality, what he's conjuring into people's minds there. So he says, uh, such is the stark naked reality of these abominable, and he doesn't say illegitimate, but he uses a B word for that, abominable, illegitimate utopias of genteel charity in which the poor are first to be robbed and then pauperized by way of compensation in order that the rich man may combine the idle luxury of the of the protected thief with the unctuous self-satisfaction of the pious philanthropist. So there you are. I mean, he was describing exactly what they are, you know? These people but, who claim uh, to be philanthropists now. Yes, uh, absolutely. I would say that he's absolutely, he was absolutely correct there. I would agree with Shaw in that. The only thing is, like, when you really start looking into him, you'll start to see what he means by that, especially when you start getting into his relationship with Funny Mustache Man and, all, and you know, the Russian thing and all that. You start to see that, oh, well, he's not for, like, just giving the public money and stuff. What he is for is for um, giving money to organizations that will then, like... Um, you know, what used to be the Eugenics Institute, which uh, goes by a double P name these days, um, you know, that would be the, the planned uh, parenthood. Uh, <laughs> or, yeah. Uh, but the fact of the matter is... I'm just laughing because, uh, sorry, I just... I, I know this is a serious dream, but it's, it's it was a great bit of comic relief there the way you disguised by saying planned parenthood, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Real. Like that's one of those hot buttons, right? Oh, I know but, it. I know it. But I, I'm glad you. I, I appreciate the effort. I, I knew exactly that your heart was in it there. <laughs> it's just so funny the way it went. Parenthood, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like you gotta try to put those inflections on it and confuse the AI as much as possible, right? <laughs> um, but either way, you know. He want, he wants to uh, put money into these things, and his idea would be more in line with what the left wants today, which is, you know, just get rid of them, right? Offer them uh, self-deletion pods and uh, methodologies of, you know, basically taking themselves out, and that would be much more humane than making them live in these horrible conditions, mm -hmm. right? Well, look, I mean, just in case people think that you're engaging in maudlin, maudlin hyperbole, uh, in Canada, which is very progressive with regards to uh, self-deletion, as you say, or Futurama uh, booths that, uh, you know, they can go into, Futurama called it. Uh, mm -hmm. There is more than one case, but it was highlighted there by uh, this girl who has a or woman who has a YouTube channel called What's Her Face. And uh, she's from Canada or Toronto, maybe. And anyway, she says um, that there was a case there where this fellow, this man, I think, or young man, he might have been in his early 20s. Uh, said that he was feeling depressed and uh, the health insurance or, or the, the public health, maybe whichever, anyway, sort of said, listen, I'll tell you what we can do for you then. Instead of getting on these expensive drugs, uh, we can just put you out of your misery. How about that? <laughs> you know, and um, I think it has, sorry for laughing, by the way, of course, because it's not a funny thing. I think indeed, if not him, but there have been cases where even without the family being informed that once people say I'm depressed, they kind of go, oh, great. Well, we have this lovely booth for you to go into and you'll never come out of. And um, 
they think that they're doing people a favor. They claim that they think they're doing people a favor. And uh, their families might not even find out until the deed is done. Right. And uh, I mean, unfortunately, this is, you know, where we have found ourselves. And, you know, like I was saying, it, the you can see the the beginnings of this kind of thought process all the way back then in some of these founding members of the Fa fabian society and it just goes more to the point that we've been trying to prove here on this these subsequent streams is that this is an orchestrated orchestrated plan that was you know it was dreamed up a long time ago way before the technology was even a thing. And it goes back to what we talked about in other streams where they know that this stuff, this technology has existed before. So they can plan for it in the future. They right. can look at where the technology is right now and extrapolate out using mathematics and some other things to guess round about how long it's going to take Moore's law, for example, you know, technology mm -hmm. doubles every 18 months, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, you can use that to kind of predict where technology is going to go and they use yeah. it to great effect. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I'll just make this very quick observation then. Uh, you know, I have noticed or, or, you know, I suppose the realization has dawned upon me when I'm trying to build something, make something, whether it's out of wood or metal or electronics or whatever. If I know that there's a product out there that does that, then I know that it must be possible. So that means I can say to myself, oh, well, don't give up. I mean, I just have to figure out a way. It's a bit like sort of supposing if somebody says, look, in this jigsaw uh, puzzle box, I guarantee you all the pieces are there and I guarantee you they do fit together. Um, mm -hmm. Then, you know, it's just a question of keep trying. You'll get it right eventually. But if somebody just gives you a bag full of jigsaw pieces, you don't know if they're all part of the same thing. And you might give up sort of saying, look, I don't even know if these jigsaw pieces are meant to fit together. So. Uh, there's, I suppose, another slightly more uh, curious thing to illustrate that is that I have read it several times. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but I've I've heard it said that as far as chemical reactions go, and in particular, the one I read was about trying to get certain crystals to grow in a Petri dish, that it even extends to that once somebody has do done it already successfully in, say, a lab in London, uh, then they will be able to do it in a lab in California. Uh, much easier they'll be able to encourage the crystal to grow how that happens i don't know because we might have to start invoking this kind of um quantum entanglement or whatever but look it might be more of a, a rule in our particular world or universe than just once you have the knowledge it may be that things become more inevitable even as long as there is an instance of it somewhere in the world yes and then there's also the the you know the japanese monkey experiment or whatever with the sweet potatoes like that's an intriguing thing. Um, you know, I had to talk about sometime. Do you want to just know. give a synopsis of what it is? Oh, uh, well, okay. The scientists basically had two islands with two populations of the same kind of monkeys on it, right? Like both islands had two, uh, had a tribe of these monkeys and they were feeding the monkeys sweet potatoes. They'd toss them out on the beach. The monkeys would go eat the sweet potatoes, but in tossing them on the beach, they would get covered in sand and the monkeys didn't like the sand. Well, after a while, the monkeys figure uh, one monkey figures out, well, if I dip the uh, potato in water, it will wash the sand off and then I can eat the potato without having the gritty sand. Right. Well, once he learns it, like it wasn't very long before the rest of the monkeys on this island learned it. The amazing thing, though, is that as soon as all the monkeys on that island learned it, spontaneously, the monkeys on the other island that was separated by quite a lot of water and no monkeys left the left one island, went to another or anything like that. What ended up happening was spontaneously the monkeys on the other island just started doing it like that. Well, so it the does show, you know, it, it shows inklings of there being some kind of, some kind of connection between all things that does communicate information across time and space. Yeah. Um, look, however it happens, as you say, once one community learns how to do something, then uh, somehow, like through osmosis, or maybe in, to invoke that German word, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, that there is some ideas that like metaphorically or literally float around in the ether and people seem to just pick ideas up out of the air. Yeah. I mean, it could be something as simple as, okay, you know, 
Yeah, well, I don't know if it could be that simple or not, but it could be part of it anyways. It's like the fact that our brains work a certain way, there's enough of us all working the same way. Once there's a certain amount of technology around, it's just a matter of statistics that eventually somebody's going to take all these different parts that are floating around there and put them together in the right configuration to make something else. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it's just a statistical like thing that happens with the fact that all the parts are there are the need for the thing is there and we have the ability to do it. Right. It could be yeah. something like that uh, that's working on it, but that, that spontaneous learning of that whole Island full of monkeys, I can't seem to, you know, I would like to, you know, see if that experiment is infinitely repeatable, you know, with other populations somewhere else. It's something that, that zeitgeist thing or, you know, that, you know, that, that link between us all is something that has always intrigued me. Right. And, it, yeah. And there's a thing as well, you can bet that uh, the sort of American military uh, secret or, black ops whatever they're called themselves would have, you know like the men who stare at goats they would have looked into all that sort of stuff big time in the 60s wouldn't they oh Post yes World War II, anyway. and you know there's there's paperwork from the cia and stuff and some of their you know mk ultra program stuff and all these things where they do talk about human consciousness and you know or aura and all these other kinds of things so it's uh, you know yeah. Silent it, weapons it, for quiet it, wars looks into it too. Yes, he talks yes. about it. Yeah, um, it, it's all intriguing stuff that you know. I like, I can't uh, stop uh, looking into. I can't get enough of looking into that. Uh, that just because it it is. There's so much evidence for it, but it's one of those things that is elusive. You know, once you think you've got like a grasp on it, and you can actually wrap your hands around it, it just slips through your fingers. Yeah, it's yeah. real. Definitely seems to be elusive, like a dream wafting away as you wake up. I appreciate the uh, uh, relevant comment there from Dr. Crispy Rothschild. He must have uh, married into money there over the last week or so. Um, <laughs> let me finish off this last paragraph. This is the shortest paragraph, and then uh, we'll take a break and, and say hello to everybody else in the comments. Definitely. The proper way to recover the rents of London for the people of London is not by charity, which is one of the worst curses of poverty, but by the municipal rate collector. I think municipal might be another word for social uh, who will no doubt make it sufficiently clear to the monopolists of ground value that the, these are the la uh, landlords, I think of ground rent that he, he is not merely taking round the hat and that the state is ready to enforce his demand if need be. And the money thus obtained must be used by the municipality as the capital of productive industries for the better employment of the poor. I submit mm -hmm. that this is at least a less disgusting and immoral method of relieving the East End then the gust of bazaars and blood money which has suggested itself from the West End point of view. Yours, etc. George Bernard Shaw. So he's saying the West End is the glittering lights uh, theatre crowd, I suppose, and the East End is the Cockney working market stall type people. And so he's uh, he's just in the middle, just sort of saying, oh, the social inequity. Oh, no, we must make all this equitatious with capitalism. Yes. And I mean, at the same time, you know, he's saying, well, well, it's the same kind of thing you run into with the homeless today. It's like, OK, we could. Yes, we could try and rehabilitate them and put them back into the workforce. But that means workhouses and all these awful things that nobody likes. It means forcing. Pe it means not having the right to be lazy. Right. It means like just like uh, Soviet Russia, where you could go to jail for not going to work. Right. Although this, they did this, say they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. Mm hmm. For sure. And but that's kind of that's kind of the um, that's where he's he uh, headed with that. Right. If, it, you know, if it, you put everyone back to work and all that, he's saying it's a like you know it's a less detestable or uh, whatever word it was that he used uh, method of doing it or whatever. Well, 
that is until people don't really want to work. They want to like live in squalor and everything. And you have to start forcing them to do this, that, or the other. See that that's where the problem always runs in because a lot of the people that they want to help don't want help. Mm -hmm. Yes. So as we know, a lot of people just can't be helped. Yes. And if people don't want help, like, and you uh, create a system that is going to, you know, let me help you <laughs> type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, you're going to create a police state. You know, well, there, there's a certain amount of like, if you want freedom, there's a certain amount of uh, detestable and unfortunate things that you're going to have to put up with. Right, that's true. Um, I mean, the thing about Germany is that, uh, well, I mean, Germany of the past, but don't have to go too far back. I mean, I'm just sort of saying like back into the 90s is that uh, things were orderly and well run. But uh, I, I did find that, look, as well, as much as people might like the Germans, uh, there is such a thing as too efficient. I mean, the thing that British people and Irish people did notice, if you ever uh, went on holiday, say, in Spain or France or Italy, that the Germans would be up at the crack of dawn putting their uh, beach towels out, reserving the uh, loungers by the pool. And, uh, you know, they do this at 6 a.m. So you'd get up and there'd be nowhere to, to lie at the pool. And you just felt like this this is far too efficient, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So everything was just by the book and technical and all this sort of stuff. And we felt, felt that they were humorless as well. So that, you know, in having everything so regulated uh, that they had lost their sense of humor or their sense of the spirit of, you know, having, I don't know, the ability to relax a bit more, even when you're on holidays, you know. Now, at the same time, then by contrast, we have places like uh, Portland, especially, but maybe L.A. in California, but Portland in Oregon. And I don't know if you've seen it, but I've seen a lot. It just comes up in my feed, especially short videos about, um, you know, really ugly street scenes, people who are out of their minds and on different kind of drugs, perhaps prescribed, perhaps street, maybe alcohol as well, or mental health issues as well, screaming at each other, doing ugly things in the street to each other. It just all looks so, um, well, I'm try I don't want to keep saying the, you know, degenerate word, but it, it just looks like everything has deteriorated uh, into uh, slovenliness at the very least. Uh, and, you know, mm -hmm. sort of failed lives, hu human detritus, really. And so they've done this. I mean, of course, this is a tactic of the, of the Masons or the powers that be who sort of said, well, we'll give them all enough rub to hang themselves. We'll give them, uh, you know, all the drugs they want. And uh, we know that they won't have the self-discipline to sort of say, no, we need to come together voluntarily uh, to, to form our own communities and um, municipalities and uh, have a sort of sense of uh, greater, uh, what was it say, sort of responsibility maybe to one's own community. But they have mixed us up all around where there is no community spirit anymore. Nobody wants to work together voluntarily. Uh, so no. everybody is just sort of falling apart. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that comes back to, you know, our, the, the glue that, you know, those pillars that hold up society that we've talked about before. And it, it really has been degraded. And one of the reasons they degraded it is because they learned way back in the 1800s that this, you know, this social justice problem is one that they can use to great effect in order to get people to do things. It appealing to people's emotions, right? Appealing to that, those emotions and saying, Oh, well, don't you want to help them? Oh, you're a terrible person if you don't want to help them. It's like, well, but, but what if they don't want to be helped? Right? I know some homeless people right now, right now, that if you like offered them a hotel room and a shower for a couple of nights, they would take it. But if you tried to like put them up in a house and like get them to do like regular people stuff, not happening then. Yeah, not regular happening. people stuff. Yeah. Um, watching trains go by there says the problem with the word help is what form does it come in? Liberals think they're helping by giving them drug needles and crack pipes. Yeah, I mean, this week in the news, uh, it was New York, I'm pretty sure, where the mayor of New York, and I forget his name, but he's a black man who uh, seems to have been chosen because, uh, as he says himself, uh, New York is a brand and they probably felt that he fits with that brand. But anyway, there's vending machines in New York now where people can buy their drug paraphernalia, including needles. And of course, they say, oh, it's because we care so much about the drug addicts. We 
want them to have clean needles. And look, there's a school of thought, maybe, that as long as you don't make it all illegal and this kind of thing, yeah, yeah, that maybe people will choose to go, go clean and this kind of thing. But also, uh, there is definitely the valid school of thought that by normalizing this, you are encouraging it. You're making it seem to the next generation that... Um, well, if they sell needles in vending machines, then taking drugs must be a valid life choice. Yes. Well, you know, that that I'm kind of in the middle of both those schools of thought. Um, you know, I don't think that we should provide them the paraphernalia. However, I don't think that we should heavily criminalize it either. I think if you, they get caught with it, take it from them, make them go get it somewhere else again. Right? Like, but... I think the best way to deal with that being a drug, uh, an ex drug user myself and, you know, have seen so much of this stuff, like you have to handle the underlying problems that makes somebody want to keep using. A lot of times they're not using because they want to anymore. They're doing it because, you know, the body literally thinks it's dying. They go into fight or flight mode when they start to detox. The body thinks it's dying and the brain goes into panic mode and they do shit that they're as soon as they get a fix, they then feel depressed and hate themselves because of what they did to get the fix. And it creates a vicious cycle that they can't get out of. Well, if you can break those vicious cycles, if you can get them to forgive themselves and like go about trying to fix the things that they did and all this kind of stuff, then you can bring them back. But it's a very small percentage that it's actually going to be effective with. Yeah. You know, well, I would agree. To that. Really stop them is, or to slow it down anyway, is to handle our social issues that create in the first place. Yeah, well, look, I, I mean, I agree. I mean, of course, what you're saying there sounds very much like, uh, you know, what George Bernard Shaw was agitating there for like you know so we need some underlying social change but look yeah you, you can't just sort of say here you're a crack addict uh we're now going to force you to go into a drug rehabilitation uh, program uh because you can't you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink you can't force the unwilling uh, but exactly. at the same time the middle ground would be if you're going to just have vending machines uh selling clean drug needles to these people the message is we have washed our hands of you. We have already predetermined that there's no point in ever trying to get you off them. So we're just sort of saying, here's the stuff you're going to need. Don't come bothering us anymore. If you're going to provide yeah. clean stuff to them, you want to keep an eye on them and, and at least sort of have some, if you want to have a mobile thing to get to them, go up in a truck, have some security with you, give out the, the things that these people need, but but document who they are and sort of say, look, we care about you. I'm somebody who cares about you. It's not just a face of the vending machine. And if you think that you might want help, if you think you might want to come with us and go somewhere and come out of the city, change your mm -hmm. environment and see how you might feel uh, like in a, program where we can try and get you off drugs maybe you don't want to do it today have a think about it tonight here's a clean needle and if you still feel like this uh you know this is the life you want well you know you can as, as i've seen on on a short video there's this fellow who's, who's in construction and he says uh, to this girl on the street he says see this fellow who's working for me well he used to be just like you on the streets so that gives her he says look you know maybe if you get clean you can come work for me someday in my construction business i need uh, somebody who's good in the office and whatever you know uh so he might sort of in doing that show the person that there is something to imagine for a future for themselves. Whereas, cause a lot of people obviously are going to be taking drugs because of this is a, what difference does it make? I, I know I'm killing myself, but I don't want to live in this place either. Yeah. And I mean, that is kind of the problem. Our, our overall society forces people into it in a lot of cases, you know, the way they grew up, bad family life, their parents are on drugs and, I mean, there's all kinds of different social reasons that cause it, but I would argue that they have, a lot of them have a common root in the fact that we have these bastards in the background, in the shadows, doing a lot of manipulative stuff, causing a lot of it. Like, for instance, somebody's sad and depressed. Well, if you lived in this society and you weren't sad and depressed, I would be worried about you. Right. And then they give them these SSRI pills that just mess their heads up more and it creates more problems. A lot of the issues we have, we've created. Right. We yes, well, absolutely created them. Yes. As you say, these people we know in the background, they cause the same problems that they are willing to then agitate for the solutions that they're ready to step in to provide. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just as you say, like, you know, 
as far as the current six society well i think it was jiddu krishnamurthy then is famous for this but a lot of people have said the same similar thing for saying it's no measure of mental health to be well adjusted to a sick or profoundly sick society so I mean, and mm-hmm. since like that film, uh, what was it, Dinner with Andre? That was back in the was it late seventies or early eighties, uh, where mm-hmm. even then they were sort of saying like New York is 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 insane. It's sick. The people who live here, they've built their own prison, and there's a lot of people who are sort of saying like, I want to get out of here, you know, um, mm-hmm. and that you know he talks, he puts it so beautifully that in that film that basically. Uh, the modern uh, dystopia is the prison which people build themselves to, to imprison themselves within, like New York being a typical case of it. Yes. I mean, you're basically blocking yourself into your own little, uh, little, little madhouse cell, and that's what they want. You know, they're giving the, the paraphernalia and the drugs, they're importing the drugs, they're giving you drug uh, paraphernalia vending machines and all this stuff. Why? Because it's SOMA. It's Soma from, you know, Brave New World or any of these other dystopian uh, like horror shows that we've been introduced to over the decades. You know, it's meant to zonk you out so that no matter how bad it gets, you're still like, yay. Right. And it, it, it's a nightmare world. Uh, being somebody who was like, uh, you know, I was heavily addicted and, you know, straight up just 100 percent full on like i was trying to destroy myself you know and it, it's not a place that anyone wants to be like you're you're not going to be happy at all to any measure eventually i mean it's fun at first but then that eventually wears off and then where are you at so you know i don't think that their soma plan is really going to work long term because every junkie i've ever met met is miserable right yeah. It all leads to the same place, nihilism and, you know, suicidal tendencies. Yeah, um, you know, uh, well, Soma, of course, in Brave New World, it's the drug that keeps everybody happy. And then I think, you know, Soylent Green is very similar in that sort of regard, even though, like, it turns out to be humans. But in that, I think maybe, you know, we can compare the two because people are basically consuming themselves. And I'll just say this, I know, like maybe you want to talk about it more or, or, you know, uh, if not, that's fine. But I just, even though it's not exactly the same thing, sometimes people, people say that addiction to nicotine or cigarettes is stronger than heroin. I don't know, but uh, I'm not saying this from a point of view of somebody who is, you know, these, these irritating people who give up cigarettes and then nonstop talk about how stunning and brave they are to do it um, or, or criticize other people for still smoking. I'm not saying that. uh, But what I am saying is that, I heard while I smoked, I heard the theory put across that smokers are on some level psychologically trying to kill themselves because otherwise, I mean, people would sort of say like, well, the warning is is so big on the pack now, it basically is the entire pack that it gives you cancer and everything else. Why would people continue to smoke knowing this? They can't be that stupid. And so the answer, I kind of mulled on this quite a lot, as you do have time to think when when you're, you know, having a a smoke and, and, you know, it always seems to intensify your thoughts. Uh, I, I did think there was a lot of, of truth to this theory that you sort of might be saying to yourself, and you never really fully articulate the thought into the front of your mind, but I did think, yes, maybe it is that people are sort of saying, well, I don't like this world anyway. I don't like my job. I'm out here for a smoke break again in the rain, right? I don't want to go back in, and yet I hate being out here. Everything is gray, dull, and lifeless. Well, it might be a nice way out if I got cancer. Hopefully it would just kill me quick. So I can definitely see that uh, people who take heroin, if, if it does indeed make you feel nice and warm and happy and sleepy, uh, if it um, anesthetizes you from all of your worries, then you might sort of say, well, if it puts me to sleep permanently, good. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's kind of the thing. Like you get to a point where it's like, you know, like I said, when you when you don't have it, you're going to go into withdrawal, which your body goes into fight or flight and thinks you're dying. So you don't want that. That's the, the scariest thing ever is to have to go through that. That's the thing that all junkies fear. Right. They all absolutely fear the withdrawal. It It's the worst thing you'll ever go through. And as far as cigarettes go, the thing about cigarettes and alcohol is that they're so, is that they've been socially acceptable for so long. That's one of the things that goes into people being addicted to those. But at the same time, 
you know, all drugs are an enhancement of your, of you, right? Steroids enhance your muscles. Uh, neurotropics enhance your brain activity. Caffeine and nicotine enhance brain activity and the, um, the speed and rate at which you process information. Um, these are all enhancers and that's what they were used for when they were first brought on the scene. Uh, Native Americans used tobacco and marijuana for enhancement of their experience. And Europeans used coffee and alcohol for the same kind of thing. It wasn't until the modern era where we started viewing these things as such a recreational thing that you just do, right? And it, at the so same time as making uh, things recreational and encouraging that kind of outlook on substances, we at the same time make certain substances illegal. So you can see this play here between the right and the left on the, these issues, which causes the problems that we have. We have this dual minded nature about ourselves where, you know, we are in, our government is simultaneously importing the drugs and punishing those who are using, selling and et cetera. You, oh, know, you know, all these things are pulling at people in both directions. So there's insidious nature to it all. Yeah, insidious indeed. Isn't that such a, you know, a dastardly scam or scheme mm -hmm. to be importing the very drugs that they're then, uh, you know, throwing their hands up in the air and saying, oh, this is terrible what's happening to our citizens. We must have a war on drugs or we must give them clean needles, even, you know, while yeah. they're laughing into uh, into their hands. Well, um, I mean, if you look at Biden, for instance, his son is obviously a, you know, cocaine addict. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, guess, like back in the 90s, he wrote the crime bill, which then uh, made a possession of a crack rock uh, 10 times more, uh, you know, more legally damning than having the powdered cocaine. Right. Mm -hmm. His own son is on it. But yet he's writing laws that condemn other people's children just like his to prison. Yeah, well, I don't have it to hand, but there, there is or was a, a video that I think got uh, uh, heavily suppressed anyway on several platforms, uh, which juxtaposed perfectly. Joe Biden himself, uh, as he was a senator, I suppose, uh, talking about, you know, uh, as Hillary Clinton herself did probably around the same time, law and order and the need to get these miscreants underfoot or brought to heel. And, he, you know, he was really biting his words and enunciating them very uh, sharply uh, that, uh, you know, he would have uh, basically uh, leave no discretion to any judges that he would ensure or guarantee that these people would be put away for a minimum of 10 years if they had even a grain or a gram or a, uh, well, probably less than a gram, a microgram of whatever in their pocket. Uh, and at the same time, then, like uh, in the same video, the other half of the video was showing his own son. Uh, lighting up his crack pipe and uh, with his bloodshot eyes. Uh, the, the contrast or juxt juxtaposition between the two was so stunning. No words needed to be said other than those of Joe himself. So it was really a case of, well, if not himself, but hoisting his son by the petard he was creating. Yes. And, that, you know, again, this shows that dual mindedness where they, they play carrot and stick so well. You know, all the while having a sinister agenda behind it. Mm. Yeah. There you, you can get into that, you know, the private prison rabbit hole and all that kind of stuff and how they basically use uh, people locked up in these private prisons for uh, not only to fleece the taxpayer, but also as uh, they lease them out as basically slave labor to these big corporations. So it's it's a huge you know racket, which is why I don't support the law and order BS regardless, because I know it's just going to be used against all of us, not the people that you think it's going to be. Every the, they'll go to the right and holler law and order like they're going to stop the left, and it'll end up biting us all in the ass. I agree. Yes, it will. Um... And of course, I, I actually I think that is just fate intervening. I don't think that Joe Biden could see what was going to happen to his son. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, look, we're coming up to the two hours mark here now, and uh, I think it's actually been a great conversation. I know we've we've covered a lot of ground, although we've been around the houses, haven't necessarily 
talked about it in the linear way that we might have wanted to. But I think we've got a lot of great things there that I don't think you would necessarily hear about uh, on any other regular telling of, of Jack the Ripper. In fact, we haven't really talked about him that much. Uh, but let's pause now for a moment, JC, like we said we would. Two hours in now and just say hello to the few people in the chat here. Uh, there's Dr. Crispy Rothschild. There's Watching Trains Go By, Vin Gull, uh, Michelle, and uh, Slow Boy Whiteboard was there as well. Uh, I'll, I'll scroll back a little bit and, and just call out some of the comments. And uh, Let's see. Um, I'll start at the very beginning here. There's a fellow here called XYZ. He's saying, I, I think he's saying, you're an, rather than you're N-A, you're an anglicized Celt. Very possibly. And, uh, you know, but not not in the same meaning as an Anglo-Irish like George Bernard Shaw would be because he was a Protestant, whereas I was born into the Catholic uh, religion, yeah. nominatively at least, anyway. Uh, there's well, I mean, Joey. German, uh, a German language, technically. So, I mean, I'm part Celtic and, you know, you're obviously more Celt than me. But we both speak an Anglo-Saxon language, so I mean, yeah, we would be somewhat Anglicized Celts to one degree or another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't uh, claim that I have any particular purebred heritage, although I'm pretty sure that X Y Z there has, at some point in the past, claimed to have 100% pure Mongolian DNA. Right? <laughs> and I don't know if he's joking or not, or actually has the 23 in me to prove it. But. Uh, Anyway, uh, Joey there is uh, perhaps still listening. I don't know, but he was there earlier. He says, hi. Hi, Joey. Wind War Attack, what's up? Uh, there's Stephen Crumley as well. Cheers, Joey. Wind War. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Slow Boy Whiteboard there. She says, uh, hey, guys, I'm at work. I'll be listening with the headphones. Um, Always Stephen glad to have her around. And Crispy and everyone else for sure. Yes. And uh, Stephen there says Ted Kaczynski was MK Altered. Yeah, well, let's leave him for him. We'll have to do a stream on him another day, but uh, I, I suppose so. Yes. Um, let's see now. Uh, Slowboy says, I just looked up the entomology of the word sneakers and it came from Boston, Massachusetts. Okay. Well, listen, I can ter totally accept that. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, you know, the word sneakers would have come from it allows you to sneak up. Uh, and she says, I thought the British called them trainers. Yeah, I think they did or do. Um, but nonetheless, I don't think it, it, it just takes away from the point. Just while I think of it, can I tell you this, right? Well, uh, the, comes out of the, the rubber, the rubber sold shoes come out of that, uh, come out of the ripper thing. And the nickname sneakers was like, didn't come from the ripper thing. That just, it, they came yeah, from the, from the sneaking up on people. So yeah, you, from brother, I can see how whether she it's the ripper or, or whether it's trainer. Yeah, no, and that's what I'm saying. Whether it's the ripper or come from there, or whether it's in America in Boston that it allows you to sneak up, I'd be very surprised if the word sneakers doesn't come from the ability to sneak up on somebody, even if they weren't wearing Nikes in 1888. Yeah. But just while I think of it anyway, right? There's what I've noticed is is that um, in a lot of different countries they have their own word for trainers or sneakers. Like in South Africa, they call them uh, techies, which means things that stick to the ground easier. And uh, oh. in France, they call them, well, and maybe they've changed their language now or their vernacular, right? But when I was a kid, anyway, they called uh, them uh, les basket, right? In other words, basketball shoes, right? That's the context they saw them in, right? Yes. And uh, like, I forget where it was that I uh, picked up the thing about the rubber sole shoes. I'll have to uh, send it to you when I find it so you can pin it under there so people can read it for themselves okay. or listen. Yeah, to we'll, we'll, we'll do it another time. Or, or we'll stick it in a community post or whatever, yeah. Um, but I anyway. it over beforehand, but I didn't really think I was going to touch on that. But no, I no, of up... course not. We can think of everything. But uh, anyway, again, let's not get bogged down. I don't think it's just a buy the buy. It's just saying hello to a few people, you know what I mean? Um, and as I say, like, I'm, I'm willing to bet, uh, what I'm willing to bet, at least two and sixpence that whether they called them sneakers, right, <laughs> for Reeboks or Nikes or Adidas or whatever, Adidas, um, that uh, it still means, like, the, the name comes from being able to sneak up on somebody. 
whether you had rubber on your boots or not or whatever, you know. I got it from a, a book on Jack the Ripper, I'm pretty sure. Right, but... well, listen, we'll, we'll wait for that then. And uh, Slow by Whiteboard might have to uh, eat humble pie then and apologize to you most profusely. No, I don't think that you will. I think that she's uh, probably absolutely correct about where the like where the name sneakers came by like, eventually came from. Um, when I was uh, in reference, like I was saying, in reference to the Ripper, it was more about like the rubber sole shoes becoming a well-known trend because like someone suggested at the time that he was wearing rubber sole shoes, like in order to sneak up on people. Yeah, well, and look, I read I'll say, that in a book somewhere, and I can't remember the guy's name who wrote the thing. But yeah, when I well, do, no, I will send it to you. Yeah, well, look, as I say, like it doesn't matter who came up with what word when. Like obviously, when you have rubber soles on your on your feet, and rubber would have been perhaps a new material then that they were experimenting with and using in different things. That yes, it would have made less noise whether they actually said the word sneakers or not in London in '88 or not. Right, so I'm not. I'm only joking when I'm talking about slow boy apologizing to you. Um, and and I'll say by contrast, uh, the police in, in London, like it is said that they uh, had a flat foot and um, that they were called plod, right, as a nickname. So, of course, that would refer to their flat feet being uh, on the beat like the, all, all the time. So those three words does imply that they made noise or they were standing so much, you know, or you could hear them plodding along, you know. Well, I mean, it's well known that they that the that was a police tactic at the time was to wear those shoes so that you always heard the uh, the bobbies as they called them, you know, plodding along down the street. And what it ended up doing was just acting at you know people eventually started using it as an alarm system that would tell them that they were coming. So you know they got busted yeah. on that one and started using uh, softer soled shoes so that they wouldn't do that anymore. Yeah, and listen, you wouldn't want to be sliding around on the cobblestones, especially when it's wet, and they are uneven, and you can break an ankle real easy, or twist an ankle anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, she says that's all socialist philosophy, like we were talking about. Get rid of the suffering of the poor by gathering of the poor. And I tell you what, if we're not extremely careful, uh, what, what happened in Terminator 2 Judgment Day will happen in us now. It's completely inevitable, right? The solution... Mm -hmm. Uh, to human suffering is to end all humans. That's what the AI will very quickly arrive at as the perfect algorithmic solution to the human problem. Especially since it's being uh, uh, like it's quite literally being programmed with this Fabian socialist philosophy from the get, right? Like we all know from the beginning, that's the philosophy that they're giving it. So if humans came to the natural conclusion of you know, how to end the human suffering is to end all humans, then obviously it's going to come to that conclusion. Yeah. Um, I read an article that was misleading. Uh, but, so it was definitely trying to gin up uh, um, fear. However, it said that because the headline of the title was uh, AI kills the operator in uh, its simulation. Well, how could it kill the operator? Um He's not actually in the simulation and he's not wearing a suit that he can be killed. So it, it was basically a blatant lie from the headline. But um, mm -hmm. what it, I think what it was, the reality was the AI had been awarded points um, if it would kill the enemy in, in the virtual world that it was in. Um, and then I think it didn't incur so that's how it was incentivized to win basically to, to think of strategies the, the underlying code was gain as many points as you like or to win gain as many points as you can and then don't lose any points either just basically accrue the most amount of points and it figured out that it couldn't win the game so that it destroyed itself right in the game because it didn't lose any points by destroying itself so it prevented the enemy from getting points by killing it so it it committed suicide ended itself so whatever is pragmatic, it does. And if the operators have forgotten to uh, tell it that it loses all points, it goes into, into negative infinity if it kills any humans, right? Forgets to program it with at least Asimov's laws of protecting humans. Uh, then mm. those are obviously the solutions that uh, AI will, will come to, if indeed it is then connected to uh, you know, nuclear bombs and whatever else. And I, by the way, I've seen absolutely nothing in any industry where they've ever designed a failsafe into anything. Mm. 
Yes. And, uh, you know, by the way, that author I was talking about, his name is uh, Donald Rumbelo. That's uh, Donald Rumble and then Low, you know, L O W. Uh, he's the one who wrote the book I was talking about, like uh, about Jack the Ripper and the rubber soled shoes and everything. Okay. Now that I've thought of it, just to go ahead and throw that in there. Um, but yes, right. I, I would agree. Um, so anyway, yeah, the Queen wrote a strongly worded letter, says uh, Slow Boy there earlier when we were talking about the Queen getting upset with uh, go- the goings on of Whitehall and the um, agitation of the, the, the proletariat and uh, the, the frenzy that the, the gutter press uh, was um, whipping up. Uh, she says, uh, I thought the, the Ripper was educated as a physician. Surely writing would be a prerequisite. Well, I'll say this. Uh, yeah, of, of course, that was one of the theories that, uh, you know, it was put about that because uh, he was uh, ex- he was uh, surgically removing some, he claimed in a letter that he took out somebody's kidney and he was going to fry the rest of it at home and this kind of thing, very similar to the whole uh, um, Hannibal Lecter type thing, you know, with a glass of Chianti sort of stuff. Maybe that's where they yeah. got the inspiration for that. But so because he was, um, you know, the word visceral, has to do as far as I understand it, with cutting out, and I'm sorry for you know making it more graphic to say, cutting out somebody's entrails or disemboweling the, their guts. Um, so because he was doing this with some kind of a surgical flourish, uh, and also cutting people from well their I'll say their genitals all the way up to their neck, uh, and you know leaving them, I just I suppose might as well say it because this is Jack the Ripper, right? That this thing was so grotesque, so uh horrifying when these bodies were found that obviously you know whoever did find the bodies or ever then subsequently you know had to examine them whatever like this would have been the kind of thing and any one of us if we would have been there to see it like i mean i'm sure i would probably have fainted or or vomited or or ran out of there uh, feeling uh, like the blood had drained down into my feet you know um so but because he was doing this sort of stuff they felt like well if somebody's capable of doing these kind of uh, slicing uh, of people that it would have to be somebody who's used to it which is why another theory was that he worked in the local mortuary and therefore might have been desensitized to this kind of um, extreme uh, barbary yes he would have to be used to it as well as being very very skilled with a knife and having a steady hand right a steady quick hand he could work very very fast which is one of the reasons I would uh, lean more towards a he, if he's a butcher, he's a really popular one that has to work very, very fast. He doesn't have time, right? And which would lean more into like a surgeon because a surgeon during a time of no anesthesia would have to work really, really fast. So, you know, I've always leaned into like it's possible he could be a surgeon, a surgeon's assistant or any of those kind of things. Um, absolutely. But he could be a butcher who's just really good at his job. It is it's really hard to say. And I, you know, honestly, you'd probably have to look through all the associates of George Bernard Shaw and all their associates and, you know, and some more, and then you still probably wouldn't figure out who it was. Right. It, it's so buried uh, in history and all the like other garbage that's come out. Like it's hard to, you know, it's hard to make yeah. heads or tails of anything, but yes, to her point, I would say that, for the amount of skill level that the person writing that letter had or and the person that like did the murders had like both would have had, had pre writing as a prerequisite, I would say, because the, the way you learn anything at that time was, you know, the printing press had become a thing quite, uh, quite a little time before that. So books were extremely important as far as teaching. You still had apprenticeship and stuff as well, but you know, books had uh, become more and more important in the teaching process. So, you know, I think that he was educated. That would be my opinion. An educated man with a bit of a mental bent, right? An, or an ideological bent, which is not much different, right? Yeah, well, um, can I say as well that one of his letters, It's I, I did wonder when I was reading it, and that's mm-hmm. the one that I have put, uh, I don't know if it's going to be legible if you put it in full screen, maybe. I put it into the... Uh, thumbnail there and what you can see on screen right now most of the words are spelt 
either incorrectly or idiosyncratically uh, by our standards. I don't know whether some of them might have been considered to be spelt correctly. I think it was all spelt. Here's my guess. I think it was spelt intentionally uh, wrong, a yeah. lot of the words, to try and perhaps mask the fact that he was more educated than he was. So I think he was trying to perhaps maybe put them off the scent. But then that doesn't tie in with the, the Dear Boss letters, because the Dear Boss letters, as you say, might have had some Americanisms in it. Whereas this uh, just seems to be oddly spelt. So I don't know. Maybe, of course, the theory is more than one person or that there might have been yeah. copycats or people pretending to uh, be him sending in letters. Well, my guess is, is the same. I guess the same as the, the guy, the constable that was working on it. Uh, you know, he was working on the case at the time. And um, he himself said that he believed that the newspaper, uh, it was a newspaper man that had uh, that had written the letters. So, you know, in my opinion and, you know, in many others opinion, it is completely possible that the letters themselves were not written at all by the same person committing the murders. And that's what the guy who was investigating the stuff at the time, I mean, that was the the conclusion he came to that whoever wrote those letters was not the same guy who uh, did the murders that, uh, and you know, he pointed the finger at the press themselves. Uh, yeah, you know. yeah. Um, look, there was something else that I wanted to say there, uh, a parallel thought. And this was in regards to, you know, as you said, if you were a skilled surgeon, then you'd want to make your incisions quickly and then do whatever you had to do if you're trying to save somebody's life or uh, cut something out or whatever and stitch them back up real quick. And maybe, uh, you know, they might have had ether or chloroform. I mean, I think they, they, they did know about the, these uh, chemicals uh, in the 19th century, in the 1800s, but um, it wouldn't have been an exact science. Certainly they wouldn't have had... Um, the kind of uh, anesthetic drugs or, or they maybe perhaps wouldn't have been able to put people under and take them out as, as I, I hear. It's the most uh, exacting science and people are paid so highly for it. They're more skilled than the surgeons themselves these days. But what I wanted to mention was, and it's just by the by, but I think it might be just in context, it might paint a, a background larger picture. Uh, that there was a fellow called Joseph Lister. I'm not sure if he was Scottish, but he worked uh, in Edinburgh anyway, and he was known as a pioneer of the... Uh, I suppose, Amputation. Uh, Amputation was one of the things he's known for. He invented right, but, Lister. Yes, but, but specifically a pioneer of uh, the clean room hospital, the antiseptic, and mm -hmm. modern surgery, not, not just cutting people's limbs off, but seeing as you mentioned it, right, of sterilization and following Louis Pasteur's, and I know this hot topic, right, but we just called it a germ theory, right? But anyway, he was at the time, uh, you know, contemporaneous to all of this. He, he was lived from 1827 to 1912. Uh, so he lived through all of this. And I just then want to say that as far as uh, amputation goes, uh, there was the a poet, which I've done a video on, uh, and, and a poem, which I greatly admire, Invictus. I think I did a video on that um, mm -hmm. and it's just about bravery and he did have to have one of his legs chopped off and perhaps the second one uh, he was going to have to have chopped off because it was this uh, kind of bone marrow disease that he had I think it was called POTS disease uh, it sounds a bit like cancer of the bone marrow and uh, so you know he could have felt sorry for himself but he sort of said into this black night I go um, and uh, I I refuse to cry out in pain. It's basically stoicism. And, uh, you know, um, yeah. he traveled from South Africa up to Edinburgh uh, by ship in, in great pain, probably before they did have, as you say, sort of, uh, you know, anesthetic to take the pain away. But he just sort of probably bit down on a lump of wood and uh, just swallowed the pain, I suppose, you know. But I, I suppose that just to say that it is just coincidental that his poem Invictus was also published, although it was written in 1875, it wasn't published until 1888. Yes. And, you know, and also I would like to, you know, draw a little bit of parallel between the Ripper and something like the Black Dahlia, for instance. You know, they kind of pointed at a doc that, you know, a doctor is the lead suspect in that one as well. 
and it, you know, it, there, I, I've always seen a lot of parallels between the two cases, you know, obviously not in body count wise, but you know, as far as the black Dahlia is concerned, you know, the way they talk about the guy, he could have had lots of victims. So maybe he was even more prolific than Jack himself. Well, uh, seeing as you bring it up, uh, can you give a quick synopsis? And, uh, Cause I don't think I know what the black Dahlia is. Okay. Um, the Black Dahlia is a case from um, L.A. in the 19... Uh, what was the year uh, the Black Dahlia was? I think it was like the 1940s. Yeah, I, I, think. Think, you, I think you're right because uh, Elizabeth Short is her name, I think, known as the Black Dahlia, uh, posthumously, yeah, yeah. it says. So after she was killed, and so she lived till 1947. So I think you're right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, you know, they say that uh, this doctor guy uh, was the one behind it. Um, what was his name? Uh, his son is the one who is uh, who's the the biggest proponent for his father being the one who did it. Uh, his name was Doctor George Hill Hodel, Doctor George Hill Hodel Jr. And um, you know they suspect he was the one. He was the uh, basically the uh, the abrasionist to the stars, right? All the rich and famous people would uh, bring their ladies, uh, their their side pieces, if you will, to him if they accidentally got pregnant, and he would make these things go away, I right? See. And it's suspected that you know somebody very powerful might have gotten her uh, knocked up, and that you know either maybe there was a problem during the process. And things went a little awry, and he just, you know, they had to make her go away, and they might, wanted to make it look like some kind of crazy serial killer did it, you know? Well, Something let me like that. Just let me have you out then and say this because I, I just opened up the Wikipedia page about uh, this poor woman, uh, and it sounds your, your theory sounds uh, like just the kind of thing. And look, uh, I won't read all the names, but you're perfectly correct there in your recollection this fellow called uh, um, George Hodel uh, and you say that he, his son did suggest him because of his uh, surgical training but in your theory there we're saying that maybe somebody powerful uh, might have knocked her up and therefore wanted the problem to go away and then something went wrong well here's just some of the names now maybe some are more well known back then but two of the names that uh, leap out at me is uh, or three Woody Guthrie Bugsy Siegel and Orson Welles, they were all suspected as having had some involvement or, or like as in possible suspects or at least maybe, you know, you know, the way they might say these days, like would want to help police with their inquiries. Yeah, well, I, I would say that maybe they were uh, customers of his at some point in time. Maybe they brought some of their own, uh, you know, mistakes, if you will, and dropped them on Mr. Hodel's doorstep. Well, no, I mean, it's saying specifically, uh, you know, uh, so I'll just read this out here. It says, suspects remaining under discussion by various authors include all these people. Like, there's a long list of them. But it, so, mm -hmm. like, Orson Welles and others there, like, he was a suspect in oh, the yeah. murder of, of uh, this uh, poor woman, Elizabeth Short. Oh, yeah. I had forgotten about, like, the long list of famous people that were supposed to be involved. Yeah. But, so kind of, I mean, like, we now know that there's so many like that. Um, wasn't there a case now uh, of Robert Wagner? Wasn't that the guy? Or sorry, no, I'm, I better take that back. Uh, it wasn't him, was it? It was the guy who played heart to heart. Uh, and um, do, do you know Robert Wagner? Was the the he was the one that was suspected of uh, you know uh, killing his wife and then uh, making it look like she drowned or whatever. <laughs> And then it is. That's the guy I'm talking about. Yeah. And what what was the 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 girl's name? Um. Oh, well, if I you had I, I I Natalie you. Woods. Natalie Woods, wasn't yeah, it? it? I can't so, want to say Natalie Portman, but that that's the chick that's still alive right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. But I mean, like, of course, it's easy to confuse. You know, uh, same first name anyway. And I would have done that if you hadn't. But he and um, who was the other Hollywood guy that went out there onto the ship? Great oh, actor. that. Oh, that would have uh, been uh, that Mr. Creepy dude uh, from Sleepy Hollow. Uh, what's his face? Um, Christopher Walken. Sorry for putting you on the spot there. Christopher yeah, Walken. It's all good. Yeah, it's all good. 
I, I, mean, I don't watch Hollywood that, movies anymore, so I forget them sometimes. No, and I mean, I, no, I mean, I, I, I did, and I, I mean, I used to uh, work in a, a video rental place, you know, um, and I used to quite like movies. In fact, they were pretty good back in the nineties and even early two thousands, you know. Um, yeah. But I just don't watch much anymore. I used to be quite an aficionado, but even having been quite an aficionado and because I worked in a movie store like that, like there were some people there who really were into their movies and Hollywood gossip and all that kind of thing. And I never heard this about Robert Wagner. And yet everybody knew that his wife, Natalie Wood, had died in suspicious circumstances with Christopher Walken on this ship. Like two, three went out and two returned, you know. And I mean, it was suspected that like she had a crush on Walken and, you know, they were doing that movie together, which is a, you know, is a movie that is a dystopian movie, by the way. It's it's on my dystopian movie list, like my, you know, my greatest dystopian movies like of all time, like that I've ever watched. Like that one would definitely make it. Uh, uh, what is the name of it now? Like now I'm curious. I'm going to have to look. Um but that yeah, Christopher either Walken one, and Robert Wagner were in, is it? Uh, no, him and uh, Natalie Wood were in, uh, were in it together, and, uh, and like they Walken. suspect that it's like there was maybe a relationship that was starting to develop um, while they were, uh, you know, doing this movie together. Because there's a there's a center up here in California. It's one of these take drop acid and woo woo type centers that they sent Christopher Walken and Natalie to during the like or prior to the sh shooting of this movie to get closer to one another so that their relationship on screen would be more believable. But during this, like you know, they you know people suspect that maybe things got uh, you know. A little too mm -hmm. hot and heavy or that you know it the movie's called brainstorm by the way yeah you know, so i just looked it up there so you you've just looked it up there as well 1983 douglas trumbull uh you yes. got it in front of you there as well have you yes i do and uh, like the fact that uh, the matter is that that very well could be the case but whether it's true or not it, i would say that robert wagner believed it was true and uh, yeah, well, you know no doubt. And, and I suppose just mentioning it because like it's amongst many where there are love triangles in Hollywood and uh, not just love triangles, but like we now are aware that there's plenty. Once you get into Hollywood at all, there's plenty of houses you go to where some more famous movie stars having a party and loads of stars and starlets are there. People wanting to make it, people who have made it. And you go into one room and there's, you know, 20 or 30 people in there all having a good time, you know, taking drugs and you know, uh, having sex with each other and people are kind of go, hey, welcome to Hollywood. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think like it's one of those things that, yeah, it's pretty, it's probably pretty prevalent out there. You know, they say that like, you never know like who a Hollywood star's kid really is because they are all cheating on one another. It's all a business decision for them, right? It's not really, I mean, for some of them, it might be love. You know, I think, I do think like a couple like Will Smith. I think Will Smith really did love Jada Pinkett. I think he probably still does. Whether she loved him or not is a different thing. But, you know, you can tell he's got some feelings there. Whereas she doesn't seem to have so many. It's kind of like that situation be. I told you about. How people kind of get uh, given to people to, you know, keep an eye on them and uh, keep them going oh, yeah. a certain yeah. direction. Many wives or husbands are the handlers. Like perhaps Jordan Peterson's wife is a handler, but let, let's genuinely not get onto that. Uh, just to, I wanted to round out the brainstorm thing since I brought it up because uh, a lot of times I'm very interested to read what the brave AI summarizer uh, gives you or spits out from, uh, you know, Wikipedia or other sources. Do you have it in front of you? Uh, Do you yeah, have it? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I was just going to say that brainstorm, I find it rather important because the technology that is described in the movie has just recently hit the IRL, if you will. Like, you know, it's talking about a, a helmet that you put on that records the brain's experiences and then can play them back to you into your brain like real life. And that's exactly what they're working on now. Right? Like, they've got... The, the prototypes of this thing is are already out there. 
So are you saying the theme of the film is uh, a bit like... Um, Oh, I've seen uh, another great movie. It was around the turn of the century when it came out. I think Ralph Fiennes was in it where he was playing back people's memories off, uh, at the time, what looked like uh, space age technology uh, or 21st century technology, a mini disc. He was playing back experiences into yeah. his brain directly um, by mini disc. Um, I forget yes. the name of the movie. It, I'll think of it, it now. It was in the movie. Basically, what it allows you to do is, if I put the helmet on, like all the things I've talked to you about, I've done in my life, I would be able to transfer that to tape, and then you put the helmet on, and it would beam it into your brain, and it you're inside your head, you would feel like you did that. You would have my experiences. So basically, that you could take if you had a blank slate, you could basically just imprint another person's personality right onto it. Uh, you know, going by the movies, you know, logic or whatever. But now they actually do have a helmet that can read your mind and stuff like that. And you know, they're looking at trying to transfer your consciousness, quote unquote, to a computer disk. So like, they really are like these. Once again, you know. Does art uh, mimic reality, or does reality mimic art? Like, right? Which one is it? Oh yeah, yeah. There's always a case of life imitating art, imitating life. The movie I was thinking of, I had to look up there with Ralph Fiennes. Uh, it was called Strange Days, and it was. Uh, it came out in 1995. Uh, but, I remember. Uh, yeah, but it was depicting the turn of the century, 1999, which which we thought was oh, it's gonna be like Prince will party like it's 1999. And amazing that we flew past that date and were well into this dystopian future. But uh, that was written by James Cameron, uh, although it was dire directed by a woman called Catherine Bigelow. But anyway, yeah, it's it's very. I haven't seen the movie in a while, but I, I would I would say that I'd like to look at it again with the eyes of somebody a bit older and uh, more knowledgeable, uh, less naive maybe. And you know, where you, you you notice things more with older eyes and. Um, I'd sure. recommend it to if people want to go back and just kind of revisit a few things. You know, it definitely has uh, themes worth revisiting there because it's about the human condition, well, of course. Much movie anymore. It, like once you've been illumined, we'll say you now understand why rich people don't have TVs in their house, mm -hmm. right? They don't have cable and so they don't let their kids watch TV like that. Most of yeah. them don't anymore. Well, look, uh, I, I understand, of course, what you're saying. Uh, a book uh, can influence you as well. Anything you, you see here or, or um, well, any of your experiences can influence your, your follow-on experiences. But I'm just sort of saying, look, whatever you think of the medium itself, uh, the themes in it, uh, as we are now, are, are worth con considering and reconsidering now that we're kind of almost right. here, if you're saying the technology is, is about in invented, about just about invented, like I suppose what you're saying is the theme of, of the Brainstorm movie of Natalie Wood. Yeah. But having mentioned that, I mean, I just wanted to sort of mention that to give another example of the way Hollywood is, and of course, perhaps the most famous example, although we don't have to go down th th this road now, and in fact, that's definitely not, is the idea that JFK might have got Marilyn Monroe into trouble. And uh, wanting to get rid of her, then maybe as well, you know. Mm -hmm. That's a, that is very much uh, like a theory that is out there, and I mean, it's one that I subscribe to, and it's not just her that he got in trouble, but you know, another lady as well. And I mean, this kind of stuff happens all the time, all the time, and uh, you know, that's why it's not so it's not so much of a stretch for me to believe when it comes to something like the Elizabeth short or any of these kind of things that the elite would need to have people removed occasionally if they become difficult, we'll mm -hmm. say. And we know that the Hollywood studios here in LA and San Francisco and everywhere else, like that you have these uh, rich Hollywood CEOs living that people do come up missing and the studio does clean up the messes of the Hollywood elite and stuff there. You can talk to people all over California that are, you know, are alive today that work in the industry or have uh, encountered these people in different uh, cases. And they'll tell you straight up that like, you know, they've seen this or they've seen that, but shh, don't tell anybody because you know, they're, you know, they have real like heavy hitters that'll, that'll hurt people, you know, mm -hmm. for this kind of stuff. You know, I was paid well to keep my fucking mouth shut and I would appreciate as my friend if you just didn't say anything, right? So, it like, this happens all the time. 
Well, let me uh, say this. If you just want to keep things, if, if a person would just want to keep things at a normie level, if a normie would accept the fact, and I think they would have to, uh, you know, even if they might. Did we lose them? product it's not there to do good for people or to provide uh, something that is necess uh, that is necessary for society a company is purely there to make a profit for its shareholders that's it that's the raison d'etre of all corporations nothing more nothing less that's it there are other ones but they're all variations of to make a profit and so if you accept that then you can obviously see a scenario whereby one of their actors who is like anybody wants to have a lot of money. Um, they need a lot of mental discipline to say, I won't spend it on drink, drugs, wine, woman and song, or men or whatever, if it's star or a starlet, whatever they're into. Uh, so giving somebody a lot of money uh, and fame, it gives them uh, the ability, it enables them to indulge in their excesses to the max. And so they always have to have public relations agents and they have to um, control the media, have liaisons with them. They have to have agreements with media people, but there's certain things that they wouldn't be able to pay people enough money to sort of say, look, don't print that or so on and so on. So if they have invested sometimes what can be hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe now these days it's getting into the billions in a movie. If then one of their main stars happens to do something so heinous that it might not only tarnish, not tarnish, but destroy the reputation of that star, and effectively make that movie uh, now, which has gone into perhaps post-production, uh, going to be a completely unsellable pot prospect to the public. Uh, they have to make sure that that doesn't get out to the public. And if people can't be coerced, bought off, uh, indulged, uh, if there's no time to allow their own vices to make them distracted with other things, then they're simply going to have to get rid of that person. And that's what a business person does do because they're like the AI. They run down a list of if then else steps in their algorithm and eventually they'll come to get rid of the offending person. Yes, pretty much. And I mean, I think that, you know, you have this with George Reed, you know, the first Superman that, uh, or whatever. And a lot of other guys like, you know, he was banging uh, one of the most powerful men in Hollywood's wife. You, you can get yourself in trouble doing that. Right. And it, so it's no wonder he wound up. Whoops. <laughs> you know, whoops, the gun went off type thing. Um, even though there's bullet holes in the floor and how do you shoot bullet holes in the floor when you're trying to shoot bullet holes in your own head? I don't know, but whatever. Well, you know, it, that's what they say. You know, I, I remember you mentioning it before. And uh, again, look, let's try and remember these things to do maybe another stream on. Because, of course, once I learned that the original uh, black and white, as I thought of it, uh, Superman was George Reeve. And that then the color one that I knew when I was a kid, George Reeves, I thought, that's weird. So, look, there's mm -hmm. bound to be more to it than just a, a coincidence, a quicky dink there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, of course, it makes me wonder if, you know, George Reeves really did get put in a wheelchair because he fell off a horse when horse riding, or if it was just a genuinely terrible um, random event. Yeah. Or if something else happened to him because he just wouldn't play ball like they wanted him to. It's hard to say. But like you were saying, when... They have to control these. I mean, Hollywood used to have a, a code that they controlled stars by, but, you know, that went away. And I think what they put in its place is, you know, drugs and sex and whatever else and blackmail. And basically that's how they keep these stars under control. Uh, you know, they give them the drugs, they give them the, the compromising positions and that keeps them on the hook better than that uh, silly code they had for Hollywood ever could, right? Now they don't have to worry so much. Now they have the press and everyone else in their pocket, like as always, but they also have all of the stars under control to where if they even think about going out of pocket and not uh, behaving, they lose everything as well as their easy drug connections and stuff, right? Yeah, well, even if they've given people uh, many millions, I think they must still have uh, some hold over people, uh, maybe not just contractual. I think there's always the carrot and the stick thing going on. And I think even if they haven't outright said it to people, I think that uh, they know that there will be punishment. I think, you know, these people, 
yeah. at the very least must hear it from other people in Hollywood. Oh yeah, did you not hear what happened to that person? You know, you don't want to go messing yeah. with them. You can either take the millions or you can take the the gruesome punishments. But you don't have to say it. All they had to do is let one or two people that are well known go through it, like Mr. West recently did, and that warns all the rest of them. You better stay in line. Yeah. And I mean, they kind of have to when they're into this kind of nefarious shit because. If you think about it, like if you don't do that, then everything's going to fall apart. Like you can't give these people power, influence, and money, and then just turn them loose to do whatever they want. They might screw your plans up. Yeah, well, uh, I would say that um, being in Hollywood, in those circles, it must be. You know, I'm thinking of Leah Remini, but it must be exactly like being uh, in the Scientologists because there's no question that you could leave all your friends and family and where is there to go anyway give up your whole life mm -hmm. all your friends and if you're famous already there's nowhere to just live a normal life again or go off and be somewhere quiet so they'll find you um so it's kind of a curious thing then that some of them or all of them or who knows how many of them are members of the scientologists it's just another club to belong to a subset of the of the well, uh, like subset over free there freemasonry is that way you know you're you're sp if you're a freemason your spouse your your kid, like if they're old enough at that point, like is going to be in the Malay school or whatever, it, you know, your whole family is going to be in in this kind of stuff. And then when you find everything out, you've got to now convince your family that it's true. And even if like and that's if they don't already know before you do and have just been like leading you on the whole time. They might just decide to ditch you because they they are more loyal to the order than they are to you. So, like, this, this model is used across the board because it is so effective. If you, can, if you can hold the threat of taking somebody's everything, that's a really powerful control lever that you can pull. Oh, yeah, for right? sure. And, uh, you know, just your other point about Mr. West... And we're not talking about Adam West, who played Batman, but I'm just saying that, like, to get the algorithm churning a bit. Um, we haven't heard of Mr. West now in a long, long time. You know, he went on uh, AJ's show. And he did his uh, pun there with um, uh, Annette mm -hmm. and uh, a bottle of Yahoo. And uh, we haven't heard of him since, really. Uh, oh. Not not in any of the alternate, uh, so-called alternate news platform media people. Uh, nor in the mainstream. I haven't anyway. I don't think I'm the exception. I think it's just me. So uh, they can shut anybody up. They can let them to maybe off the leash a bit, but they'll catch up and put the leash back on. So whatever happened to him, and I hear as well, I'll just say this, right? I'll see if I, it's possible to say this, that the last I heard of him was that he has, he, he has cleaned himself up and he has intentions to return uh, in some capacity as some kind of financial uh, examine the finances of the world or, or financial advisor and that mm -hmm. he has somebody who works high up in the financial industry to help him and we know what those kind of people are so he's decided if i can't beat them i'm going to join them well you know he already shacked himself up to milo yiannopoulos which i think is what led him to do all the crazy stuff he did in the first place i you know this is just my personal opinion but I'm convinced that Milo Yiannopoulos is a deep state agent and just absolutely bad news. Kind of like that Eliza Blue chick. We won't go into it, but I'm sure everybody's heard of her. Like, I think that these people are absolutely deep state agents and folks should stay as far away from them as possible, particularly folks like Mr. West. But being in his position, it puts you in a spot where you don't really know who to trust and deciding who is very difficult right i mean he might really trust milo and i you know i've just seen things about milo that makes me not trust him. <laughs> right? yes well there you know you're saying that he's he's a deep state or perhaps works with the cia or maybe mi5 and and maybe and um you know, I learned something about uh, his job recently. I'm, I'm trying to look it up because I, I was very shocked that I learned that he works for somebody or something. It's, it was on his Wikipedia page. And I went, I didn't know that. Uh, and I thought, kind of thought, like, why doesn't everybody know this? So I'm, I'm really trying to look it up now, but I, I, it must be on his Wikipedia page. That he, well, I mean, he, he was the what, former editor for Breitbart. And yeah, a, yeah, a, yeah. But what I'm, no, what I'm saying is... 
Yeah, no, no. But what I'm saying is he works for somebody officially in politics. Oh. Like, and, and it's not it's not a hidden thing or anything like that. Uh, so, um, you know, I remember being shocked that how come people don't know this? Uh, one of the, I think it's one of the women Republican people, one of the outspoken ones. Do you know the one with the blonde hair uh, that people think, oh, yeah, she's really socking it to them in Congress, you know, but she's basically the Republican version of AOC. I think that's what I read yeah. anyway, you know. Yeah, like that very well could be possible. Like I'd have to look it up to uh, to see that one, but it wouldn't surprise me not one bit. That would be, you know, that would be like exactly what I would expect of Milo. Well, well, let me read it out to you here, okay? So it says under the, his career in Wikipedia, it says, in June 2022, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos became an unpaid intern oh. for Republican politician Marjorie Taylor oh, Green. Taylor Green. The QAnon, uh, the QAnon uh, lady. Yeah, she says a lot of things I like, but she does a lot of dumb shit I don't. Like she's uh, she's the typical QAnoner. Like she's she's all about Mr. Trump and doing everything he says, which is yeah problematic. Well, she, says, she says plenty <laughs> of good things, but I mean, it's all just sound and fury signifying nothing. It just keeps us yeah. in the oh yeah she really sucked it to AOC, but so I do find that line curious. It's a single line in June 2022. Yiannopoulos became an unpaid intern for Republican politician Marjorie Taylor Greene. Now, if somebody was um, working for the CIA, that's exactly the kind of cover job you would give somebody. Yes, I mean like he's he's right there in in the midst of the most controversial figures out there. You can't really get much more controversial than Marjorie Taylor Greene or Mr. West at this point, other than Donnie T himself, right? It's like Donnie T, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and then Yee is right there in it with them, like as like super controversial figures that you can't touch with a ten foot pole, right? Uh, For just, sure. That now, listen, I have to say it, and it has been you know a great conversation, but we're well off into the weeds again, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, I think our audience is uh, used to us going off in the weeds, and apparently they enjoy it because they keep coming back to be punished. <laughs> well, look, let me read out a couple more here, right? And then we'll catch up with the comments and move on, right? Gamble right. says, old JTR. That's that's a nice acronym uh, for this shadowy figure in the uh, top hat and um, perhaps gentleman's clothes, the gentleman killer, maybe. Old JTR was a G, too, and what he means by that is... Um, a member of the Freemasons and he has, you know, the, the, the slide rule or maybe the, the, um, the, the, what's this, the, the square and compass. And, um, I, I guess like you're sort of saying like, look, maybe, maybe he was directly a Freemason or maybe he was a member of one of these brotherhood, uh, type of, um, clubs at the time, or certainly if anybody's seen, I'll just say this, right. As far as the aesthetic, I think, there was two movies maybe more or maybe they might be even making another one now i don't know robert downey jr did it and i think the two movies were called homes or and maybe there's other movies like that but they were very well made and they were set in london uh around this time as well and um you know what he sort of what was portrayed in that movie as well as the aesthetic was that there was these kind of gentleman thugs and that there was a sort of a cross uh um, pollination between the people who were say ministers in Westminster in the British Parliament uh, and then uh, Alistair Crowley uh, I think literally featured in one of the movies and um, you know there's a sort of black occult dark arts and so that by day these British politicians uh, were uh, you know ha had the appearances of being um you know, dignified and genteel, as the phrase might be, like, you know, sort of, you know, in some kind of rarefied air and gentlemen and this kind of thing. But maybe by day, they might be these kind of ripper people. So just to sort of speak to that as well, I suppose that, yeah, they may well have been all Freemasonic and, mm -hmm. um, you know, like like a kind of a Batman character, but sort of uh, the the bad version of that, you know, not helping people. Yeah. And I mean, that's kind of the thing that, you know, I like, that's what I would tell people is that he may have been a Mason himself, 
far more likely is that he might have just been somebody that was working for them, some thug from that 100,000 people that was in that socialist uprising they had or something like that, some soldier or, a, you know, some disgraced doctor. It could have been anybody for that matter, but it doesn't really matter. The, the really important part is who I think were, were, were behind him mm -hmm. in general and what it led to. And the reason I think that is because, you know, just by itself, maybe I wouldn't. But when you take into account all the serial killers since and their connections to like Tavistock, MK Ultra, the government and all these dark projects and stuff. When you start to look at it under that light, you start to see the same people and the same ideologies constantly popping up. And to me, those are red flags that says that. Maybe from Jack the Ripper on, it's been the same formula being repeated over and over and over again. Yes, yes, yes. Look, uh, on on the other aspect, you know, of, uh, you know, the, what we talk about, the political aspect and the, the Punch and Judy show. And there was a magazine, of course, at the time called Punch. Uh, and the rights are left to see Sam. He's making a pun here, like as in the, the sort of maybe Freemasonic rights, but also that the, the people who claim to be on the right are really leftists or capitalism, socialism. It's just two boots that they march us to all the time to get everybody in lockstep. And uh, so he says, um, it seems too ceremonial to do something on 8th of the 8th. 1888 but uh mm -hmm. look as far as wikipedia says the first of the, what they call the canonical murders of the five women who they say was definitely murdered by the same person that they say is jack the ripper was on the 31st of august uh, 1888 however look there may have been other murders or something else that happened and i, I would think look it's such a significant date 8888 uh, that um I don't know, but I, I I'd be very surprised if nothing funny didn't happen on that date. Do you know of anything on the eighth of the eighth, eighty eight, JC? Uh, uh, oh, like, yeah, only if you did. Only if you did. Do you mean like specific days that uh, things that happened on the same day as the Ripper, or just no, eight, no, eight, no. Eight, Jack, eight, Jack the Ripper stuff? If anything happened then, because look, I, I just from reading Wikipedia, the first of the the five women that he killed was on the thirty first of August we'll come back next week if i find out that that there was indeed something that happened on the 8th of august but it is very significant number you know um because i just want to then acknowledge a couple other people there uh toledo uh duty says hey you she says because this is relevant and i put it into the uh, description uh because i came across it when i was looking for jack the ripper stuff she says, I just read the case of Fanny Adams, the eight-year-old that was murdered a decade before the Ripper murders. And oh boy, that was a tough read. Yes, indeed. And um, y there's a British phrase, maybe it's American now as well, that says, "I, you know, if you say uh, you got nothing, you say I got sweet Fanny Adams. I always knew the phrase, but I didn't know that that's where it came from. Uh, but really what sweet F.A. means sweet F. all. But in order to, you know, use sort of Cockney rhyming slang or make it sound like a euphemism that's nice, they said sweet Fanny Adams. But I didn't realize it was about the gruesome murder of an eight-year-old by somebody, again, you know, and I don't know whether there was something going around then. It was apparently before Jack the Ripper, but who knows? Maybe it was a, a younger iteration of Jack the Ripper or, or maybe not. But, you know, somebody else, it might have been a zeitgeist thing or maybe, as you say, look, uh, whether it be John Wayne Gacy or Ted Bundy, I know I said Al Bundy last week, I meant Ted Bundy, uh, or other people who might be charismatic, and maybe they have to be to sort of like go up to a woman and, and get her to drop her guard a bit, not run away, and then, you know, once you've lulled them into um, sort of relaxing their guard, then then they do these horrible things. And I actually kind of stopped reading, because with uh, Fanny Adams there, this guy met these three girls or had met them before and was all pleasant and said hello. And then next time he kind of ha happened to come across them on some kind of common ground in England, you always hear about these sort of commonages or, or village green or whatever, you know, and he sort of said to two of the girls, Oh, I, I'll give you a penny hape and you're a farthing. If you, if you race each other to that, to that mound over there, leaving the third girl, uh, then, you know, uh, on her own with, with this guy. So, uh, you know, when I sort of read that, I said, oh, listen, I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, maybe I read a little bit more than that, but yeah. So anyway, Sweet Fatty Adams, I think, is relevant to this. Did you ever hear of her? Uh, yes, I have heard of her. And there's another uh, girl named Polly that was uh, 
uh, that was relevant to it as well. That that uh, that guy I was talking about earlier, uh, the Rumble O guy. He he mentions her. Uh, I think he mentions both of those ladies in uh, his book. Um, but real quickly on what we were just talking about on the August eighth thing. Mm-hmm. I have found a thing in the Hindu stand times, which talks about August 8th, 2022. And it says the lion's gate portal manifestations are a recent phenomenon, but the event has its due regard in ancient civilizational findings. And then it says, let's dig a little deeper on what the lion's gate portal is. And it has a quote. And when you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you to achieve it. Hmm, That's an uh, interesting, uh, like, a little thing there, uh, uh, you know, about August 8th, right? That's a a quote uh, being used by these occultists referring to August 8th, right? And it says, the Lionsgate portal is a cosmic event that occurs every year between July 28th and August 12th. And peaks on August 8th. It takes place when the sun in Leo, the earth, Orion's belt, and the star Sirius are all lined up. Which is activated by the rising of the star Sirius. Which is, you know, basically Lucifer in a way. Like that's where like the Egyptians thought that you went home to, you know, the afterlife or whatever for the Egyptian, uh, you know, priesthood and the pharaohs, etc. You know, you know, right. it's like and it says the Lionsgate portal is one such event when the universe is full of positive energy and is all ears to hear your aspirations. So it's a time and period between July 28th and August 12th that anything that you're trying to do as an occultist will have a, a, a supernatural boost to it. Right. What days did the river murders occur between? Well, uh, I mean, as far as I know, the first one started on August uh, 31st. But, I mean, maybe if you're opening the gate to the lion, you might do all this stuff in advance. Uh, that may be. Like, let's see here. What day is the first Ripper murder? It's like, I mean, if it's, um, you know, it says, yes, uh the canonical five and their murders were between August 31st and the 9th of November and are often considered the most likely to be linked. So right. it's possible he could have started well before those and the canonical five, as they say, are not the only five. But I also find the number five being important because the number five, they're all women and the number five refers to Venus, as you know, like the five point star. Right, well, I was going to say there's a pentagram there. Uh, look, as far as Leo goes, yeah, I mean, as you say, uh, like, so, well, you, you, narrow, you had the dates more narrow, right? You said something like between July 28th and August 12th. Now, to me, that sounds yeah. like maybe the, the peak or the central, more central portion of the astrological sign Leo. So anyone born between July 23rd and August 23rd is in Leo, apparently, right? So Leo the lion. And yeah. look, I, I seem to remember that uh, there was the the Lion's Gate uh, in Greece uh, on the way into Sparta. I think that well, was called the Lion's it. Gate. Lion's Gate films, man. Like well, even I mean. Hollywood it's, is naming their yeah. their name their movie studios after this Lion's Gate. Uh, well, uh, that's it exactly. That's drama. what I mean. That's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, and I remember wanting to find out where they got their name from. Because if we look into it, so many of them are like that. And I seem to remember, I could be slightly wrong, but I think that, that there was um, uh, basically a narrower strip of land that leads from maybe the uh, sort of Attica, Athens part of Greece down into Sparta. And I think they might have called this sort of more narrow walkway the Lion's Gate. Yeah, it might, it might possibly be. And I, I mean... It's like, you know, they say here, you may ask why focusing on Lionsgate portal manifestations is so important because it is the opening of the galactic gate and symbolizes an outburst of high frequency energy or wisdom. You know how they feel about wisdom that brings us a great opportunity for growth and manifestation, all things that they do. 
This period allows us to boost our aspirations, manifest new ideas and aspirations, raise our consciousness and enhance our spiritual energy. Anyone looking for a change in their lifestyle, setting new goals or wanting to accomplish more, this gate is for you. Yeah, well, look, absolutely. I mean, look, I, I, for me, I can make an easy stretch. I don't know how easy it is for other people, but we know that uh, in the southern United States, in particular in uh, Arizona and New Mexico, uh, and along the 33rd line, just by way of example, in case people didn't know, uh, but Roswell is on the nearest, makes no difference, the 33rd uh, degree line of latitude. So uh, we also know that um, people like uh, Jack Parsons and um, uh, Alistair Crowley and other people uh, did uh, sex magic rituals in the desert there on certain dates yeah. and, uh, you know, trying to invoke certain things. These people oh, do believe... Of, uh the desert, by the way, the Lion's Gate is also the start of the Egyptian New Year. I forgot about that. Yeah, it's the first yeah. day of the Egyptian New Year. Right. Very, so, very appropriate, right? Well, it is, and it adds more weight. And I don't know how whether people might think, oh, it's all just grabbing at straws. I like to think of myself as being rational. But if I put myself in the mindset, I've seen enough of it now. I know it's all very circumstantial evidence, but you put enough of it together. And uh, I think there's a case to be made for I'm mentioning the, the example of the southern United States, particularly there uh, along what they the Mexicans called something along the lines of the path of the dead, something along those lines, something de los muertos in, in Spanish, you know, and mm -hmm. um, maybe it's just via via del muertos. Um, but, you know, uh, what they're trying to do essentially is open up portals to some kind of demonic entity to come in and help them with their plans. And I can see a parallel there. And I, I don't think I'm stretching it too much to sort of say, you know, if, if we're painting broad brushstrokes here, them saying we're allowing the lion in, we're opening the portcullis, uh, maybe the animal goes on the hunt, uh, they're preparing stuff. So in that case, it would make sense. Maybe if they started doing all this in early August, such mm -hmm. that by the end of end of august the lion could then go roaring around on the streets uh, you know that biblical passage like devouring people uh, yeah you know the passage i'm referring to and also yeah, just just to get this lucifer to is the lion stalking and not waiting to devour yet yeah, something like that to that exactly. effect yeah and then just to put this into the mix as well, uh, you know, recently we did a stream and I think maybe if we didn't mention it, I think we did mention it in some of our recent streams, but there is one that's exclusive to uh, Odyssey has to be there because, you know, of a connection that we can't really mention too much. But uh, I'll just say this, the Lion of Judah um, mm -hmm. is connected to the English royalty, the Anglo connection that way. So... I'll just offer that up for, for, you know, whatever people would want to read into it there between the, the monarchy, maybe the symbol, the, the, uh, um, what do you call it? The, um, the heraldry of the English monarch with the lion rampant. And, uh, it is all connected back to King David, as you've mentioned many times before. So look, it's a, it's a broad brushstroke stuff there, but maybe all that allows some kind of cosmic demonic power in, Oh, it's really clutching the straws there, but to sort of say, yes, the, the Lucifer blesses the works of, he who will be known as the Whitehall murderer or Jack the Ripper. And I just very quickly, before I forget, I better say that uh, the the mitre there or the, the set square is also known as a mitre. Um, and sometimes a mitre is um, defined as being a square, but with a triangle removed from the top. Um, and at least one of the murders was done in mitre square. That's why I've called it murder on mitre square. It invokes the Freemasons there as well a bit, you know. So yeah. that's all that uh, there. Also, uh, I was going to throw in uh, a lot of people talk about Sirius, you know, the dog star, and uh, people have a misconception of where it gets that name from. Well, it gets that name from Hinduism, actually. The Hindus, like the Egyptians, like, uh, you know, all the tribes of South America revered that star. And it's called the dog star because of. Uh, uh, like his name is uh, was King uh, Yudhistra, Yudhistra, I think is how it's said. Like my, you know, my pronunciation of uh, Hindu is not all that great. I'm Southern. I'm not the either. I have to say, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, to them the star is known as Svana, and you know it. The king there had a loyal dog and was ready to forsake heaven. 
for his, you know, loyal companion or whatnot. And, you know, he was eventually allowed into heaven anyway for his devotion to the star or whatnot. So, but that's why it's called the dog star to begin with is because of that legend anyway. But, well, look, get that we on record. Talk- yeah, well, we were talking about the, the star newspaper, of course. I mean, I think we we can draw a line there. And also, um, you know, I, I looking up here, and I've, I remember looking up before that Sirius the dog star, and it says in Latin is Canis Major, uh, is the brightest star in the morning. Or sorry, the brightest star in the night sky. Um, mm-hmm. Now, Lucifer was known as, and there's a song about a Bob Marley song, isn't it? Uh, or maybe it's somebody else. Sorry, Lucifer, uh, star of the morning. Well, he did herald uh, the sun, uh, yeah. or maybe his mother did herald Lucifer, the brightest star in the morning. Is the morning it's star the same as the evening the star? Morning. It's technically uh, the the quote technically goes, "Oh how the how thou have fallen, uh, O Lucifer, son of the morning." Is how it typically okay. goes, and people mis uh, misquote it as morning star. But yeah, like point well, taken. Morning, in. Well, uh, what I want to ask you then is, I've heard people say before that the morning star is the evening star. Is that the case? Do you happen to know? If you don't know, it doesn't matter. We we'll, we'll leave it there for other uh, people who know better. Yeah. You know, well, for uh, like you know, the Masons are going to revere a few different stars and there's a few different mystery school teachings on exactly, you know, which star is the most revered out of all. Like, you know, some have the, you know, Saturn as being the nighttime sun, right? Like that's Osiris when he goes into the underworld. Like it's, you know, it's Saturn, the nighttime sun. Um, And then you have some, uh, you have some traditions that put Venus in that, in that slot. Well, that's and what I was going to ask you. Where does Venus come into it? Yeah. Sirius in that slot. So, you know, like the mystery schools usually are, like the symbology can change and stuff like that, but the core message remains the same. Yeah. Well, look, it's it, a bit confusing for me anyway. I'm just trying to look it up here. I can't find uh, something that says it definitive. Like it does say Lucifer is the name for the morning star, but it could, but I know this is always this confusing stuff in it because it, immediately it says the morning star refers to both Jesus and Satan in the Bible. And yeah. um, so look, I, I think as well, you know, the two sides of the same coin thing there because they are adversaries is uh, intentional. I don't know. Maybe for other people, it's a matter of common knowledge that, whether the dog star and Lucifer the morning star is one and the same or two different. I know I've heard that the morning star is the same as the evening star, but it says the we'll dog star I... is the brightest star in the night sky as seen from Earth. But I do know that both uh, Venus and Saturn are both extremely bright stars. And at some point in the past, they didn't make a distinction between planets and stars. They just called planets wandering stars. So I don't really know. I'm neither an astronomer nor an astrologer. Uh, so I don't know, but we we'll just throw them into the mix for what it's worth anyway. Well, if you go back far enough to our original matriarchal system, like because as hunter gatherers, that's why you find all these little matriarchal uh, uh, fertility statues all over the place with the large breasts and, you know, pregnant belly and all that. The mother goddess. That was originally like that was the original like religion that folks followed, and Venus is the is the brightest planet. You know, what I mean, they call the planets the luminaries. So that like once they did make a distinction between regular stars and the the planets closer to us, you know, they started calling them the luminaries. And originally, Venus was known as the first quote unquote morning and evening star. Like, but sometime later, you have uh, Saturn and, uh, you know, Sirius being worked in there later on. But it was to encode the same uh, lost knowledge or whatnot. There's just a slightly different interpretation of the system. Mm-hmm. Like, it's the right. same kind of thing with, like, Scottish Rite and York Rite Freemasonry. Same system, technically, but they're slightly different, ever so slightly. Just like if you go over to Oriental Masonry in China or something, they're going to be slightly different than what a Mason's Lodge in California is going to be like. Right? Yes. You can switch swap these things around and it doesn't really matter as long as when you decode the the symbology and everything that it comes to the same message. That makes sense. Okay. 
uh, even though I think you and I, with our perfectionism, would like it to be directly, uh, ac- you know, accurate or whatever. But look, it doesn't matter. Let's not get well, bogged down. That's what in they anyway. tried to do. Uh, that's what they tried to do uh, in the the modern era. That's what the remember when we talked about the unified Grand Lodge. The unified Grand Lodge. That's part of what it's meant to do is try to standardize this stuff across the board. That they've been trying to do that forever. But if you go back into the ancient history, you know, you had the the Egyptians doing their thing, the Hindus doing their thing, the Druids doing their thing, the Aztecs doing their thing. They're all practicing the mysteries, every single one of them. But they're just ever so slightly different. And in the modern era, with this globalist push, they've also tried to globalize the lodge and make it more standard. Mm. Well, uh, the UGLE, the Unified Grand Lodge of England, uh, seems to have uh, standardized their stuff. And, um, you know, reading about uh, lodges throughout England there, uh, I can see that on their various websites, they say chartered by the UGLE. So they've got the cells regulated and they would like to have that sort of ability to be able to say, oh, we are, we are endorsed, chartered by the UGLE. So everything's all you know ship shape and bristol fashion prim and proper uh so that's what they get for conforming to you know whatever the the, the rights are in whatever yeah. uh, it's basically the same kind of system there is. That the church uses the, that rome uses rome mm, uses yeah. the same kind of system in order to you know handle all of its branches well like the the masons adopted that that very same kind of system for their universal like church if you will temple whatever it's it you know same structure duplicated over and over and over just like with the mormon church or any other like uh, group that's popped out of this modern era they're basically all you know cookie cutters of the same template in one way or another yeah. if not completely yes yeah uh, and uh, definitely the, the very much parallel by the way i'll leave it for now right no time to i don't want to get down another rabbit i'll leave it on another time I discovered uh, another uh, type of uh, philanthrop- philanthropic organization, and uh, just from reading its blurb, uh, it, its symbol it used was kind of a stylized rainbow sort of star, and it talked about how it it, it worked in 33 countries or whatever, and I went, oh, come off it. Like, I'll, I'll show it to you next week if, if there's time. Okay. There we go, huh? Like, it's, yeah. uh, it's got all the stuff, the star, the rainbow, and the 33, all these things. <laughs> Freemasonry yeah. and Lucifer over and over again. It just, like, you can't get away from it, can you? Yeah. After a while, you sort of say, oh, come on, stop hitting me over the head with the, the obviousness of it. Um, yeah. right. It becomes kind of... And it come, becomes kind of an annoyance. You, you're amazed at it for a little while because you just keep seeing it everywhere. And you're like, oh, there it is again. Oh, yeah. there it is again. Yeah, you know, I went to a kid's graduation not that long ago. And like, you know, right there at the doors of their school, you have to walk between Yakim and Boaz and a checkerboard floor right above your head. Right. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and all these different things, but like you can't get away from it. It is absolutely everywhere. Well, everywhere. as a child, I used to look up at the, uh, what do they call it? <sighs> well, it, it was a ceiling made out of, uh, it's a lowered ceiling. I forget, you have it in offices as well. Artificial ceiling anyway, where there, there, there are tiles Drop. there. Yeah, dropped ceiling, maybe. Now, the tiles are all white, but I remember being in school and always kind of looking up, some, you know, daydreaming as you do, and sometimes looking up at the lights, and oftentimes it would be in the corridors too, where, you know, every certain amount of feet or meters, there would be another light, and the light had a black strip around it and white above it and white below it. So it looked to me like, a, you know, a, a licorice, all sort of sweet. So that's the kind of things I used to daydream about. Uh, I might have thought of, you know, imagined it was like a chessboard, maybe, you know, because I wouldn't mm-hmm. play drafts, maybe or checkers or that kind of thing. Anyway, but um, uh, a hound's tooth is also uh, one of their designs that they're quite fond of. So okay. if you see people rocking hound's tooth a lot, like really prominent people, that that's probably a good sign. You know, that little white and black yeah. pattern or whatnot. Yeah. Just a variation on a theme. Fair enough. Well, look, I tell you what, we are miles behind in the comments. Um, right. Here's an example, right? Uh, Michelle here says, gave me a chuckle too. Plans parenthood. <laughs> We're just paying rent in the hood. 
um and uh christy johnson says bobby is from robert peel also peelers yeah thanks for that reminder there and um vingle says what why was orson well suspected i wonder well he's not that old from 1888 but uh, just in case maybe you know already but anyway the black dahlia uh, that poor uh girl uh he was suspected in her murder or one of the suspects as well as george hodel which uh or hodel uh, which JC mentioned there because he, he I think he just brought it up because you know he his son said well he he's able to uh, perform incisions uh, with great expertise and because he had surgical training uh, so better to say than ever Elizabeth Short and look I think before we go on too much further like people uh, talk about how you shouldn't uh, sort of make celebrities out of these murderers because it would encourage others. And why is it that we remember the names of the murderers and not the victims, you know? And we've talked about the the five canonical murders, and I better just mention their names, right? And I did mention as well that there was Irish immigrants there. Um, now, one of the names is very obviously Irish. They sound more English to me, but who knows? Uh, and, of course, got to remember as well, a lot of these women might have gone by more than one name because they might have had a different name by night than they did by day. But here's the names anyway. I think this might be in order of which they were murdered. Uh, so the five victims are Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, who I mentioned before, and Mary Jane Kelly, which sounds like she might be Irish. So they're known as the canonical five. Their murders, as you said there already, between 31st of August and 9th of November, 1888. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it, as uh, we were saying before, the the fact that you have the his murders are you can see how his murders are following the press's narrative right that that is something i do want to make sure i stress very carefully is that if you read the papers and that were going on at the time and you follow those and you follow what the ripper was doing it's almost like they were taking cues from one another uh they it's like they were doing a dance back and forth and you know that's what I believe the uh, the assistant uh, con- or the assistant uh, uh, the assistant chief of the tech detectives there. I do believe that's why he thought that it was you know all the things we discussed included. But I think that that's why he came to the conclusion that it was the press that wrote those letters in the first place. Sir Melville McNaughton was his name, the assistant chief constable at Scotland Yard in 1889. He's, his notes are the best known of all documents on the case. Like you're, you can't miss his notes if you're looking into the river. And, you know, he wrote in his memoirs and I quote, in this ghastly production, I have always thought I could discern the stained forefinger of the journalist. Indeed, a year later, I had shrewd suspicions as to the actual author. But whoever did pen the gruesome stuff, it is certain to my mind that it was not the mad miscreant who had committed the murders. And in his book, The Lighter Side of My Official Life, Sir Robert Anderson, Anderson, head of Scotland Yard's Criminal Investigation Division during the investigation of the murders, commented specifically on the second letter when he wrote, So I will only add here that Jack the Ripper letter, which is preserved in Police Museum at New Scotland Yard, is the creation of an enterprising journalist. So, you know, these are uh, investigators at the time who, you know, also, uh, you know, have seen the fingerprints of journalism all over those letters. And, you know, it's it's rather obvious, in my opinion. Mm. But I you know, implore the audience, you know, as always, look into the stuff that I'm presenting and decide for yourself. I don't care what you decide just as long as you're actually going out there and looking into it and, you know, trying to actually discern this stuff, you know, like what you come up with, that's between you and God, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, it's very interesting. You're going to hear the sort of style. Um, I don't know how you say, but I mean, it's an almost aristocratic style of writing there, you know. Um, I, I recognize the style. It is a sort of a, 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 from a, a times gone by where people would write more elegantly, at least like that anyway. And um, 
anyway, the, the crux of what he's saying there is that he thinks the person who wrote the letters and the person who did the murders are two, have to be two different people. That's what he's saying, is he? Yes. Like that the person who uh, wrote those letters at the very least was not the river. You know, that it was somebody else that was pinning them for effect. Which, mm. you know, just seems more likely to me because of the way that it was done. You know, either that or Jack the Ripper might have been one of these journalists. Who knows? Right, indeed. And, uh, you know, we, we know also these days, and I'm sure there's been some movie about it, uh, but I think there has been some real life events where we now know that the media was generating stories oh look better not get into it but we know one thing right the russia 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 and the the the, the circular uh intelligence feeding uh, uh, where they were hiring people to say i heard the russians did this and then somebody else said well i heard him and he's just my source and the russians did something and somebody else goes uh, can you know, can you confirm it and then he sort of goes back to the first guy and says oh yeah i can confirm that and so on and so on. So uh, it's not just that they want to necessarily take somebody down, but uh, they want to generate fodder for their own press as well. And um, I suppose we can yeah. say that uh, people do acknowledge, I think some people even in CNN might acknowledge that indeed having a hated figure like Donald Trump, or at least a polarizing figure, if some love him, some hate him, it's good for business. And uh, even CNN is suffering without him uh, because mm. uh, CNN knows that they can't really report on anything that Donald or that um, Joe Biden does. Uh, they're so they're not really earning money or eyeballs. Um, yes, well, I mean, you see, like I saw Tim Pool posting this morning uh, something to the effect of "Now Biden has really stepped over the line," and it's like, yeah, keep talking like that. You're gonna you're gonna rile folks up and see where we go. Like, just keep it on, you know, and. That, uh, in my opinion, that's where all this is going to go in the in the end anyway. Like if they do end up trying to charge Trump, it's going to ignite his followers like you've never seen. Uh, like, you know, it will. They're already getting pissed. Yes. Uh, you know, and I can understand it. And I look, we won't. I'm going to say, no, I'll leave it there as a comment. I'm not going to get into it because it's just, we, you know, we'll be down a rabbit hole and we're, we're into the fourth oh. hour now, you know. Uh, but look, I tell you what, good news, right? We're, we're just about caught up with the comments. Um, uh, what do I want to say here? Watching Train says they rarely date normies because of their fame as well as they need to keep their perversions and kinks inside their little cult circles to protect themselves. They pass each other around. I think this is in relation to Hollywood parties. Mm -hmm. Carl Gustav says who in 1999 could have predicted that Will Smith would one day be the least cool person or man on earth. Yeah. Uh, watching Train says imagine what a cool world this would be to play in with things like VR goggles and technology. Look, I'll just say this real quick. I used to think, oh, it must have been terrible in the olden days. Even if you were a king, all you could do is just sort of have the same people come up and do plays. Like, you know, you wouldn't have cool special effects or amazing stories or amazing sound mm -hmm. and surround sound and all this kind of thing. But that's when I was a kid, when I was excited by video games and the possibility of this future where we'd all be whooshing around in virtual reality. Uh, but now I know that uh, all of that is just artificial. It's not as good as the real thing. And... Um, you know, the greatest technology really is just human beings and uh, digital is fine mm. and reproduction of music perfectly is great and all that. When I was a kid, I hoped one day that there would be better things than cassette tapes and, you know, scratchy records. Um, and it is nice to be able to record whatever you like, like we're doing now onto hard drives and in data centers and all that oh. sort of stuff. But uh, the real thing uh, is not Coca-Cola. It's just human beings talking to each other uh, sort of face to face, eye to eye. Uh, we realize now that when we've made everything artificial and and indeed when everything is perfect, flawless, faultless, like digital recording stuff is, you definitely lose something. I'm not talking like an audio file where you, you, you lose these kind of vibrations you can't really hear. But you're, what I'm just sort of saying is, as everything has become artificial, virtual reality, go reality goggles and whatever else, well, if this life is but a dream, then it's inception, you know, virtual reality inside virtual reality. I don't mean to be mm. sounding like a hippie or whatever, but real life is there to be lived. And I suppose now that it's harder and harder to live real life, uh, I miss it more and more. Yes. And I mean, a lot of people do. And I think that's one of the reasons they play video games is because they have nothing else to do to experience that kind of adventure, et cetera, anymore. 
think people are longing for a real life experience and they're experience or having to experience it through VR and it's always going to be lackluster. It's never going to be as full of an experience as the real life, the real life thing, you know, and, it, you know, while technology does have all kinds of positive uses, the unfortunate thing about humanity is that we are falling to such a state that any kind of thing that powerful that you give us is going to eventually wind up in the hands of someone evil and then they will use it to hurt you, your children and your descendants. Right. Mm. Like, so it's a matter of us having to be strong enough and wise enough and aware enough of our own f failings and, you know, inability to control ourselves to decide not to use it. It's just like drugs. Drugs feel great for a while until the consequences kick in and then it sucks. Well, technology is great until the consequences kick in then it sucks and it's time to grow up and learn not to be addicts anymore. Hmm. Uh, well, that's really yeah. what it is. Yeah, you know, you it, want to be... uh, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, if you really want to be an adult and I have to say this to myself as well, you know, I mean, I don't mean to be ever giving the impression I'm standing in my pulpit telling people how they should clean up their lives, but I'm uh, talking about myself, you know, I was never particularly, res in fact, I was an irresponsible person way into my thirties. Um, but we do have to all recognize in our own minds that if we want to be adults, if we wanted to be treated as people with the right to determine uh, our own futures, we have to take responsibility for ourselves and be mentally disciplined. Yes, we do. Se we self regulate. Disciplined and uh, able to say, you know, to turn down comfort. Mm hmm. We are comfort seeking creatures and they use that to great effect to control us. Yeah. A uh, couple more comments here. Now, Vingol says uh, Stern in German can mean both a star and a planet. And he says, uh, if he remembers correctly, a planet means wanderer in Greek. I think you might be right there because they move about the heavens in a more willy nilly manner than other heavenly objects. Can I just say to that as well that? I only recently realized that the two characters who provide comic relief in Hamlet uh, are called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And Guildenstern. Rosencrantz means Red Cross and Guildenstern means Golden Star. Yeah. Yeah. I, like We talked about that before, I thought. I can't remember mm. if it was on stream or before stream or whatnot. But yeah, there's a movie called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Like It's a comedy from the 90s or whatever. It's yes. a pretty good movie. Like I would rec highly recommend it. I don't but think I've seen I, it, but I, I heard about it at the time. I, I knew it was those two characters. Um, and by the way, they were historical characters as well. They were actually Dutch people from the Netherlands uh, of mm -hmm. royal family uh, or royal connections, you know. And they visited yeah. the uh, they visited England, and uh, it's it's it's. I think it's pretty much a matter of record that uh, they they would have met William Shakespeare. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were they were related to uh, somebody of of, hist of historical importance anyway in the sort of uh, Scandinavian Nederlander Germanic type of world there. Well, you know, um, we talked about Prince Bernhard, and you know how him and uh, King Charles had the same uh, same bloodline uh, claim or whatever. The Dutch have always, you know, King Billy and all that, like they've always traditionally been a uh, Freemasonic as all get out. So, yeah, it's not it's not a surprise that the Dutch, you know, yeah. at all. Um, well, look, I forget who the fellow was now, but uh, I put it in a, in a picture anyway, and I don't know if it's easy to read, but we, we kind of touched on it. And then I looked into it a bit more afterwards when I was sort of annotating and putting in some pictures. And it's that... Uh, uh, odyssey exclusive i'll say you know where we talked one uh, on uh, st patrick's day but i put it out maybe it took me a couple of months nearly doing it in bits and bobs um but it's there anyway and uh, what did i call it i called it the the anglo connection uh from the the lion of judah to the to the english rose that's what i called it so it's there in Odyssey if anybody wants to go have a look at it. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll clip it and just put a different audio on it for the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern bit, but it's there in text and that sort of stuff. But anyway, 
So it's interesting in a way, you know, because sometimes words are staring at there. I knew sort of Gilder and Gilden was to do with gold. And I knew the stern of a boat. And, uh, you know, it never dawned on me there that it's because of navigation, probably by stars or whatever, you know. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that's uh, where you get into that whole etymology thing. It's a fascinating topic. You know, it's far too me much for me to memorize it all, but I do study it quite a bit. You know, every yeah. chance I get anyway. Well, sometimes I learn a new thing and I kind of go, how did I not realize or know that before? And then I forget it. <laughs> you know, I, go, yeah. I can only retain it for a little while, you know. Well, I mean, we do have limited storage space. I mean, the, there's only so much that the human brain can hold, though they're ticking away really quickly at trying to fix that. I know. For the low, oh, low I remember the free wheel. I remember back in around the year, what would it have been? Probably 2000, maybe when an eight gigabyte drive was coming out around about then. And I remember hearing, oh, that's it. Now, finally, lads, we've made a hard drive that has got as much storage as the human brain. I have a feeling it doesn't work quite that way. <laughs> eight yeah. gigabytes, you know, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, to think, stretch, it does. I yeah. think the brain is more plastic and I think different people have different amounts of storage depending. Think, yeah. And I think we know that that there is no such real place where memories are stored. It's just mental connections and associations and pathways that grow stronger. And that's how smells can trigger a distant memory or bring it, bring something in a sharp relief. You know, it, it, we, mm -hmm. we are emotional creatures and we remember things by our emotional reaction to them. And that's one way of looking at it anyway. You know, we remember most things through narrative and story. Hmm. Like the best person to pass on information is a storyteller. He will always be more effective than anyone else because he can string words together in an interesting manner that can keep people, you know, keep people's attention. Yeah. Well, and, those, those people who teach neurolinguistic programming say that if you want to remember uh, a lot of different seemingly unconnected uh, things like say objects and give the impression that you're a memory man what you do is you imagine a journey that you go on a lot maybe like a commute to work and what you do is you place each one of these objects maybe you try and think of a rhyme or you put them in uh, you know put, put them in a position where say you go onto a bridge and you place a green box on top of the bridge and then there's the off ramp there to get onto the next road and you say right well i'll put the the beach ball on that and i remember and i'll look at that now as i pass it by and you just follow that journey in your mind, and it's easier to remember the objects then, things like that. Yeah, exactly that. Like you're building a narrative in your head, a story for you to follow through. And that is exactly how the brain works. And that goes back to those neural pathways and stuff you were talking about. Uh, we view everything in a, a, a beginning, middle, end type way. Right. We view everything like a road, a path uh, moving forward. Why? Because that's how we perceive the world around us. Right. That's how everything around us moves. All right. You we know, perceive we... time in that manner. We perceive life in that manner and everything follows a story and a story always has like, this, you know, follows this pattern. It, right. So in a way, we have to hack our own brains like we have to program our minds in the language that it understands. And of course, there are these societies. And as you said before, maybe they don't understand it, but they have a template for manipulating us because they understand how our minds can be manipulated by just placing objects in our field of view. We don't necessarily realize that we're absorbing certain signs and symbols. Yes. And I mean, as a matter of fact, it works better the less that you know. So, like, the less you understand that that's what they're doing, the better it works. Right? It, like, it's uh, such a paradoxical thing, but, you know, it, it's the way it, it's the way it shakes out. At the end of the yeah. day, they just have to rely on people to be people. And it usually gets the job done. Mm. And that's the worst part about it is, like, the only way to stop them is to, is to get people to stop acting like people, which seems impossible. Right. But unfortunately, I've seen the, the light dim and uh, flicker, and I think it's nearly out behind the eyes of most people now. They, they love their digital, technological, enslaved uh, uh, new world that's looming a very fast interview. Digital world, digital panopticon of uh, Jeremy okay. Bentham. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You'll find many on our side of the fence, so-called side of the fence, will end up capitulating before it's over because they already do. 
yeah. right? You already see them make little capitulations here and there. And those little capitulations will come big capitulations once the stakes right raise, right? Right now, they're just worried about how they're going to keep their lights on or whether or not they're going to have air conditioning next month or be able to put gas in their car. What happens when the stakes gets really high? Well, they'll start capitulating more. That's what will happen. Well, people have already, and I think, you know, back in 2020, people were, you know, when they knew that oh, well, this is it now, this is their pretext for bringing in the digital dollar or, you know, world coin or whatever. Uh, people said, well, look, uh, even if we think we're going to hold out, uh, the Bible does say he causeth all to take off the mark. And, um, you know, I do know that uh, people very, very often, you know, talk a big talk, but they don't walk the walk. And then, uh, like, I've been in situations, say, with, uh, you know, attempted collective bargaining in, in different workplaces and uh, maybe i haven't said this before maybe i have but i'll say it again and just in case uh, there was these two fellows who were most vocal they were they were the, by far the loudest saying we won't stand for this uh we're never going to do it i'm going on strike right now who's with me and i said listen lads okay fine you, you know you, your emotions are high now calm down no need to go on strike just yet and they were saying, no, we're going to go outside the gates now. We're going to pick it. We're not going to let anyone in or out. And I said, yeah, yeah listen, we, we can resort to that if you want. And believe me, I'll be right there with you. But we don't have to do that yet. Just simply nobody here, as long as you agree, is going to sign that new contract. Then they can't force us to do it. right? So we don't have to go on strike yet. All right. And they're going, oh, I've had enough. I've had enough. I'm going, I've had enough of this place. Yeah. Anyway, they handed this new contract on Friday. And I said, right, no one's going to sign it. We'll talk more about it on Monday. Maybe some of us will talk uh, over the weekend about it. Coming on Monday, these two guys have already signed it. And um, they were ready with their excuses. And they were just as angry, but the opposite way. They were saying, oh, you don't understand. I've got four kids and a baby on the way. You know, oh, I can't be outside there, you know, picketing and let my children starve. You're trying to, you'd have my children starve, wouldn't you? And I said, listen, I didn't say anything. I, of course, don't want your children to starve. But you see, that's not what it was about. It's basically go on the offensive for the defensive, you know? Um, yeah. And you find that with people, the more that people talk about, oh, I'll never take the mark. Oh, I'll never take the digital. What do they call it? Um, uh, basic income, you know, uh, mm. but they'll be the first then because the people who shout loudest, you know, there's some kind of inverse rule with, with all that. Yes. Like that typically is it, you know, me thinks the lady does protest too much type thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it is the strangest thing, but, you know, try to explain it to them and be like, you know, hey, dude, like, I've already seen you capitulate for less already. Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. you didn't wear the mask. Maybe you didn't do this or that, but that's because the stakes weren't high enough yet. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's all just a matter of somebody riding the line and being like, well, what am I willing to do? So, that doesn't really correlate too much. It doesn't really matter if they stood up to the mask or not. It's whether or not, are you going to stand up to now you can't work anywhere, <laughs> right? And because of that, you're broke. And now your girlfriend doesn't want to be with you anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yep. like that kind of stuff, you know, these, these things are what makes people, that's what makes people bend and then eventually break. Because, Look again. Uh, I know that I'm characterized often by being a depressive or a cynic uh, or a pessimist. But uh, you know, in the end of uh, 1984, uh, after he's gone through Room 101, and uh, you know, we never thought that Winston Smith uh, would allow himself. He knew what happened, but he never thought that he would capitulate. He never thought that he would come back into the fold. Um, but you know, as as long as he managed to hold out, then they told him afterwards, listen, we're actually impressed with you because um, your girlfriend, and I keep forgetting her name, um, Julia, uh, betrayed you immediately. And uh, once he heard that, he kind of went, so what have I been doing all this for? Like, I'm not doing it for anybody. That's how you demoralize people, by the way. Like, if people think that they're mm -hmm. rebel factions holding out, if they say you're not fighting for anybody because, you know, you're the only one still out here fighting. The war is over. <laughs> Nobody... Uh, is there to be fought for so um winston smith the the terrible ending it's such a quiet solitary silent defeat he just goes back to working for the ministry of truth he has to take his job back what, what other choice is there <laughs> the whole system is there everybody's in it yeah which i mean i've been talking to the wife a lot about that like the past few days over the fact that you know how people are and stuff and why 
I don't necessarily fight for every common man because I don't. There's some people I fight for because they've earned it, but other people, they would just as soon slit my throat or turn me in as to look at me. Right. And it's going to be that way. And that unfortunately, as much as we might want to feel empathy for them, they're going to hate us because we're going to represent something that the government has told them are domestic terrorists and this, that, and the other thing. And they'll hate us. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, so, yeah, you know, I don't fight for just the people. Like, you know, I fight for myself and God and, you know, my eventual legacy. What will I be remembered for? Right. Will I re be remembered for being the piece of shit I was? Or will I be remembered for being someone brave enough to stand up to this shit, right? And, you know, stand up for someone who, like, actually is innocent and deserves to be defended. You know, that's what I'd like to be remembered for. And, like, that's why I fight. Like, fighting for people is a waste of fucking time because people don't, they don't want to be saved, as we've said before. Yeah. So look good on there, anyway. But I... that want to be saved will fight next to you, usually. Yeah, well, look, I do appreciate uh, those noble words. Um, fighting for an idea, not necessarily for people, even if they don't deserve it or don't want it. I do appreciate that. Good man. Um, just to lighten it a little bit there, uh, Vingal says, lol, at EE's outraged worker voice. How dare you? How dare you? I, I had to sign it. What do you think? <laughs> anyway, um, what about this, JC? Those uh -huh. guys who were protesting there so much, yeah. what they probably did was protested enough to where management came down and was like, look, boys, if y'all shut the fuck up, this is what's going to happen to you. Just telling you. Yeah. They Maybe changed that. their mind, and that's yeah. when you talked to them. They had done, uh, they had done been given, like, the, you know, the how's it going, how it's going to go speech. Yeah, uh, well, look, it's very possible they were talked to beforehand. Um, I think many things could have happened. I think certainly one thing that definitely did happen was the two fellas talked during the weekend. They both knew that they were full of it, and their wives said, <laughs> listen, you are definitely not putting your career in jeopardy. Um, so mm -hmm. say one thing, do another. This is what people always do. Same with, say, if you're in school, they say, oh, I didn't study, did you? I'm not studying for this test, but they're secretly... Uh, swatting away and they're hoping you don't yeah. so they're trying to wrong foot everybody else these two fellas yeah. then uh when the all the the shouting and the smoke cleared these two fellas then uh they effectively were like that fella in the matrix who was secretly making deals saying put me back in and i can taste the steak right it'll be the juiciest steak yeah so these mm -hmm. two fellas were given nice managerial jobs afterwards they did pretty much uh they were very like what you'd call um the Judas lambs for the other people as well. They all thought they were going to be made managers, you know? Yeah. Which, I mean, people tend to uh, stand up thinking like the whole room is going to stand up too. And when it doesn't, they are in for a, a pleasant shock. Right. You know, I, like, I went through that once upon a time, expecting the whole world to stand up and not, you know, not stand for this, but they do. So they do. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, that's the way. Yeah, if you're hinging your action on like whether or not the majority of society is going to do anything, you might as well just sit down now because they ain't going to do shit. Nut. Yeah, uh, you can't get your inspiration from others. It's not necessarily going to be, I'm Spartacus. No, I am, and so is my wife. But um, mm. what it's going to have to be is like that in the Colosseum uh, or, you know, uh, being crucified like uh, Jesus, where the Christians are literally going to have to... Um, or, you know, people who basically stand up for their principles or what they claim to believe in, uh, dying in the Colosseum uh, by the lion or, or gladiator, gladiators or whatever. And um, also, uh, what is worse, perhaps not a quick death, but a slow, long, starving to death, like in the, um, well, I suppose, in, in that Ukraine area where a lot of the peasants were starved to death and maybe in London and other places, Ireland too, that uh, peasants all starved to death slowly and uh, excruciatingly painfully. Yes. Well, see, that's one of the reasons why they're trying to demonize everyone against Christians and everything else is to make that, you know, make that acceptable. And, that, you know, but that will be a mistake on their behalf. As we say in orthodoxy, like all the time, the church is built on the blood of the martyrs, 
after every drop of Christian blood they spill, a, a cathedral will eventually go up in its place. So let them come. Let them come if that's the game they want to play. But, nice. you know, it was that bloodshed that founded uh, Christianity's first 2,000 years. Go ahead and let them found another 2,000 if they'd like. Well, it does seem that in that way, like people like, you know, will one way or another, whatever it exactly entails, have to uh, suffer for uh, their principles. Mm -hmm. um, one way or the other, whether it's yeah. in blood or in some other manner, you know, just blatant starving you to death or freezing you to death by shutting you out of society either way but the fact of the matter is if we w ever want any kind of movement on this then we have to be willing to die for our principles otherwise there's no point we're wasting our time well that's it people have to be aware that it does come down to that ultimate uh price um mm -hmm. eventually uh things do boil down to, to um their essence like that look can i say that uh we are well into the fourth hour and uh, I don't think that it was exactly at three hours, 33, but again, around about that time, give or take five minutes or thereabouts, you uh, left the stream momentarily and came back without your icon, as you just mm. tend to do. It's just a thing, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, so we're caught up on all the comments now, uh, more or less. I might have had to skip over a few. Um, but uh, what I think we should do now is I need a quick break. I need to take a, a drink of water. And... Um, I uh, I think I have one of the videos that I might be able to play that they don't mention some unmentionable thing in it. And it's from CBS News. And it's, of course, two people who speak in, you know, their newsified accents that they practice so much. Uh, but it's about Jack the Ripper and it's about the new evidence. And, well, as I said at the time, like what you're talking about anyway, you know, we, we mentioned earlier about DNA evidence. So. Let's listen to that and see what they say. Give, give our speaking voices a, a break and then have a think about maybe what we might not have covered as far as if you want to make the case for uh, Jack the Ripper having been a member of a Freemasonic order or of perhaps a British uh, elite political class. Mm. All right. Yeah, sounds good to me. Revealing the DNA evidence they say helped solve one of history's biggest crime mysteries, the identity of Jack the Ripper. Back in 1888, the notorious ser serial killer murdered and mutilated the bodies of five women in London. Vladimir Dudier of our streaming network, that's CBSN, shows us why an immigrant from Poland is now a leading suspect. Vlad, good morning to you. Good morning. The savagery of Jack the Ripper's crimes terrorized the residents of London. No one was even charged, although the police have had their suspicions. Now, more than a century later, modern technology may have finally unmasked the elusive killer. Few criminals have captivated the world's imagination, <laughs> like Jack the Ripper. Altogether a different breed of killer. This silk shawl is believed to be the last piece of physical evidence left from his killing spree more than 130 years ago. Two biochemists who analyzed it say they detected the DNA of Catherine Eddowes, Jack the Ripper's fourth victim, in apparent bloodstains. They also found a semen stain they believe came from Aaron Kosminski, a 23-year-old Polish barber who at the time was a prime suspect. Researcher David Miller. I think the fact that there are two, two signatures which appear to match signatures from descendants increases the confidence that what we're looking at is something which is real. Miller and his co-author published their data for the first time in a scientific paper last week. They said the semen stain contained fragments of mitochondrial DNA, genetic material children inherit only from their mothers, that match Kosminski's living relatives. Author Russell Edwards, who hired the scientists to conduct the DNA test, originally disclosed the findings in his book, Naming Jack the Ripper. He spoke to Sunday morning in 2015. We've proved this. You know, all the story absolutely fits like a jigsaw puzzle. I think they come up with rather convincing evidence. Dr. Stanley Nelson, a UCLA professor of human genetics, says the DNA case against Kosminski is strong, but not completely ironclad. They're not identifying a unique person. Actually, it's about one in 50 to one in 100 individuals in modern England have this mitochondrial type. Kosminski died in an asylum in 1919. The British biochemists say their original aim was not to learn Jack the Ripper's true identity, 
but to see how far they could stretch modern scientific techniques to analyze minute DNA samples that were over 100 years old, Bianca. Once again, modern science solving age-old mysteries, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Vlad. Right. Well, I'm sorry about any uh, sort of video artifacts there where it kind of might have frozen up a bit. Hopefully it came through as far as the audio anyway. Um, that's, I think, a function of either my bandwidth or, uh, you know, other computery issues here. But, um, yeah, uh, what would you want to pick out, if anything, out of that there anyway, JC? Well, yeah, I would really recommend everyone uh, read into that, um, the Rumbelow fellow that I was talking about earlier. Uh, you know, he gets into that stuff rather deep, uh, a lot deeper than I'm able to. Uh, like, And he gets in, uh, I can't really, the stuff I would like to say, I can't really say on here because it has to do with those people, you know? Right. What well, yeah, I mean, we could just say, like, those unmentionables, you know, just want to avoid. Yeah. We well, know um, we're talking. Yeah. yeah, he he makes the point that the apron was kind of brought in as, like, the one that's being sampled for DNA is a fake from the Edwardian era. I think I said that already. Uh, but he said that the apron at the scene, the whole leather apron thing, uh, and all that, he says that that was contrived and he doesn't think that there ever was one. Right? And he makes the case for that. And I think that, you know, that's one of the reasons I would recommend people like at the very least listening to there's a there's a, a channel on YouTube called The Notorious. And if you search The Notorious and, you know, run below, it'll pop up and he does a little uh, podcast, like an hour long little podcast about his book. And he touches on it. If you don't want to, you know, actually go and read the book, like you can listen to that and he'll touch on it a bit. But he can explain it a lot better than I can, you know, as far as like memorizing all the ins and outs of that. Uh, okay, but well, well, let uh, me, uh... I think that, that had something to do with it, though, because, you know, as I was saying, there are two groups of those people and one group they want to get rid of and one group they want to keep. And I think that, you know, you talked about it earlier that there was a lot of them coming into London at the time. And I think maybe like they were trying to uh, possibly pawn it off on them to kind of get something done about that problem. Because well, you have to understand if they're trying to set up a thing where they're going to say that this dude is a descendant of King David and of Jesus and all this other kind of stuff with like the British Israelism suggests, then they can't allow any actual those people to exist because those people will call them out and be like, uh, no, that's not what our religion says, right? Like they have been doing. If you look into orthodox, the Orthodox, like they run around all the time protesting the modern state, right? And it's because, according to uh, their original doctrine, there isn't supposed to be one. Like the whole world's supposed to be, like they're supposed to be, you know, in diaspora and trying to raise up the whole world, like through uh, gospel and stuff, just like Christians are supposed to be doing. So. There, there's no reason to have a third temple or any of that, right? So the, that group of people existing is problematic for them. So I, that's one of the reasons they've been trying to get rid of them for the past, uh, you know, couple centuries. All right. Well, uh, well listen, uh, you know, I, I've got a lot of links there in the, in the description already, but uh, you did mention... Uh, earlier on in the stream, the LOL Field and Love uh, channel. So I'll try to put that in the update, the description with that later. If you have links oh, yeah. uh, to this fellow, Donald Rumbelow, uh, or a YouTube channel where he's been interviewed, send that to me and I'll add it. Let me read out what the Brave AI summarizer has, has to say about Donald Rumbelow. Uh, it says, mm -hmm. Donald Rumbelow is a renowned expert on the subject of Jack the Ripper murders in 1880s London. He is a former City of London police officer, crime historian, and ex-curator of the City of London's Police Crime Museum. 
Rumbelow's mm. book, The Complete Jack the Ripper, has been a go-to manual for ripperologists for 45 years. Rumbelo presents shocking new evidence, including post-mortem photos of the Ripper's victims, illustrations, letters to the police, and newspaper dramatizations, after being given unprecedented access to Scotland Yard's most confidential files. Rumbelo has twice been chairman of England's Crime Writers Association. Hmm. Yes, like uh, he that would uh, summarize pretty well, like who he is. And, um, you know, I don't I obviously don't agree with everything that he says. Sure. OK, but I think mo he makes a good case for most. Of um, I just put up a James. Oh, yeah, no, that's fine. fine. Obviously, <laughs> you know, you don't have to stand over absolutely everything. Um. Vingal there says, well, he says what's on screen there. And uh, Dr. Crispy says that mitochondria DNA might be Jimmy Savile's. I'm sure he had access to the evidence and, uh, you know, Jack the Ripper off on it. Um, you know, I, I know that he's joking, but I think he, I'm glad that he mentioned Jimmy Savile. Perhaps a more modern day kind of Jack the Ripper sort of fellow who bridged that gap between the highest of high society and the lowest of the low and the necessity to basically play a Pied Piper from, I think the 1960s and top of the pops, the beginning of it all the way through to, I don't think star, his star fell or started falling until the mid 1990s at the earliest. And I do remember when I was a child, we got British TV, of course, and uh, along the West coast or East coast of Ireland, uh, just spilling over from, from Britain across the water. And um, he had a TV show called Jim will fix it. He wasn't just the sort of radio and TV DJ. He had this TV show where you could write in. And if your request, you basically was like writing to Santa Claus. If you're, if what you wanted was interesting enough, he'd fix it for you. You know, if you wanted to meet a celebrity or go on a roller coaster, there's a whole team chain, whatever you want, Jim will fix it kind of thing. Your wish is, it's only the start of it. And um, I never for a moment thought that he was creepy at all. He was just like a cool uncle, smoked a cigar, sat in a lovely chair. Um, I don't know if my parents thought he looks a bit odd at all. If they did, they never breathed a word of it. So it was just standard Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening television fair. It, it blew my mind when then Louis Theroux did a documentary on him uh, to say that um he was quite an oddball at the very least, and uh, that there was a scene where he, um, his mother had died, but yet he kept her clothes in plastic and would take them out and have a look at them and all this. So it was very uh, much like that film um, by Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, do you know the movie I'm talking about? You, you, you left and rejoined there. What's mm -hmm. the Alfred Hitchcock movie there where he has this... Uh, uh, the Norman Bates Hotel. <laughs> That's the one, you know, so a bit of that aspect to him as well. Psycho, exactly. All very fitting. Even if Dr. Crispy might have been slightly tongue-in-cheek there with Jimmy Savile, there is mm -hmm. at least um, a passing connection to be made. For sure. For sure. I mean, he's a member of the elite, and he engaged in some of the, like, the very same crazy stuff, like, as, you know, the Ripper, in my opinion. You know, he... Maybe something even worse. I mean, is it to is it worse in your opinion to hurt a child and do weird things with dead bodies, or is it worse to you know kill some you know five three o fours? I mean, both are really bad, but like I think that the children thing and the violating corpses is probably worse. Yeah, and I suppose the word defilement uh, came into mind there as well. And even if you might sort of say, well, look, if, if they're dead and, and they do these things afterwards, them, because Jimmy Savile was known to do things to corpses in the morgue uh, in the bottom of the uh, hospital that he apparently was given keys to. And it was, mm -hmm. I think, a, a hospital not just where children might have gone to, but people who had uh, mental problems and develop, developmental issues and that kind of thing. So they might have been physically or mentally disabled. Uh, and you might say, well, at least their troubles are over if they're in the morgue. But there is this um, unholy type of desecration of their corpse as well that is just, it's mind-blowing yeah. and, and disgusting in a way that goes beyond, I think, well, that's what it is. It always goes beyond what a quote-unquote normal person 
would ever even conceive of. Yes, of course. And, you know, it's one of those things. It's a slight against the family, right? The the living family members, I mean, you think of what that like that does to them. And I think that that's probably what he got. The, the joy he got out of it was doing something like that to basically a whole family. And then, you know, he could go up to the family later on and be like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear about your loss. Jim, fix it. Yeah. And right. publicly, of course, like we talked about, like there's a public and private face by night. He's this by day. He's that like publicly. He was uh, uh, also hanging around with, I think, again, who may have well have been an, an incredible monster, a sadist Mother Teresa. He was hanging around with her. He was running in London marathons to raise charity for, for uh, sick children in London hospitals and all around the world and taking part in uh, the BBC's um, appeals for starving children in Africa. Uh, well, didn't, which was a very royals, big thing. didn't one of the Royals make him like godfather to their kids or something? Yeah. I think he's godfather to either Harry or William. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then we wonder why those two turned out so jacked up. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you look at like you know, and then you have their uncle Lord Mount Bottom, as they called him. You know that the boys were always hanging around with, and that you know Mount Bottom was Charles's favorite uncle. Yeah, uh, was it Lord Henry Mountbatten? Something was it Henry Mountbatten? Yeah. Uh, and um, he, I, I suppose, as soon as he brought it up, I, I didn't, I wasn't aware of this, but apparently a lot of people were, but certainly was absolutely never mentioned. Uh, that, um, yeah, oh, just as far as the Jimmy Savile thing, I looked it up anyway. That, uh, what it says here is Jimmy Savile was included in a draft list of potential godparents weeks after Harry was born in 1984, but yeah. it's not confirmed that he is, he is indeed the godfather of Harry. But anyway, he was, of course, a good friend, he was a friend of, of Prince Charles. But as far as Lord Henry Mountbatten, apparently. And listen, we must do a stream on him maybe because he's very connected to the Freemasons and like he, he was a Freemason. And I think he might have been, I, I don't, I don't want to say in case I'm wrong, but he, but before, as we discovered anyway, but the, the Duke of Kent, Prince Edward being uh, the, the head Freemason in the UK, I have a feeling that Lord Henry Mountbatten might have been the top dog at some point as well. But in any case, uh, like, uh, Jo or what was it like like prince edward he he, he might have had some homosexual relations uh so oh, definitely the, did uh, yeah henry Mountbatten yeah. might have but but also here's the thing right it, it was in the papers at the time but i didn't know because i was a child uh or maybe i wasn't even born yet but i think it was well known if not in the papers but it, it was well known amongst people who sort of the whispering classes or people who knew but didn't actually say it out loud perhaps that he would go on holidays to the west coast of Ireland. Now, maybe he had some stately home there, or maybe there was still some place he could stay. And, you know, the, the thing was like, ah, it's just like going to Scotland. I'm just doing a bit of fishing or a bit of hunting, whatever. Ah, exactly. It's kind of gentleman pursuit. But what he would do is that he would, maybe he went out in the lake or something there, and he would um, sort of maybe there might be some peasant people there, I'll say, like, you know, to paint the sort of wrong word for the picture, but there might have been farmers' sons there, and, you know, a big royal celebrity comes over. Oh, my God, they're staying in our area. Oh, he's going boating. Oh, my, you want my son to help you out? Oh, you're going to give him threepence halfpenny or whatever. Are you going to give him five bob note if, if he helps you with finding where the fish are or helps you with your, your fishing gear, your tackle or whatever? Oh, that's great. You go out in the boat with you out in the lake. So that was the pretext, and apparently he was abusing boys out on the lake or wherever he went fishing yeah and, I mean, and the... they openly called him lord mount bottom that was his like friendly nickname in amongst the rest of the royals <laughs> so they were fully aware of what he was doing right now dr crispy uh rothschild there says it was just south of bundoran and is that i'm trying to think is that in county clare i'll have to look it up and forgive my ignorance um no, mm. Donegal. Oh, so sorry. I, I must be thinking of somewhere else. Uh, but anyway, that's as, about as uh, northwest as you get. It's still in the Republic of Ireland, although it's uh, far northwest of Ireland. So he says uh, he was fishing out in Donegal Bay. And um, so 
now that once I learned that, then that changed the perception of, so what is said is that the IRA uh, killed him. And I think if I'm not misremembering, they, they blew up a boat that he was in. And if so, that's a message that they were sending. That's what we think of your uh, sort of patriarch of the royal who was Charles's most favorite uncle. Um, and that's what we'll do to you. Uh, you know, you people who come over here and like, I suppose that would have represented an enrage. And you can understand if the Irish thought that the British had been subjugating them for 600 years of illegitimate rule, uh, if one of theirs comes over and thinks they can holiday by abusing Irish boys uh, in the uh, wilds, wild west uh, of, of um, northwest Ireland, then now I understood. And again, it was one of those other things where I kind of went like, why did no adult explain this to me that it wasn't just oh this terrible ira blowing up people for no reason now they did do that for sure in manchester if that was really them but if anything was a justified killing that sounds like it was sort of like well you got what you were probably storing up if people believe in karma or wherever you know yeah well i mean when it comes to the ira a lot of the things was done to them that was done to the weather underground uh, they were allowed to do what they were doing. And then when it got, got time, the weapons suppliers that they had that just happened to be the government uh, sabotaged their uh, their explosives, their weapons and all that kind of stuff. And things didn't go like they planned it. You know, they got bad intel, bad weapons, and they were sabotaged. And that's kind of like that's kind of the M.O. of the uh, intel agencies is, you know, to supply the folks, the weapons and all that kind of stuff. Let them do something nasty and then, you know, hang them out to dry when you're done with them. Right. right. Yeah. Them and I mean, look, everybody gets used. If we say that this is the devil's play playground, that it doesn't matter if you're a prince or a pauper, you get used mm -hmm. as part of his uh, grand great work or grand plan. Yes, exactly that. I mean, and everybody is expendable, pretty much. You know, nobody's completely off the table. Like, if, if you become enough of a nuisance, they will remove you. Doesn't matter how powerful you are. Right. And as we yeah. know, well, as we sort of we surmised anyway, that people like uh, the Duke of Kent, or oh, better say, no, was it the Duke of Kent's father? George, <laughs> I got it wrong. I think it was his father, George, maybe. Anyway, whichever pr prince was consorting with, uh, you know, sort of people of ill repute, actors, actresses. Uh, remember, um, there was that sort of uh, homosexual relationship that that uh, I couldn't, I can't remember the name of the guy's name now. You couldn't last time. But anyway, it was that, that playwright guy from the 1920s. Um, yeah. It doesn't, yeah. doesn't matter anyway. But I can't remember his name right offhand without my notes. Right beside me. Last, it came to me in the last stream, but it doesn't matter. But the idea is, anyway, is that if people have these dalliances, if they have these indiscretions, that what it all does is give fodder to the intelligence agencies that they then kind of go, ah, we have the perfect amount of dirt on this guy. He's now ours. Uh, we yes. can use it whenever. And they're, they're, they seem to be great at not necessarily blackmailing people, but if you're playing a game of chess, it's not just making the moves, it's making the right moves at the right time. Um, once they've used you to like, once they blackmailed you and got you to do some things, you know, it's just a short hop, skip and a jump before like the public finds out you did it. And then like now there's a link to them. So now they have to make something happen to you to make you go away before everybody finds out that they made you do something. So it yeah. can get really messy really quick for sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, again, like any piece on the chessboard, uh, once they're done with you, they can then sort of say, right, uh, that piece is no longer useful. Uh, sacrifice or whatever. Noel Coward was the guy I was thinking of there anyway. That yeah. had that um, very, they might have described it as a very close friendship between the prince and him. Like, you know, but I mean, Noel Coward uh, again was like, I didn't know. Nobody told me. They just told me, oh no, like, you know, he's just one of these very well spoken Englishmen. Not that I'd, yeah. I'd never met him personally, but I mean, you know, he was in the Italian job and that was sort of seen as, um, like a, a cameo where he's gracing the, the screen with his presence and giving some kind of prestige and um, uh, how would you say, like uh, some kind of cachet to the idea, like like um, conferring um, the, a blessing of, of this amazing playwright, uh, you know, onto the film that legitimizes it in some way. 
Um, yeah, I mean, but little did I know that he was really before. famous for. I was just saying, isn't that what cameos are for? Well, no, yes, it is. But I, I, I'm sort of saying like that, oh, like he had this regal air to him. But little did I know that he was actually, uh, so grotty, really. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, that is the the way it kind of tends to be, isn't it? Like all these uh, people, they would give you a regal air about like aren't very regal at all. Mm. Yeah, matter of fact, they're all pretty scummy and have little to no morals if they ever had it. Yeah. Well, um, crispy there, as you can see on screen, uh, he says that of uh, Henry Mountbatten, uh, he owned a castle in Mulcamore called Cassie Bawn. And looking at it on the map, that's in Sligo, uh, but it's just across the water, uh, sort of a bay or peninsula comes in. Uh, just across the water from Donegal. Uh, and he says this castle was then bought by a Mr. Tully, an Irish beef baron. So, yeah. um, you know, and, and as I learned anyway, people who either, well, maybe not necessarily reared beef, but people who exported beef, and there was a lot of that done, believe it or not, uh, to sort of places like Libya, and uh, I think that it was prized more in, they might have also maybe exported it to places like, they might have exported it to Chile. There was a lot of dictators, I think, maybe even Iraq, who might have said, oh, this Irish beef is even better than Argentinian. So people who exported Irish beef got very rich. Right. Yeah, I remember uh, the Scottish beef trade used to also be a rather big thing uh, if you go further back. So, it, yeah, more of the same. More okay. of the same thing they're always doing um what i want to ask you now is like we've gone beyond the four hours and i don't want to just i mean this has been a great conversation but i i don't want to uh let it go on any longer if it doesn't have to and i want to i know that there's one thing that i remember now that i want to mention about the subject at hand or, or get in there anyway uh onto the record as it were is there anything that you might want to mention about jack the ripper or, or anything else uh, pertaining to it uh, no, I think that that's like, you know, mostly made my case on that. If you have something else you intended to move on to. Yeah, well, uh, just and I'll make it as big as I can here uh, because I just I don't have to hand the letter on its own there. But I'll just make it big just for this here because it might be visible. Now, it's it's a scrawl and people can, I suppose, you know, put the links in, but you'd be able to find it on Wikipedia anyway. Uh, these these letters this is just one short letter it's not the two page letter that we um did we read out i think yes we did read out earlier from wikipedia well this is another letter uh, so we read out the the um dear boss letter well this is the from hell letter so i think we might be able to make out there it's very scratchy writing i mean i know they say kids these days can't read cur read cursive but if you couldn't read this it is not good handwriting it's scratchy Maybe he's trying to pretend it's it's written in blood, but you know, with with some kind of stick. But also, um, this is the letter I was talking about, where I kind of think maybe he was trying to give the impression that he's less educated than he was by going out of his way to spell things wrong, even for Victorian times. You know, if if they did have different spellings, you know, for certain things. So I want to read it out and uh, real short here, and, and um, because it's so short, I might. So to tell you the, the misspellings. Yeah. Go so he it. says, uh, okay, so he says, from hell, Mr. Lusk, sir, I send you half the kidney, right? Not kidney, but K-I-D-N-E. I took from one woman, not woman, but one woman. And this word, I was trying to read it there and I just couldn't make it out. I had to look at what Wikipedia said it was. From one woman, prasarved. Right. P-R-A-S-A-R-V-E-D. Preserved, he means, of course, right? Preserved mm -hmm. it for you, t'other piece. T-O-T-H-E-R piece. I fried and ate. It was very nice. It was very nice. N-I-S-E instead of N-I-C-E. I may send you the bloody kniff. K-N-I-F. That took it 
out if you only wait, spelt W-A-T-E, a will longer. You know, and as as, Bo- as Vingal says, Borat did it. He solved the mystery, right? So that, that's the, the body of the letter. I may send you the bloody gniff that took it out if you only wait a will longer. Signed, and he's like he's written there, signed, catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. Yes. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, either that was pinned by someone else, but I, I think it was pinned by the same person because there are certain things that they do that, you know, would indicate that it's probably the same person, right, as the first letters or whatnot. And, but he, like, he uses too much correct punctuation and all these, like, he uses the correct form of the letter, mm. right? You look how the letter's laid out and everything. Like, he, he's showing too much understanding of writing and how things are laid out to really be that stupid. It, it does seem contrived. Yeah. And as I say, even if you could sort of say they, they, they spell things weird back then from our point of view, uh, mm-hmm. it seems like it's contrived to go out of its uh, out of his way to try and, you know, yeah. kind of, oh, I don't know how to spell, kind sir. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. I swear I is, isn't. Yeah. I mean, there were some uh, changes in spelling here and there because uh, the English language hadn't been standardized like it has been today. But you can still see some remnants of it today uh, in things like, you know, I still spell armor with a U and color with a U, but most Americans don't. Oh, do you? How very European of you. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, that's just the way I was taught to spell when I was young because of the school I went to. And I, you know, I noticed other people here in America don't do that. Just like I put, uh, you know, I put a line through my zeros and uh, my sevens and stuff like that. Like, and most people here in America don't do that either. Well, that's very European. Uh, look, being on this side of the Atlantic, we do spell with the French spelling color with a U and uh, other things like that. Uh, theater with an uh, R-E. Mm-hmm. and uh, and so on but because i've pretty much always had to work with americans and of course like like the dutch they watch all the english and u.s they're better speakers at english than than the british or the irish they watch american movies uh, and they watch uh, british tv well that's what i did when i was growing up as well so i had to kind of look to the east and west and uh, sort of say well if i want to be able to talk to people I can't be speaking Hiberno English. In other words, Irish vernacular version of English all the time. I have to try and speak internationally. And if I'm speaking to Germans or Dutch or whatever, you know, the best I can do is to try and speak an international version of English. And if I'm speaking to Americans, like if I would spell color with a C-O-L-O-U-R, they'd go cooler, collier, cauliflower. Like a lot of people really struggle when there's an extra letter in there. So I just have to make sure, look, (laughs) try and spell stuff the American way. And as well, if you're using computers, uh, if you're programming and you want to sort of set color to this, well, it's C O L O R. So, um, yeah. for people outside of America, I mean, I remember once talking to a French guy, and I was saying, right, I have to get used to American spellings. You have to program in English, <laughs> and you're trying to translate that in your head into French. It's you've got extra steps yeah. there to go, you know. Yeah. Um, well, when it comes to like, I'm I'm always searching through like medieval documents and things like that. So, you know, I still use them sometimes, but you know, more so than the the words and uh, spellings, it's the numbers that I find most useful. Those lines through those numbers uh, like help get rid of the confusion of what someone's looking at, whether it's a, you know, an O or a zero or, you know, whether it's actually a seven or uh, some other number, you know, that is, I do find that helpful, but yes, yeah, sometimes the extra letters can stump people mm. though. I don't mm-hmm. usually care that people are usually stumped when I'm talking to them anyway. Uh-huh. Well, look, absolutely, certainly. Like when I when we were first taught to write, and obviously there's going to be regional differences. When we were first taught the alphabet and our numbers and to read and write, uh, we were taught that number one was just a straight line down. But we were also encouraged that we could, you know, write one with a, a line underneath it and then a tail coming down from the top, which then does make it look confusing. Then that could be a seven if you draw the tail coming around the top too much. So it wasn't until I would say 
maybe three, four years later that they started saying, here's the European way you put a stroke through the seven. And that was a new thing. And as well, we were confused by why sometimes like the four was closed and sometimes it was open. And it's basically a different font. Um, mm. But I think we were told that the British way of doing it was to close the four and the French way was to have an open top <laughs> the four there like that, you know. Um, yeah, and the American way, uh, like there was a different way for each uh, for each one, which was, you know, I find really weird that they did that. But, you know, at the time, everyone was competing, right? Well, the great game and whatnot. Well, what I remember seeing, and maybe we talked about it before, maybe I don't know if it was a video that you and I shared together, we talked about it. But anyway, um, I saw a video where this guy was basically explaining, look, the reason why four is open uh, uh, in some fonts and closed in others, and maybe the US favors one versus France. France, I think, think has it open the british used to have it closed but now more often has it open i think i was born at a time when britain and ireland were becoming basically more metric in other words like continental europe so and by the way it was only in 2008 that ireland got rid of miles right from its road measurements it went around changing every sign into kilometers just to be just to show the british ha ha, ha we're more european than you are this it's like it, it's all political um, when we said our ABCs, to make it rhyme, you have to go uh, A, B, C, D and end like X, Y, Z. But then later on, they'll say, so what letter is that? And you'll say Z and they go, no, it's Z. So we had Z, Z going on at the same time. It was quite confusing. Uh, I think in Canada, they might say Z or a lot of them do. But yeah. if I talk to Americans, if I would say Z, I kind of go, no, I mean Z, you know. So uh, and I'm stuck in a, in a sort of weird place now where sometimes I'm thinking of liters, sometimes I'm saying miles per gallon um height feet feet and inches we actually use stones right <laughs> to sort of say that's a collection of 14 pounds but if you'd say like use that imperial measurement anywhere now either in the us or in ireland or britain they go no i mean like kilos <laughs> like when were you born <laughs> in the middle ages you know so yeah. um i find different i find different things about the systems useful I mean, uh, you know, I find the millimeter system uh, very useful and the grant, you know, weighing things in grams, very useful. Uh, but then again, I also find uh, our American system quite useful sometimes, too. It depends on the situation. Both definitely do have their advantages. And um, as I mentioned before, maybe we'll do another stream on it at some point, right, because there's a lot to it that uh you know having quarters eighths and sixteenths uh you know for measuring carpentry and metal you don't need to go any more than the sixteenth and uh it's actually annoying to have millimeters because you know even though like even when i'm i'm not sure if my eyes are still perfect anymore but even when i had perfect eyesight you really can't uh measure and cut down to a millimeter certainly not with with soft yeah. wood so it's actually ridiculous. Uh, and then as far as cutting things up quickly, dividing things in a market, if it's a cake or if it's a pie or whatever, you want to be able to cut it in half, then another line, you cut it in fours, another line, you cut it in six, another line in eighths, another line between all of them, you got sixteenths. It lends itself naturally to those units. They weren't picked arbitrarily. And I'll just say this real quick while I think of it, uh, because um, – I did wonder, like, you know, what other arbitrary things might there be? And I wanted to know at the same time, okay, I know there's eight furlongs in a mile, but why? I better find that out definitively. And in case anybody's wondering, it comes from the way English used to speak, like Saxons. They'd say, a furlong, right? And so a furlong is going and, and making a furrow as long as you can before, and I know it sounds arbitrary, before the horse got tired and he'd need a break. That's how far a furlong is, an eighth of a mile. And I guess, you know, if you double back on yourself, then that's another one. And then do that two more times and do that two more times, two more times, or double that, double that, double, you get eight. So it's kind of like a binary or an octal system. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe after doing eight of those furlongs, if the horse got tired eight, eight times in a day, you'd say, listen, maybe you do four before lunch, four after. You'd say, listen, that's enough for today. Do a mile a day. Yeah, I think that our uh, our fractional system is based on uh, the um, the uh, um, Pythagorean uh, musical system, where you know you break everything down into fractional chords and all that. I think that that's where it came from. I think. Don't quote me on that. Well, yeah, I mean, eight eight notes in a 
piano octave if you don't count uh, the the what you call them semitones but um Oh, no, sorry. No, I'm mixing it up. I'm only thinking of the key of C on a piano. But, of course, you want to yeah, do D then. It works with Lars uh, at that time, time. but yeah. <laughs> pretty much the same thing. Um, but it is curious how they chose the notes because they might be kind of arbitrary. I know, of course, there was this tuning between, four, I think, is it 432 hertz or 430 and, and 440 or something like that. But look, um, these things do have historical precedent, and sometimes it was the best they could do at the time. But I suppose, look, main point there is, is that there were reasons for it sometimes we think we're more sophisticated now but you often th sometimes the reason for things becomes obsolete and the reasons why you do things then just become ridiculous adherence to tradition other times what you end up is throwing out something that actually worked really well just because you think is, is something is modern but it actually disconnects you uh from your environment and so uh, like that, say, if you did have a regular horse, a normal horse, maybe, you know, obviously there's going to be individual variations, but it disconnects you from, you know, how you can be maybe independent. You don't need petrol or gasoline. Uh, you have your own horse. You plow your own furrow. You, you put your own food in there. You grow it. And you're looking at the seasons. You're looking at the stars. You're, you're, you're in connection in tune with the, the land and, and uh the the weather and your animals and your horses and everything else like that so you're much closer to self-sufficiency and maybe nature and god perhaps and then so uh, it's not too much of a stretch i think for this audience sort of say making everything a metric and it's arbitrary and it's it's either you know well, what it was originally was you know a meter was according to a, a, a standard p a measure that they had of metal of something that didn't expand like gold in the institute of weights and measures in paris but now what they've done with all the scientific measures is related to the atoms uh, that takes a certain amount of time to do something or other and mm -hmm. it all becomes a a circular definition of itself yes well, I would definitely say that, you know, we were more, much more connected to uh, nature and to God back when we were uh, in, you know, those older systems without so many distractions. And I mean, if you think about, OK, you take human beings who were just as smart then as we are now and you give them less distractions throughout the day, like how complex of stuff they can come up with. Right. Yeah, if all right. you're doing is they spent more time in their head. If that makes more sense. Well, for sure. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Look, I'll say this as well, because I was thinking about this doing exactly that during the week. I wasn't exactly uh, plowing furrows and planting food that's going to get me through, uh, you know, the digital panopticon. But um, I was pulling up weeds a lot uh, in the garden. And uh, I was thinking of two words, uh, deracinate and extirpate. They're both pretty much exactly synonymous. Both come from... Uh, latin and greek and um it means to literally uproot and that's what's been done to a lot of us and um these phrases i'll get into another time but of course they're, they're from essays and uh written by people you can't talk about and you can't really read their essays uh when they discovered what was happening and they're also from people who we can't mention who talk about their plans to extirpate and deracinate all of us so that we will be uprooted from our own lands and have no clue about where we are and then planted into an artificial environment like virtual reality <laughs> that kind of thing you know for real and i mean we are getting closer and closer to that i just watched a thing uh with uh oh zuckerberg not too long ago uh talking about where he sees all this stuff going and of course he said all the things you would expect him to he toted water for everything they've said was coming you know the usual suspects and blah 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 but yeah, it will be coming faster uh, than we expect, I think. Mm. Well, look, um, I think we can maybe end kind of on that note. Uh, just to acknowledge there, Vingal says the most ridiculous measure is stone. How much does a stone weigh? Well, obviously, it's it's a quarter of a boulder, right? That's how you know. Okay. Yeah, one stain, to put it in the, the Scottish term. Oh, at least you said stain and not stein. We could be in trouble there. Um. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, but I know it's funny. It's a strange thing, right, uh, that Americans just might say, like, you know, oh, somebody's whatever, 220 uh, pounds. But in UK, uh, they'd sort of say, once we get to 14 pounds, we'll then call that a stone and on and on and on. But anyway, 
Yeah. So they, like like feet and inches, they use stone and pounds. But anyway, uh, and yeah, Lynn called exactly there you are. <laughs> you know, I think it's German and everything as well. It might be might be a, a wide ish language for for a stone as well. And uh, Stanley uh, means stony field, by the way. So Stan also means stone. I see. Well, uh, Vingal there says, much like Stain, uh, S-T-A-N-E. So you can see where Stanley comes from that. And look, another thing then as well is when people would go to places like South Africa, uh, what they would do is is that they would plow. First of all, before they could plow the land, they had to take all the stones out of it painstakingly. And I've spent some time trying to sort top soil, top soil, take stones out, all that kind of thing. So when you arrive on land that obviously hasn't been used in hundreds, if not thousands of years, and you pluck out boulders and stones and you sift through all the soil and then plow it, that's much more legitimate that you're homesteading it. You made that soil fertile through the labor of your own hands. Uh, that's much more legitimate than just sort of saying, uh, I am from a holding company that's uh, an umbrella, part of the umbrella corporation of, um, let's say, Vanguard or BlackRock. And there was a fellow there, and I'll put it into the links now. Um, he is from, I think he, he might be a French Canadian, but he speaks English. And um, you see, my, when I'm trying to put myself on the spot, I can't think of the name, but mm. I'll put it into the links there. It's the Something Chronicles. Anyway, he talked about a company that is not just Canadian, but he showed us the Canadian version of it, which is buying apartments, building apartments, uh, buying land, everything. So that basically it, it'll own pretty much all real estate where he lives and onwards, you know. Uh, I thought it was very interesting. So I'll link, I'll, I will link to that in the, in the descriptions as well. Um, yeah. And uh, it's just part of like basically how they want us to think that's much more legitimate, how, how you buy something there and say, I own this land now, right? Rather than then make it, make it fertile with your own hands. Yeah, I've had to do it. But, you know, when I was a kid, that was a yearly thing, you know, like dad plowing the field and then you walk behind the plow, picking up rocks and throwing them in buckets and then emptying the buckets into potholes in the, uh, in the, uh, gravel driveway leading to the field so that you don't have to waste as much gravel when you replace like yeah i grew up in the country and i did things like that and guess what i think every kid ought to have to like as yeah. soon as you're like a, as soon as you're a boy and you're like 11 years old you ought to like have to go out and do some field work and all that kind of stuff i hated it when i was a kid but guess what it made me a better person now yeah well uh you know um it is good practice and and even if I might not liked it immediately, uh, you definitely like it in retrospect. And probably by the end of the day, you do look back and, and then like it. And then, you, you know, you you feel healthier and your appetite uh, is, is more healthy and you're breathing fresh air. And um, uh, what else can I say about it? Uh, well, you, you, it's a bit like climbing a mountain. You might feel like I don't have the energy. I want to sit on the couch. And you might feel depressed as well, but you force yourself to get out. You don't like taking the first step. You don't even like taking the, the sort of 200th step. But at some point, you appreciate the journey you've made. I know it's as cliche as it sounds. I mean, like everyone I've ever trained in martial arts ever, I've always told them the same thing. Motivation comes after, not before. Like right. once you start doing something, that's when the motivation and the, the fire comes, right? But you have to kindle that fire first, and that takes a little bit of work, just like everything. Everything is like I'm not a relativist, a relativist by any means, but there are nonetheless things in this world that are relative, and that's one of them. All things that are worth anything require that foundational building up and work. All of them. If it's worth having, it's going to require work. If it doesn't oh, well, require it. work, yeah. then it's probably not going to be worth anything. Nothing good ever came easy. Can I nope. say now what I think of it? Uh, the fellow's name that I was, or channel name that I was thinking of, and I'll put a link anyway, is called Barnhart Chronicles. And mm -hmm. the latest video he did there is called Dev Cornwall, which is sort of a, a pun there. that The town is called Cornwall, but it, but this place called Devcor has pretty much bought up every piece of real estate there and you want to have a look at this uh the, their their logo to me 
it is a copy pretty much of Omnicorp out of Ro Robocop, you know? So well, it's like they're rubbing it in our faces that, yes, indeed, this is the dystopian future that we told you you were going to get, like with them. Um, well, there's other movies, like, you know, you could sort of say, like, maybe like Blade Runner are not quite there yet, but, you know, we're almost not quite there in, in um, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, but we're getting there. And well, other all of them had to start somewhere, didn't they? Like, you know, everybody wonders, like, well, how did they wind up in The Matrix? How did they wind up in T2 Judgment Day? How did they wind up in da 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 Well, this is how they wound up in all those places. Exactly what you're seeing now. That's how they wound up there. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. And as well, like, uh, there's that movie, They Live, because it shows L.A. and there's, you know, tramps and homeless everywhere. And, and it's turned into, uh, you know, a city very much in decline, in decay. Mm -hmm. it's incredible you know i mean la and california was the place everyone aspired to live in there and i think i mean i honestly don't know especially you know well not especially but also san francisco i just do not know how uh you know nancy pelosi or other people who might live in rare parts of san francisco now that are still lovely or whatever how can anybody feel safe i've asked you before like you know the freemasons if they're busy destroying dissolving all of our society they must hate it as well how do they not feel unsafe or disgusted by the whole thing but maybe i said they, they enjoy I would say it. They're probably i would say they're probably hardly ever home if i had to guess but you know in my opinion what's going to happen to california is they're going to get as many people out of here as possible and they're going to try to turn this into like one of the first like uh you know tech super states you know where they're gonna this you know if they can get rid of enough people and turn over the land to like somewhere like black rock or something like that they can turn the entire state into some kind of like they could turn it into a nature preserve. They could turn it into some kind of crazy, uh, you know, smart city state, or they can do several different things to it. If they can get people off the land, you know, mm. land yeah. is a valuable commodity and, you know, they need somewhere to start all these smart cities and stuff. Yeah, um, well, I think you've mentioned before, and maybe we'll examine it another day if we get more information on it, that they want to basically turn more or less the whole of Netherlands, you know, expand uh, all the cities into each other, uh, whether it be Rotterdam or um, Amsterdam, and uh, merge them all into one massive sort of Nederlander, Dutch, Luxembourg, Belgian city. Yeah, like some kind of Star Trek, uh, you know, super city, uh, like the capital of the New World Order type thing. Yeah, it looks like it, which is why, you know, they're, they're trying to uh, get the Dutch farmers off their land there, uh, even though, like, I don't know if people know this in America, but uh, of course, you know, Spain is a country that's much warmer and they're able to give us uh, produce like tomatoes almost all year round. But the Netherlands is probably able to do as much, if not more than Spain because of greenhouses and uh, how efficient their farmers have been at making what was once uh, reclaimed land or once under the sea, uh, make it into very fertile land. And uh, they've just become experts at uh, growing things almost all year round again under their greenhouses. If they got rid of that, there'd be far, far less uh, fresh produce from Netherlands. And, um, Mm -hmm. uh, oh God, what else? Uh, oh yes, as well as getting the Dutch farmers, I remember seeing there in the news there over the last week or two that uh, there's a huge amount of Irish uh, beef cattle farmers that are being told they're not going to be allowed to do it anymore because of this nonsense that uh, you know cows are bad for the environment because of methane or cows farts, like this insanity, and that uh, it's just better that we don't have enough food because eating beef is 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 bad anyway outrageous mm -hmm. but people believe it yeah they do they do they believe that lucky charm should be the like the foundation of a, your diet i suppose well whatever <coughs> excuse me processed food i don't i don't guess you saw the uh, american food pyramid they put out like last year did you like, no, they actually changed our food pyramid around and put Lucky Charms at the top of it. Oh, yeah. Why, like, Lucky Charms more healthy than beef? Come on now. Just, just shut the front door. Like, I, I don't even want to hear that shit. <laughs> That's just dumb. Well, maybe you're saying that they weren't actually joking, that it was officially uh, released by some government agency. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 
Yes, this is what I'm saying. Like, the original food pyramid was contrived in order to prop up industries here in America, such as the grain industry, which is one of the reasons, and, you know, corn and all that. It's one of the reasons why everybody's fat. But the fact of the matter is, like, they've now changed it again to make people even fatter and more unhealthy by, like, changing over certain things that, you know, were fairly healthy to begin with. And now it's turned into Lucky Charms. Now, they've quite literally put cereal in place of eggs and beef and things. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I mean, I, I do, I know about, you know, grain and stuff being in the food, food pyramid, but if they literally put Lucky Charms as an official release, then, like, they're obviously just seeing what they can get away with. <laughs> God, oh, my God, they bought it. Like, you know, like sugar-coated candy cereal obviously isn't, I mean, the most amount of Snicker bars and everything else as the first uh, thing that well, you need to eat. But anyway. You know the Kellogg story and why cereal was invented in the first place, right? It's well, because the, it's because he like he was a doctor, Doctor Kellogg. There's a movie called Road to Wellville. It's a comedy. You've got to watch it. It is the best like docu comedy on uh, Doctor Kellogg and what he was up to. But he ran this wellness center, and he was obviously one of the brothers. And he was into the whole eugenics and uh, making people healthier and making them live longer and getting rid of our sexual depravity, right? And he invented cornflakes because uh, like, he was trying, literally trying to invent a, a breakfast cereal so bland that it would kill your sex drive. All right. That's what breakfast cereal was invented for. It was invented to make you fat, slothful, and unable to reproduce. Well, you know, it's... It's crazy. Yeah, well, I do remember hearing that, uh, you know, he was also somebody who, I think I remember hearing uh, E. Michael Jones talking about him in connection with somebody else. And you mentioned the eugenics, but also uh, other kinds of experimentation vis-a-vis -vis children and things like that. Won't get into it again, but, you know, we've kind of brought up that kind of thing. I, I, it can be all put in there in the rough part. So like the very man who, like children might say, oh, I love the kind of cereals that, that he himself uh, might have been. I guess I'll say it, and because I'm, I'm I'm reluctant to say it, not in case it gets a strike, but in case I'm wrong, and I could be wrong, but that he wouldn't be a million miles away, let's say, from somebody like Doctor Money. Yeah, and that's very possible. Like even the comedy uh, with Matthew Broderick in it, that Road to Wellville, even it touches on him being a really abusive parent, and you know, and some other things. And uh, it shows his complicated relationship with his son uh, and his kids and, you know, just all this other kind of stuff. And it's a really wild thing, the kind of stuff they were getting into uh, in that uh, sanatorium, he called it. And it turns out after all this health stuff and everything else and all these millions of people going there to see him at his sanatorium, trying not die. He ends up dying of a heart attack while he was like, you know, doing this like press Thing, like where he was going to do this high dive at like, you know, like 80 years old or something like that. And his heart gave out on him. It's like, so yeah. all that and you still croak just as early as everybody else. Charlatan. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, uh, as far as the word sanatorium, I mean, look, we're, we're, tra we're tailing off now, but the sanatorium, I mean, I suppose, you know, if you think of the word sanitize, it means like something that's clinically clean. And I do remember reading before about sanatoria, that it was where people would go if they had these kind of ailments like tuberculosis or other things that, you know, maybe are diseases of the past, but might have been rebranded as different things now, but might have been called like, you know, sort of, oh, I, I have, um, you know, distemper or, or these kind of sort of Victorian sounding diseases. And what they would do is they would leave the cities and think, oh, it must be to do with the smoke. I have the black lung, perhaps from the smoke. Or, um, you know, and maybe there was some genuine things. People might have been working with, you know, in dusty bricks and asbestos or whatever. Maybe other people just yeah. felt like, you know, uh, women might get was Like, because that was really a thing in the Victorian era. Uh, people putting chalk, plaster of Paris, all kinds of things in white bread to make it whiter and make it way more. Um, you had um, meat and stuff like that that would be going bad that adds spices and things and uh, red. Oh, yeah, dye. yeah. Well, this is why I knew I didn't like Indian food a long, long time ago because they just made it so extremely hot and spicy that you didn't know that it was rotting meat under the sun. But as far as, like, dust in the air and whatever in the city, and then I, I was going to say this, and I'll, I'll see if I can say it in a sort of roundabout way, but 
I think maybe most people will, will know that one of the first electrical devices uh, was invented uh, and used electricity in order to save uh, doctors' uh, hands and fingers from sort of repetitive strain injury because a lot of women of a certain age, once they reached menopause, would come to the doctor uh, complaining that they had um, some kind of uh, yeah. histrionics or, or this kind of thing. And maybe it was called that because they sort of felt like, oh, well, maybe that's the end of your wooming days or whatever you know so uh, women like that as well like you know they might be sort of told by their husbands look if you want to go to one of these sanatoria for a while you'll have cleaner air there they, they were typically uh, up higher in the mountains i mean they might have been in switzerland that would have been handy where dr freud might have been able to examine you you know the clear alpine air and i think that i know that in colorado um where i don't know if it's the, i keep confusing this whether it's the hotel that the shining was filmed in interior or exterior or, or something to do with the that hotel anyway up in estes park that there might have been that might have been a sanatorium there or or up in there anyway where people used to go just by way of example for the clean air mm -hmm. and also mark twain i think or you know samuel clemens he himself might have felt that he prolonged his life by getting out of the cities and going to various sanatoria up high where they felt like in europe and in america where they felt that uh, the air was cleaner for themselves. So, and it came then to, because in the Victorian times, they, they didn't say it even back in like the 1960s in Ireland, if a girl got pregnant, they just sort of said, oh, she went away to somewhere else to work or she's, she, she's, she's gone traveling or whatever. But it was really because she wanted to have a baby out of wedlock and then work in one of these laundries for a while and then come back and give the baby up for adoption or whatever that might be, you know? So they, huh. they, they kept a lot of stuff out from the neighbors. So, you know, if somebody would sort of say, oh, the wife's gone away to a sanatorium uh, just to get a breath of fresh air. She had a thought, she had a, a touch of the old, uh, uh, you know, berry berry or, uh, you know, she, she had a, thought she had something on the lung, water on the knee or something. It might have been because they were actually both physically and mentally, I don't know, frazzled, something like that. But it, but because of that, the, then the term sanatorium got this stigma of being a place where mental patients went, you know, people who are absolutely lulabelle psycho serial murderers, you know, that sort of way. It's, it's a funny thing back in the day, like as far as like you mentioning women, like the, you know, I'm sure you've heard of the hysterectomy, right? You mm -hmm. know why it's called the hysterectomy. Well, well it's, because of, it's because of a, well. yeah, it, it calms down hysteria which is a disease they uh, like they said that women would get back in the day. Basically it's bored housewife disease is what it was. And they would go to these doctors who would manually stimulate them. We'll say in order to relieve their stress and stuff. And you know, it was supposed to be the cause of women over uh, getting overly excited about things and stuff like that. That we call it hysteria. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, that's, that's what I was, that's what I was talking about in the first electrical device then. Uh, that's what I meant, like invented, and and I think it, you know, because it, it was re well, it wasn't really any batteries there then, you know, not ones that weren't heavy, that I think the plug could plug into the light socket, so to unscrew the bulb and, and plug it into the light socket above the bed. <laughs> that's basically it, you know. Um, I, I, on that and that Road to Wellville movie too, the electrical stimulation devices and things, they right. like they touch on all that in that movie. Like, do you you got to watch it, dude? You'll laugh your ass off. Well, look, I, 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 I heard of the film or movie, but I won't, or I haven't seen it on link, but, uh, you know, if, if I think of it, I might watch it or if I come across it. Uh, and uh, again, I suppose maybe I can, I'll, my closing remark again will be the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I will second that remark. And, you know, I'd like to thank everybody for listening to my long winded rear end today. <laughs> you know, I know I can uh, go on forever sometimes, and John can too. Yeah, I'm well, sure we both can, but I appreciate it. <laughs> and I tell you what, it, I think we're going to sneak it in under the five hours. <laughs> so this will be a short one. <laughs> right? For us, it is, anyway. Right. You know, that's what I mean. A, sh a short one, and I'm laughing, but comparatively. Um, right. Well, again, thanks to everybody. If Vingold is still there with us, thanks for staying with us. Anybody who was with us the whole way, fair play, you did it. And anyone who's listening back on the playback, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we'll talk next week. Maybe we'll talk a bit more about George Bernard Shaw and the Fabians. If not, we'll, we'll, we'll find something else to talk about. 
Uh, which speaking of, like, uh, send me a like a link, the link to his channel again. I couldn't find Vingle's channel like when I looked for it the other day. Actually. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I will do. Um, and uh, I, I remember he gave it to us the other day when we were in stream, but I couldn't remember exactly what it was. All right. Um, well, I'll, I'll stick it somewhere in the comments and the description then as well. Um, right. Well, that's that. For sure. Cheers again. <laughs> oh, there he is. I was wondering where there's a little bit of a delay. Uh, I didn't click the sort of confirm, leave the chat there. So he has it there. If we just go to youtube.com forward slash at Vin Gull, V-I-N-G-U-L. Forward so, slash at Vin Gull, huh? Yeah. Okay. Well, that will do then. YouTube. Okay. Righty ho. <laughs> uh, appreciate it, folks. Y'all have a good one. <laughs>